Chapter Thirteen of the Memoirs of Barry Lyndon, Esquire, by William Makepeace Thackeray. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter Thirteen. I continue my career as a man of fashion. I find I have already filled up many scores of pages, and yet a vast deal of the most interesting portion of my history remains to be told, viz that which describes my sojourn in the kingdoms of England and Ireland, and the great part I played there, moving among the most illustrious of the land, myself not the least distinguished of the brilliant circle. In order to give due justice to this portion of my memoirs, then, which is more important than my foreign adventures can be, though I could fill volumes with interesting descriptions of the latter, I shall cut short the account of my travels in Europe and of my success at the continental courts in order to speak of what befell me at home. Suffice it to say that there is not a capital in Europe except the beggarly one of Berlin, where the young Chevalier de Balibéry was not known and admired, and where he has not made the brave, the high-born, and the beautiful talk of him. I won 80,000 roubles from Potemkin at the Winter Palace at Petersburg, which the scoundrelly favorite never paid me. I had the honor of seeing His Royal Highness the Chevalier Charles Edward as drunk as any porter at Rome. My uncle played several matches at billiards against the celebrated Lord C. at Spa, and I promise you did not come off a loser. In fact, by a neat stratagem of ours, we raised the laugh against His Lordship and something a great deal more substantial. My lord did not know that the Chevalier Barry had a useless eye, and when, one day, my uncle playfully bet him odds at billiards that he would play him with a patch over one eye, the noble lord, thinking to bite us, he was one of the most desperate gamblers that ever lived, accepted the bet, and we won a very considerable amount of him. Nor need I mention my successes among the fairer portion of the creation. One of the most accomplished, the tallest, the most athletic, and the handsomest gentleman of Europe, as I was then, a young fellow of my figure could not fail of having advantages, which a person of my spirit knew very well how to use. But upon these subjects I am dumb. Charming Shuvalov, black-eyed Zatarska, Dark Valdez, tender Helgenheim, brilliant Langeac. Oh, ye gentle hearts that knew how to beat in old times for the warm young Irish gentleman, where are you now? Though my hair has grown gray now, and my sight dim, and my heart cold with years, and ennui, and disappointment, and the treachery of friends, Yet I have but to lean back in my armchair and think, and those sweet figures come rising up before me out of the past, with their smiles and their kindnesses and their bright, tender eyes. There are no women like them now, no manners like theirs. Look you at a bevy of women at the princes, stitched up in tight white satin sacks with their waists under their arms, and compare them to the graceful figures of the old time. Why, when I danced with Coralie de Langeac at the fete on the birth of the first Dauphin at Versailles, her hoop was eighteen feet in circumference, and the heels of her lovely little mules were three inches from the ground. The lace of my jabot was worth a thousand crowns, and the buttons of my amaranth velvet coat cost eighty thousand livres. Look at the difference now. The gentlemen are dressed like boxers, Quakers, or hackney coachmen, and the ladies are not dressed at all. There's no elegance, no refinement, none of the chivalry of the old world of which I form a portion. Think of the fashion of London being led by a BR-MM-L. Footnote. This manuscript must have been written at the time when Mr. Brummel was the leader of the London fashion. End footnote. A nobody's son, a low creature who can no more dance a minuet than I can talk Cherokee. 
who cannot even crack a bottle like a gentleman, who never showed himself to be a man of the sword in his hand, as we used to approve ourselves in the good old times before that vulgar Corsican upset the gentry of the world. Oh, to see the Valdez once again, as on that day I met her first driving in state, with her eight mules and her retinue of gentlemen, by the side of yellow Manzanares. Oh, for another drive with Hagenheim, in the gilded sledge over the Saxon snow. False as Shuvalov was, t'was better to be jilted by her than to be adored by any other woman. I can't think of any one of them without tenderness. I have ringlets of all their hair in my poor little museum of recollections. Do you keep mine, you dear souls that survive the turmoils and troubles of near half a hundred years? How changed its color is now, since the day Sitarska wore it round her neck, after my duel with Count Bernaski at Warsaw. I never kept any beggarly books of accounts in those days. I had no debts. I paid royally for everything I took, and I took everything I wanted. My income must have been very large. My entertainments and equipages were those of a gentleman of the highest distinction. Nor let any scoundrel presume to sneer because I carried off and married my Lady Linden, as you shall presently hear and call me an adventurer, or say I was penniless, or the match unequal. Penniless? I had the wealth of Europe at my command. Adventurer? So is a meritorious lawyer or a gallant soldier. So is every man who makes his own fortune an adventurer. My profession was play, in which I was then unrivaled. No man could play with me through Europe on the square, and my income was just as certain, during health and the exercise of my profession, as that of a man who draws on his three per cents, or any fat squire whose acres bring him revenue. Harvest is not more certain than the effect of skill is. A crop is a chance, as much as a game of cards greatly played by a fine player. There may be a drought, or a frost, or a hailstorm, and your stake is lost. But one man is just as much an adventurer as another. In evoking the recollection of these kind and fair creatures, I have nothing but pleasure. I would I could say as much of the memory of another lady, who will henceforth play a considerable part in the drama of my life. I mean the Countess of Linden whose fatal acquaintance I made at Spa, very soon after the events described in the last chapter had caused me to quit Germany. Honoria, Countess of Linden, Viscountess Bullingdon in England, Baroness Castle Linden of the Kingdom of Ireland, was so well known to the great world in her day that I have little need to enter into her family history which is to be had in any peerage that the reader may lay his hand on. She was, as I need not say, a countess, a viscountess, and baroness in her own right. Her estates in Devon and Cornwall were among the most extensive in those parts, her Irish possessions not less magnificent, and they have been alluded to in a very early part of these memoirs, as lying near to my own paternal property in the Kingdom of Ireland. Indeed, unjust confiscations in the time of Elizabeth and her father went to diminish my acres, while they added to the already vast possessions of the Linden family. The Countess, when I first saw her at the assembly at Spa, was the wife of her cousin, the Right Honourable Sir Charles Reginald Linden, Knight of the Bath, and minister to George the Second and George the Third at several of the smaller courts of Europe. Sir Charles Linden was celebrated as a wit and bon vivant, and could write love verses against Hanbury Williams, and make jokes with George Selwyn. He was a man of virtue, like Harry Walpole, with whom, and Mr. Gray, he had made a part of the grand tour, and was cited in a word 
as one of the most elegant and accomplished men of his time. I made this gentleman's acquaintance as usual at the play-table, of which he was a constant frequenter. Indeed, one could not but admire the spirit and gallantry with which he pursued his favorite pastime, for, though worn out by gout and a myriad of diseases, a cripple wheeled about in a chair and suffering pains of agony, yet you would see him every morning and every evening at his post behind the delightful green cloth. And if, as it would often happen, his own hands were too feeble or inflamed to hold the box, he would call the mains nevertheless, and have his valet or a friend to throw for him. I like this courageous spirit in a man. The greatest successes in life have been won by such indomitable perseverance. I was by this time one of the best-known characters in Europe, and the fame of my exploits, my duels, my courage at play, would bring crowds around me in any public society where I appeared. I could show reams of scented paper to prove this eagerness to make my acquaintance was not confined to the gentleman only, but that I hate boasting, and only talk of myself in so far as it is necessary to relate myself's adventures, the most singular of any man's in Europe. Well, Sir Charles Linden's first acquaintance with me originated in the Right Honourable Knight's winning seven hundred pieces of me at piquet, for which he was almost my match. And I lost them with much good humour, and paid them, you may be sure, punctually. Indeed, I will say this for myself, that losing money at play never in the least put me out of good humour with the winner, and that whenever I found a superior, I was always ready to acknowledge and hail him. Linden was very proud of winning from so celebrated a person, and we contracted a kind of intimacy, which, however, did not for a while go beyond pump-room attentions, and conversations over the supper-table at play, but which gradually increased until I was admitted into his more private friendship. He was a very free-spoken man. The gentry of those days were much prouder than at present and used to say to me in his haughty, easy way, Hang it, Mr. Barry, you have no more manners than a barber, and I think my black footman has been better educated than you. But you are a young fellow of originality and pluck, and I like you, sir, because you seem determined to go to the deuce by a way of your own. I would thank him laughingly for this compliment, and say that as he was bound to the next world much sooner than I, I would be obliged to him to get comfortable quarters arranged there for me. He used also to be immensely amused with my stories about the splendor of my family and the magnificence of Castle Brady. He would never tire of listening or laughing at those histories. Stick to the trumps, however, my lad, he would say when I told him of my misfortunes in the conjugal line, and how near I had been winning the greatest fortune in Germany. Do anything but marry, my artless Irish rustic. He called me by a multiplicity of queer names. Cultivate your great talents in the gambling line. But mind this, that a woman will beat you. That I denied, mentioning several instances in which I had conquered the most intractable tempers among the sex. Uh, they will beat you in the long run, my Tipperary Alcibiades. As soon as you are married, take my word of it, you are conquered. Look at me. I married my cousin, the noblest and greatest heiress in England. Married her in spite of herself, almost. Here a dark shade passed over Sir Charles Linden's countenance. She is a weak woman. You shall see, sir, how weak she is but she is my mistress. She has embittered my whole life. She is a fool, but she has got the better of one of the best heads in Christendom. She is enormously rich, but somehow I have never been so poor as since I married her. I thought to better myself, and she has made me miserable and killed me, and she will do as much for my successor when I am gone. 
has her ladyship a very large income said i at which sir charles burst into a yelling laugh and made me blush not a little at my gaucherie for the fact is seeing him in the condition in which he was i could not help speculating upon the chance a man of spirit might have with his widow no no said he laughing wahawk mr berry don't think if you value your peace of mind to stand in my shoes when they're vacant besides i don't think my lady linden would quite condescend to marry a marry a what sir said i in a rage ah never mind what but the man who gets her will rue it take my word on t a plague on her had it not been for my father's ambition and mine he was her uncle and guardian and wouldn't let such a prize out of the family i might have died pleasantly at least carried my gout down to my grave in quiet lived in my modest tenement in mayfair had every house in england open to me and now now i have six of my own and every one of them is a hell to me beware of greatness mr barry take warning by me ever since i have been married and have been rich i have been the most miserable wretch in the world look at me i am dying a worn-out cripple at the age of fifty marriage has added forty years to my life when i took off lady linden there was no man of my years who looked so young as myself fool that i was i had enough with my pensions perfect freedom the best society in europe and i gave up all these and married and was miserable take a warning by me captain barry and stick to the trumps though my intimacy with the knight was considerable for a long time i never penetrated into any other apartments of his hotel but those which he himself occupied his lady lived entirely apart from him and it is only curious how they came to travel together at all she was a goddaughter of old mary wortley montague and like that famous old woman of the last century made considerable pretensions to be a blue stocking and a bel esprit lady linden wrote poems in english and italian which still may be read by the curious in the pages of the magazines of the day she entertained a correspondence with several of the european savants upon history science and ancient languages and especially theology her pleasure was to dispute controversial points with abbes and bishops and her flatterers said she rivalled madame dacier in learning every adventurer who had a discovery in chemistry a new antique bust or a plan for discovering the philosopher's stone was sure to find a patroness in her she had numberless works dedicated to her and sonnets without end addressed to her by all the poetasters of europe under the name of lindanira or callista her rooms were crowded with hideous china magot and all sorts of objects of virtu no woman piqued herself more upon her principles or allowed love to be made to her more profusely there was a habit of courtship practised by the fine gentlemen of those days which is little understood in our coarse downright times and young and old fellows would pour out floods of compliments in letters and madrigals such as would make a sober lady stare were they addressed to her nowadays so entirely has the gallantry of the last century disappeared out of our manners lady linden moved about with a little court of her own she had half a dozen carriages in her progresses in her own she would travel with her companion some shabby lady of quality her birds and poodles and the favorite savant for the time being in another would be her female secretary and her waiting women who in spite of their care could never make their mistress look much better than a slattern sir charles linden had his own chariot and the domestics of the establishment would follow in other vehicles also must be mentioned the carriage in which rode her lady's chaplain mr runt 
who acted in capacity of governor to her son, the little Viscount Bullingdon, a melancholy deserted little boy, about whom his father was more than indifferent, and whom his mother never saw, except for two minutes at her levee, when she would put to him a few questions of history or Latin grammar, after which he was consigned to his own amusements, or the care of his governor, for the rest of the day. The notion of such a Minerva as this, whom I saw in the public places now and then, surrounded by swarms of needy abbés and schoolmasters, who flattered her, frightened me for some time, and I had not the least desire to make her acquaintance. I had no desire to be one of the beggarly adorers in the great lady's train. Fellows, half friend, half lackey, who made verses and wrote letters and ran errands content to be paid by a seat in her ladyship's box at the comedy or a cover at her dinner-table at noon. Don't be afraid, Sir Charles Lyndon would say, whose great subject of conversation and abuse was his lady. My Lyndonera will have nothing to do with you. She likes the Tuscan brogue, not that of Carey. She says you smell too much of the stable to be admitted to ladies' society. And last Sunday fortnight, when she did me the honour to speak to me last, said, I wonder, Sir Charles Lyndon, a gentleman who has been the king's ambassador can demean himself by gambling and boozing with low Irish blacklegs. <laughs> Don't fly in a fury. I I'm a cripple, and it was Lyndonera said it, not I. This piqued me and I was resolved to become acquainted with Lady Linden, if it were but to show her ladyship that the descendant of those berries whose property she unjustly held was not an unworthy companion for any lady, were she ever so high. Besides, my friend the knight was dying. His widow would be the richest prize in the three kingdoms. Why should I not win her, and, with her, the means of making in the world that figure which my genius and inclination desired. I felt I was equal in blood and breeding to any Linden in Christendom, and determined to bend this haughty lady. When I determine, I look upon the thing as done. My uncle and I talked the matter over and speedily settled upon a method for making our approaches upon this stately lady of Castle Linden. Mr. Runt, young Bullingdon's governor, was fond of pleasure, of a glass of Rhenish in the garden-houses in the summer evenings, and of a sly throw of the dice when the occasion offered. And I took care to make friends with this person, who, being a college tutor and an Englishman, was ready to go on his knees to any one who resembled a man of fashion. Seeing me with my retinue of servants, my vis-a-vis -vis and chariots, my valets, my hussar and horses, dressed in gold and velvet and sables, saluting the greatest people in Europe as we met on the course or at the spas, Runt was dazzled by my advances, and was mine by a beckoning of the finger. I shall never forget the poor wretch's astonishment when I asked him to dine with two counts off gold plate at the little room in the casino. He was made happy by being allowed to win a few pieces of us, became exceedingly tipsy, sang Cambridge songs, and recreated the company by telling us, in his horrid Yorkshire French, stories about the gyps and all the lords that had ever been in his college. I encouraged him to come and see me oftener, and bring with him his little Viscount, for whom, though the boy always detested me, I took care to have a good stock of sweetmeats, toys, and picture books when he came. I then began to enter into a controversy with Mr. Runt, and confided to him some doubts which I had and a very, very earnest leaning towards the Church of Rome. I made a certain abbé, whom I knew, write me letters upon transubstantiation, etc., which the honest tutor was rather puzzled to receive. 
I knew that they would be communicated to his lady, as they were. For, asking leave to attend the English service, which was celebrated in her apartments, and frequented by the best English then at the spa, on the second Sunday she condescended to look at me. On the third she was pleased to reply to my profound bow by a curtsy. The next day I followed up the acquaintance by another obeisance in the public walk. And, to make a long story short, her ladyship and I were in full correspondence on transubstantiation before six weeks were over. My lady came to the aid of her chaplain, and then I began to see the prodigious weight of his arguments, as was to be expected. The progress of this harmless little intrigue need not be detailed. I make no doubt every one of my readers has practiced similar stratagems when a fair lady was in the case. I shall never forget the astonishment of Sir Charles Lyndon, when, on one summer evening, as he was issuing out to the play-table in his sedan-chair, according to his wont, her ladyship's barouche and four, with her outriders in the tawny livery of the Lyndon family, came driving into the courtyard of the house which they inhabited, and in that carriage, by her ladyship's side, sat no other than the vulgar Irish adventurer, as she was pleased to call him. I mean, Redmond Barry, Esquire. He made the most courtly of his bows, and grinned and waved his hat in as graceful a manner as the gout permitted. And her ladyship and I replied to the salutation with the utmost politeness and elegance on our part. I could not go to the play-table for some time afterwards, for Lady Lyndon and I had an argument on transubstantiation, which lasted for three hours, in which she was, as usual, victorious, and in which her companion, the Honourable Miss Flint Skinner, fell asleep. But when, at last, I joined Sir Charles at the casino, he received me with a yell of laughter, as his wont was, and introduced me to all the company as Lady Lyndon's interesting young convert, this was his way. He laughed and sneered at everything. He laughed when he was in a paroxysm of pain. He laughed when he won money or when he lost it. His laugh was not jovial or agreeable, but rather painful and sardonic. Gentlemen, said he to Punter, Colonel Loder, Count de Carreau, and several jovial fellows with whom he used to discuss a flask of champagne and a Rhenish trout or two after play. See this amiable youth. He has been troubled by religious scruples, and has flown for refuge to my chaplain, Mr. Runt, who has asked for advice from my wife, Lady Lyndon, and, between them both, they are confirming my ingenious young friend in his faith. Did you ever hear of such doctors, and such a disciple? Faith, sir, said I, if I want to learn good principles, it's surely better I should apply for them to your lady and your chaplain than to you. He wants to step into my shoes, continued the knight. The man would be happy who did so, responded I, provided there were no chalk stones included. At which reply Sir Charles was not very well pleased, and went on with increased rancor. He was always free-spoken in his cups, and, to say the truth, he was in his cups many more times in a week than his doctors allowed. "'Is it not a pleasure, gentlemen,' said he, "'for me, as I am drawing near the goal, to find my home such a happy one, my wife so fond of me, that she is even now thinking of appointing a successor? I don't mean you precisely, Mr. Barry.' You are only taking your chance with a score of others whom I could mention. Isn't it a comfort to see her, like a prudent housewife, getting everything ready for her husband's departure? I hope you are not thinking of leaving us soon, Knight, said I with perfect sincerity, for I liked him as a most amusing companion. 
"'Not so soon, my dear, as you may fancy, perhaps,' continued he. "'Why, man, I have been given over any time these four years, and there was always a candidate or two waiting to apply for this situation. Who knows how long I may keep you waiting?' "'And he did keep me waiting, some little time longer than at that period there was any reason to suspect.' As I declared myself pretty openly, according to my usual way, and authors are accustomed to describe the persons of the ladies with whom their heroes fall in love, in compliance with this fashion, I perhaps should say a word or two respecting the charms of my Lady Linden. But though I celebrated them in many copies of verses of my own and other persons' writing, and though I filled reams of paper in the passionate style of those days with compliments to every one of her beauties and smiles, in which I compared her to every flower goddess or famous heroine ever heard of, truth compels me to say that there was nothing divine about her at all. She was very well, but no more. Her shape was fine, her hair dark, her eyes good and exceedingly active, she loved singing, but performed it as so great a lady should, very much out of tune. She had a smattering of half a dozen modern languages, and, as I have said before, of many more sciences than I even knew the names of. She piqued herself on knowing Greek and Latin, but the truth is that Mr. Runt used to supply her with the quotations that she introduced into her voluminous correspondence. She had as much love of admiration, as strong, uneasy a vanity, and as little heart as any woman I ever knew. Otherwise, when her son, Lord Bullingdon, on account of his differences with me, ran, but that matter shall be told in its proper time. Finally, my Lady Linden was about a year older than myself, though, of course, she would take her Bible oath that she was three years younger. Few men are so honest as I am. So few will own to their real motives, and I don't care a button about confessing mine. What Sir Charles Linden said was perfectly true. I made the acquaintance of Lady Linden with ulterior views. Sir, said I to him when, after the scene described, and the jokes he made upon me we met alone, let those laugh that win. You were very pleasant upon me a few nights since, and on my intentions regarding your lady. Well, if they are what you think they are. If I do wish to step into your shoes, what then? I have no other intentions than you had yourself. I'll be sworn to muster just as much regard for my lady Linden as you ever showed her. And if I win her and wear her when you are dead and gone, Corbleu, knight, do you think it will be the fear of your ghost will deter me? Linden laughed as usual, but somewhat disconcertedly. Indeed, I had clearly the best of him in the argument, and had just as much right to hunt my fortune as he had. But one day, he said, if you marry such a woman as my lady Linden, Mark my words, you will regret it. You will pine after the liberty you once enjoyed. By George, Captain Barry, he added with a sigh, the thing that I regret most in life, perhaps it is because I am old, blasé, and dying, is that I never had a virtuous attachment. Ha <laughs> ha, a milkmaid's daughter, said I, laughing at the absurdity. Well, why not a milkmaid's daughter? My good fellow, I was in love in youth, as most gentlemen are, with my tutor's daughter, Helena, a bouncing girl, of course older than myself. This made me remember my own little love passages with Nora Brady in the days of my early life. And do you know, sir, I heartily regret I didn't marry her. There's nothing like having a virtuous drudge at home, sir. Depend upon that. It gives a zest to one's enjoyments in the world, take my word for it. 
no man of sense need restrict himself or deny himself a single amusement for his wife's sake on the contrary if he select the animal properly he will choose such a one as shall be no bar to his pleasure but a comfort in his hours of annoyance for instance i have got the gout who tends me a hired valet who robs me whenever he has the power my wife never comes near me what friend have i none in the wide world men of the world as you and i are don't make friends and we are fools for our pains get a friend sir and that friend a woman a good household drudge who loves you that is the most precious sort of friendship for the expense of it is all on the woman's side the man needn't contribute anything if he's a rogue she'll vow he's an angel if he's a brute she will like him all the better for his ill-treatment of her they like it sir these women they are born to be our greatest comforts and conveniences our our moral boot-jacks as it were and to men in your way of life believe me such a person would be invaluable i am only speaking for your bodily and mental comfort's sake mind why didn't i marry poor helena flower the curate's daughter i thought these speeches the remarks of a weakly disappointed man although since perhaps i have had reason to find the truth of sir charles linden's statements the fact is in my opinion that we often buy money very much too dear to purchase a few thousands a year at the expense of an odious wife is very bad economy for the young fellow of any talent and spirit and there have been moments of my life when in the midst of my greatest splendor and opulence with a half a dozen lords at my levee with the finest horses in my stables the grandest house over my head with unlimited credit at my bankers and lady linden to boot i have wished myself back a private of bulos or anything so as to get rid of her to return however to the story sir charles with his complication of ills was dying before us by inches and i've no doubt it could not have been very pleasant to him to see a young handsome fellow paying court to his widow before his own face as it were after i once got into the house on the transubstantiation dispute i found a dozen more occasions to improve my intimacy and was scarcely ever out of her ladyship's doors the world talked and blustered but what cared i the men cried fie upon the shameless irish adventurer but i have told my way of silencing such envious people and my sword by this time got such a reputation through europe that few people cared to encounter it if i can once get my hold of a place i keep it many's the house i've been to where i've seen the men avoid me fah the low irishman they would say bah the coarse adventurer out on the insufferable blackleg and puppy and so forth this hatred has been of no inconsiderable service to me in the world for when i fasten on a man nothing can induce me to release my hold and i am left to myself which is all the better as i told lady linden in those days with perfect sincerity callista i used to call her callista in my correspondence callista i swear to thee by the spotlessness of thy own soul by the brilliancy of thy immitigable eyes by everything pure and chaste in heaven and in thy own heart that i will never cease from following thee scorn i can bear and have borne at thy hands indifference i can surmount tis a rock which my energy will climb over a magnet which attracts the dauntless iron of my soul and it was true i wouldn't have left her no though they had kicked me downstairs every day i presented myself at her door that is my way of fascinating women let the man who has to make his fortune in life remember this maxim attacking is his only secret dare 
and the world always yields. Or, if it beat you sometimes, dare again, and it will succumb. In those days my spirit was so great that if I had set my heart upon marrying a princess of the blood, I would have had her. I told Callista my story, and altered very, very little of the truth. My object was to frighten her, to show her that what I wanted, that I dared, that what I dared, that I won. And there were striking passages enough in my history to convince her of my iron will and indomitable courage. Never hope to escape me, madam, I would say. Offer to marry another man, and he dies upon this sword, which never yet met its master. Fly from me, and I will follow you, though it were to the gates of Hades. I promise you this was very different language to that which she had been in the habit of hearing from her jemmy jessamy adorers. You should have seen how I scared the fellows from her. When I said in this energetic way that I would follow Lady Linden across the sticks if necessary, of course I meant that I would do so, provided nothing more suitable presented itself in the interim. If Linden would not die, what was the use of my pursuing the Countess? And somehow, towards the end of the spa season, very much to my mortification I do confess, the knight made another rally. It seemed as if nothing would kill him. I am sorry for you, Captain Barry, he would say, laughing as usual. I am grieved to keep you or any gentleman waiting. Had you not better arrange with my doctor or get the cook to flavor my omelette with arsenic? What are the odds, gentlemen, he would add, that I don't live to see Captain Barry hanged yet? In fact, the doctors tinkered him up for a year. It's my usual luck, I could not help saying to my uncle, who was my confidential and most excellent adviser in all matters of the heart. I've been wasting the treasures of my affection upon that flirt of a countess, and here's her husband restored to health, and likely to live I don't know how many years. And, as if to add to my mortification, there came just at this period to Spa an English tallow-chandler's heiress, with a plum to her fortune, and Madame Cornu, the widow of a Norman cattle-dealer and farmer-general, with a dropsy and two hundred livres a year. What's the use of my following the Lindens to England, said I, if the knight won't die? Don't follow them, my dear simple child, replied my uncle. Stop here and pay court to the new arrivals. Yes, and lose Callista forever, and the greatest estate in all England. <sighs> pooh, pooh, youths like you easily fire and easily despond. Keep up a correspondence with Lady Linden. You know there's nothing she likes so much. There's the Irish Abbe, who will write you the most charming letters for a crown apiece. Let her go. Write to her, and meanwhile, look out for anything else which may turn up. Who knows? You might marry the Norman widow, bury her, take her money, and be ready for the Countess against the knight's death. And so with vows of the most profound, respectful attachment, and having given twenty louis to Lady Linden's waiting-woman for a lock of her hair, of which fact, of course, the woman informed her mistress, I took leave of the countess, when it became necessary for her to return to her estates in England, swearing I would follow her as soon as an affair of honour I had on my hands could be safely brought to an end. I shall pass over the events of the year that ensued before I again saw her. She wrote to me according to promise, with much regularity at first, with somewhat less frequency afterwards. My affairs, meanwhile, at the play-table, went on not unprosperously, and I was just on the point of marrying the widow Cornu. We were at Brussels by this time, and the poor soul was madly in love with me, when the London Gazette was put into my hands, and I read the following announcement. Died at Castle Linden, in the Kingdom of Ireland, the Right Honourable Sir Charles Linden, 
Knight of the Bath, Member of Parliament for Linden in Devonshire, and many years His Majesty's representative at various European courts. He hath left behind him a name which is endeared to all his friends for his manifest virtues and talents, a reputation justly acquired in the service of His Majesty, and an inconsolable widow to deplore his loss. Her ladyship, the bereaved Countess of Linden, was at the bath when the horrid intelligence reached her of her husband's demise, and hastened to Ireland immediately in order to pay her last sad duties to his beloved remains. That very night I ordered my chariot and posted to Ostend, where I freighted a vessel to Dover, and, travelling rapidly into the west, reached Bristol, from which port I embarked for Waterford, and found myself, after an absence of eleven years, in my native country. End of chapter 13Chapter 14 of The Memoirs of Barry Lyndon, Esquire, by William Makepeace Thackeray. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 14. I return to Ireland, and exhibit my splendor and generosity in that kingdom. How were times changed with me now? I had left my country a poor, penniless boy a private soldier in a miserable marching regiment. I returned an accomplished man, with property to the amount of five thousand guineas in my possession, with a splendid wardrobe and jewel case worth two thousand more, having mingled in all the scenes of life a not undistinguished actor in them, having shared in war and in love, having by my own genius and energy won my way from poverty and obscurity to competence and splendor. As I looked out from my chariot windows as it rolled along over the bleak, bare roads, by the miserable cabins of the peasantry, who came out in their rags to stare as the splendid equipage passed, and huzzahed for his lordship's honor as they saw the magnificent stranger in the superb, gilded vehicle, my huge body-servant Fritz lolling behind with curling moustaches and long queue, his green livery barred with silver lace, I could not help thinking of myself with considerable complacency, and thanking my stars that had endowed me with so many good qualities. But for my own merits, I should have been a raw Irish squireen such as those I saw swaggering about the wretched towns through which my chariot passed on its road to Dublin. I might have married Nora Brady, and though, thank heaven, I did not, I have never thought of that girl but with kindness, and even remember the bitterness of losing her more clearly at this moment than any other incident of my life. I might have been the father of ten children by this time, or a farmer on my own account, or an agent to a squire, or a gauger, or an attorney. And here I was one of the most famous gentlemen of Europe. I bade my fellow get a bag of copper money and throw it among the crowd as we changed horses, and I warrant me there was as much shouting set up in praise of my honour as if my Lord Townsend, the Lord Lieutenant himself, had been passing. My second day's journey, for the Irish roads were rough in those days and the progress of a gentleman's chariot terribly slow, brought me to Carlow, where I put up at the very inn which I had used eleven years back when flying from home after the supposed murder of Quinn in the duel. How well I remember every moment of the scene. The old landlord was gone who had served me. The inn that I then thought so comfortable looked wretched and dismantled. But the claret was as good as in the old days, and I had the host to partake of a jug of it and hear the news of the country. He was as communicative as hosts usually are. The crops and the markets, the price of beasts at the last Castle Dermot Fair, the last story about the vicar, and the last joke of Father Hogan, the priest, how the white boys had burned down Squire Scanlan's ricks, and the highwaymen had been beaten off in their attack upon Sir Thomas's house, who was to hunt the Kilkenny hounds next season, 
and the wonderful run entirely they had last March. What troops were in the town, and how Miss Biddy Toole had run off with Ensign Mullins, all the news of sport, assize, and quarter sessions, were detailed by this worthy chronicler of small beer, who wondered that my honour hadn't heard of them in England, or in foreign parts, where he seemed to think the world was as interested as he was about the doings of Kilkenny and Carlo. I listened to these tales with, I own, a considerable pleasure, for every now and then a name would come up in the conversations which I remembered in old days, and bring with it a hundred associations connected with them. I had received many letters from my mother, who informed me of the doings of the Brady's town family. My uncle was dead, and Mick, his eldest son, had followed him too to the grave. The Brady girls had separated from their paternal roof as soon as their elder brother came to rule over it. Some were married, some had gone to settle with their odious old mother in out-of-the-way watering places. Ulick, though he had succeeded to the estate, had come in for a bankrupt property, and Castle Brady was now inhabited only by the bats and owls and the old gamekeeper. My mother, Mrs. Harry Berry, had gone to live at Bray to sit under Mr. Jowls, her favorite preacher, who had a chapel there. And, finally, the landlord told me that Mrs. Berry's son had gone to foreign parts, enlisted in the Prussian service, and had been shot there as a deserter. I don't care to own that I hired a stout nag from the landlord's stable after dinner, and rode back at nightfall twenty miles to my old home. My heart beat to see it. Berryville had got a pestle and mortar over the door, and was called the Escalapian Repository by Dr. McShane. A red-headed lad was spreading a plaster in the old parlor. The little window of my room, once so neat and bright, was cracked in many places, and stuffed with rags here and there. The flowers had disappeared from the trim garden beds which my good orderly mother tended. In the churchyard there were two more names put into the stone over the family vault of the Bradys. They were those of my cousin, for whom my regard was small, and my uncle, whom I had always loved. I asked my old companion the blacksmith, who had beaten me so often in old days, to give my horse a feed and a litter. He was a worn, weary-looking man now, with a dozen dirty, ragged children paddling about his smithy, and had no recollection of the fine gentleman who stood before him. I did not seek to recall myself to his memory till the next day, when I put ten guineas into his hand, and bade him drink the health of English Redmond. As for Castle Brady, the gates of the park were still there, but the old trees were cut down in the avenue, a black stump jutting out here and there, and casting long shadows as I passed in the moonlight over the worn, grass-grown old road. A few cows were at pasture there. The garden gate was gone, and the place a tangled wilderness. I sat down on the old bench, where I had sat on the day when Nora jilted me and I do believe my feelings were as strong then as they had been when I was a boy eleven years before. And I caught myself almost crying again to think that Nora Brady had deserted me. I believe a man forgets nothing. I've seen a flower or heard some trivial word or two which have awakened recollections that somehow had lain dormant for scores of years. And when I entered the house in Clarges Street, where I was born, it was used as a gambling house when I first visited London. All of a sudden the memory of my childhood came back to me, of my actual infancy. I recollected my father in green and gold, holding me up to look at a gilt coach which stood at the door, and my mother in a flowered sack with patches on her face. Some day, I wonder, will everything we have seen and thought and done come and flash across our minds in this way? I had rather not. I felt so as I sat upon the bench at Castle Brady and thought of the bygone times. The hall door was open. It was always so at that house. The moon was flaring in at the long old windows and throwing ghastly checkers upon the floors. 
and the stars were looking in on the other side, in the blue of the yawning window over the great stair. From it you could see the old stable clock, with the letters glistening on it still. There had been jolly horses in those stables once, and I could see my uncle's honest face, and hear him talking to his dogs as they came jumping and whining and barking round about him of a gay winter morning. We used to mount there, and the girls looked out at us from the hall window where I stood and looked at the sad, moldy, lonely old place. There was a red light shining through the crevices of a door at one corner of the building, and a dog presently came out baying loudly, and a limping man followed with a fowling piece. "'Who's there?' said the old man. "'Phil Purcell! Don't you know me?' shouted I. "'It's Redmond Barry!' I thought the old man would have fired his piece at me at first, for he pointed it at the window but I called to him to hold his hand and came down and embraced him. Sha! I don't care to tell the rest. Phil and I had a long night and talked over a thousand foolish old things that have no interest for any soul alive now. For what soul is there alive that cares for Barry Linden? I settled a hundred guineas on the old man when I got to Dublin and made him an annuity which enabled him to pass his old days in comfort. Poor Phil Purcell was amusing himself at a game of exceedingly dirty cards with an old acquaintance of mine, no other than Tim, who was called my valet in the days of yore, and whom the reader may remember as clad in my father's old liveries. They used to hang about him in those times, and lap over his wrists and down to his heels. But Tim, though he protested he had nigh killed himself with grief when I went away, had managed to grow enormously fat in my absence, and would have fitted almost into Daniel Lambert's coat, or that of the vicar of Castle Brady, whom he served in the capacity of clerk. I would have engaged the fellow in my service, but for his momentous size, which rendered him quite unfit to be the attendant of any gentleman of condition. And so I presented him with a handsome gratuity, and promised to stand godfather to his next child, the eleventh, since my absence. There is no country in the world where the work of multiplying is carried on so prosperously as in my native island. Mr. Tim had married the girl's waiting-maid, who had been a kind friend of mine in the early times, and I had to go salute poor Molly the next day, and found her a slatternly wench in a mud hut, surrounded by a brood of children almost as ragged as those of my friend the blacksmith. From Tim and Phil Purcell, thus met fortuitously together, I got the very last news respecting my family. My mother was well. Faith, sir, says Tim, and you've come in time, mayhap, for preventing an addition to your family. Sir, exclaimed I, in a fit of indignation, in the shape of father-in-law, I mane, sir. The mistress is going to take on with Mr. Jowls, the preacher. Poor Nora, he added, had made many additions to the illustrious race of Quinn, and my cousin Ulick was in Dublin, coming to little good, both my informants feared, and having managed to run through the small available remains of property which my good old uncle had left behind him. I saw I should have no small family to provide for. And then, to conclude the evening, Phil, Tim, and I had a bottle of usquebaugh, the taste of which I had remembered for eleven good years, and did not part except with the warmest terms of fellowship, and until the sun had been some time in the sky. I am exceedingly affable. That has always been one of my characteristics. I have no false pride, as many men of high lineage like my own have, and, in default of better company, will hob and knob with a ploughboy or a private soldier just as readily as with the first noble in the land. I went back to the village in the morning, and found a pretext for visiting Berryville, under a device of purchasing drugs. The hooks were still in the wall where my silver-hiked sword used to hang. A blister was lying on the window-sill where my mother's 
whole duty of man had its place. And the odious Dr. McShane had found out who I was. My countrymen find out everything, and a great deal more besides. And sniggering, asked me how I left the King of Prussia, and whether my friend, the Emperor Joseph, was as much liked as the Empress Maria Theresa had been. The bell-ringers would have had a ring of the bells for me, but there was but one, Tim, who was too fat to pull. And I rode off before the vicar, Dr. Bolter, who had succeeded old Mr. Texter, who had the living in my time, had time to come out to compliment me. But the rapscallions of the beggarly village had assembled in a dirty army to welcome me, and cheered, Hurrah for Master Redmond, as I rode away. My people were not a little anxious regarding me by the time I returned to Carlo, and the landlord was very much afraid, he said, that the highwaymen had gotten hold of me. There, too, my name and station had been learned from my servant Fritz, who had not spared his praises of his master, and had invented some magnificent histories concerning me. He said it was the truth that I was intimate with half the sovereigns of Europe, and the prime favorite with most of them. Indeed, I had made my uncle's order of the spur hereditary, and travelled under the name of the Chevalier Barry, Chamberlain to the Duke of Hohenzollern, Siegmaringen. They gave me the best horses the stable possessed to carry me on my road to Dublin, and the strongest ropes for harness. And we got on pretty well, and there was no rencontre between the highwaymen and the pistols with which Fritz and I were provided. We lay that night at Kilcullen, and the next day I made my entry into the city of Dublin, with four horses to my carriage, five thousand guineas in my purse, and one of the most brilliant reputations in Europe, having quitted the city a beggarly boy eleven years before. The citizens of Dublin have as great and laudable a desire for knowing their neighbors' concerns as the country people have, and it is impossible for a gentleman however modest his desires may be, and such mine have notoriously been through life, to enter the capital without having his name printed in every newspaper and mentioned in a number of societies. My name and titles were all over the town the day after my arrival. A great number of polite persons did me the honor to call at my lodgings when I selected them. And this was a point very necessarily of immediate care, for the hotels in the town were but vulgar holes, unfit for a nobleman of my fashion and elegance. I had been informed of the fact by travellers on the continent, and determining to fix on a lodging at once, I bade the drivers go slowly up and down the streets with my chariot, until I had selected a place suitable to my rank. This proceeding, and the uncouth questions and behaviour of my German Fritz, who was instructed to make inquiries at the different houses until convenient apartments could be lighted upon, brought an immense mob round my coach, and by the time the rooms were chosen you might have supposed I was the new general of the forces, so great was the multitude following us. I fixed at length upon a handsome suite of apartments in Capel Street, paid the ragged postilions who had driven me a splendid gratuity, and establishing myself in the rooms, with my baggage and Fritz, desired the landlord to engage me a second fellow to wear my liveries, a couple of stout, reputable chairmen and their machine, and a coachman who had handsome job-horses to hire for my chariot, and serviceable riding-horses to sell. I gave him a handsome sum in advance, and I promise you the effect of my advertisement was such that next day I had a regular levee in my antechamber. Grooms, valets, and maitres d'hôtel offered themselves without number. I had proposals for the purchase of horses sufficient to mount a regiment, both from dealers and gentlemen of the first fashion. Sir Lawler Galder came to propose to me the most elegant bay mare ever stepped. My lord Dundoodle had a team of four that wouldn't disgrace my friend the emperor, and the Marquess of Ballyragget sent his gentlemen and his compliments stating that if I would step up to his stables, or do him the honor of breakfasting with him previously, he would show me the two finest greys in Europe. 
I determined to accept the invitations of Dundoodle and Ballyragget, but to purchase my horses from the dealers. It is always the best way. Besides, in those days, in Ireland, if a gentleman warranted his horse and it was not sound, or a dispute arose, the remedy you had was the offer of a bullet in your waistcoat. I had played at the bullet game too much in earnest to make use of it heedlessly. And I may say, proudly for myself, that I never engaged in a duel unless I had a real, available, and prudent reason for it. There was a simplicity about this Irish gentry which amused and made me wonder. If they tell more fibs than their downright neighbors across the water, on the other hand, they believe more. And I made myself in a single week such a reputation in Dublin as would take a man ten years and a mint of money to acquire in London. I had won five hundred thousand pounds at play. I was the favorite of the Empress Catherine of Russia, the confidential agent of Frederick of Prussia. It was I who won the Battle of Hochkirchen. I was the cousin of Madame du Barry, the French king's favorite, and a thousand things beside. Indeed, to tell the truth, I hinted at a number of these stories to my kind friends Ballyragget and Gawler, and they were not slow to improve the hints I gave them. After having witnessed the splendors of civilized life abroad, the sight of Dublin in the year 1771, when I returned thither, struck me with anything but respect. It was as savage as Warsaw almost, without the regal grandeur of the latter city. The people looked more ragged than any race I have ever seen, except the gypsy hordes along the banks of the Danube. There was, as I have said, not an inn in the town fit for a gentleman of condition to dwell in. Those luckless fellows who could not keep a carriage, and walked the streets at night, ran imminent risks of the knives of the women and ruffians who lay in wait there. Of a set of ragged, savage villains, who neither knew the use of shoe, nor razor. And as a gentleman entered his chair or his chariot to be carried to the evening rout or the play, the flambeau of the footman would light up such a set of wild, gibbering, Milesian faces as would frighten a genteel person of average nerves. I was luckily endowed with strong ones. Besides, I had seen my amiable countrymen before. I know this description of them will excite anger among some Irish patriots, who don't like to have the nakedness of our land abused, and are angry if the whole truth be told concerning it. But, bah, it was a poor provincial place, Dublin, in the old days of which I speak, and many a tenth-rate German residency is more genteel. There were, it is true, near three hundred resident peers at the period, and a house of commons, and my lord mayor and his corporation, and a roistering noisy university, whereof the students made no small disturbances nightly, patronized the roundhouse, ducked obnoxious printers and tradesmen, and gave the law at the Crow Street Theatre. But I had seen too much of the first society of Europe to be much tempted by the society of these noisy gentry and was a little too much of a gentleman to mingle with the disputes and politics of my lord mayor and his aldermen. In the House of Commons there were some dozen of right pleasant fellows. I never heard in the English Parliament better speeches than from Flood and Daly of Galway. Dick Sheridan, though not a well-bred person, was as amusing and ingenious a table companion as ever I met, and though during Mr. Edmund Burke's interminable speeches in the English House I used always to go to sleep. I yet have heard from well-informed parties that Mr. Burke was a person of considerable abilities, and even reputed to be eloquent in his more favorable moments. I soon began to enjoy to the full extent the pleasures that the wretched place affords, and which were within a gentleman's reach. Ranala and the Redato, Mr. Mossop at Crow Street, my Lord Lieutenant's parties, where there was a great deal too much boozing and too little play to suit a person of my elegant and refined habits. Daly's Coffee House and the houses of the nobility were soon open to me, and I remarked with astonishment in the higher circles what I had experienced in the lower on my first unhappy visit to Dublin. 
an extraordinary want of money, and a preposterous deal of promissory notes flying about, for which I was quite unwilling to stake my guineas. The ladies, too, were mad for play, but exceeding unwilling to pay when they lost. Thus, when the old Countess of Trumpington lost ten pieces to me at quadrille, she gave me, instead of money, her ladyship's note of hand on her agent in Galway, which I put, with a great deal of politeness, into the candle. But when the Countess made me a second proposition to play, I said that as soon as her ladyship's remittances were arrived, I would be the readiest person to meet her, but till then was her very humble servant. And I maintained this resolution and singular character throughout the Dublin society, giving out at dailies that I was ready to play any man for any sum at any game, or to fence with him or ride with him, regard being had to our weight, or to shoot flying or at a mark. And in this latter accomplishment, especially if the mark be a live one, Irish gentlemen of that day had no ordinary skill. Of course, I dispatched a courier in my liveries to Castle Linden, with a private letter for Runt, demanding from him full particulars of the Countess of Linden's state of health and mind, and a touching and eloquent letter to her ladyship, in which I bade her remember ancient days, which I tied up with a single hair from the lock which I had purchased from her woman, and in which I told her that Sylvander remembered his oath, and could never forget his Callista. The answer I received from her was exceedingly unsatisfactory and inexplicit. That from Mr. Runt explicit enough, but not at all pleasant in its contents. My Lord George Poynings, the Marquis of Tiptoff's younger son, was paying very marked addresses to the widow, being a kinsman of the family, and having been called to Ireland relative to the will of the deceased Sir Charles Linden. Now there was a sort of rough-and-ready law in Ireland in those days, which was of great convenience to persons desirous of expeditious justice, and of which the newspapers of the time contain a hundred proofs. Fellows with the nicknames of Captain Fireball, Lieutenant Buffcoat, and Ensign Steele were repeatedly sending warning letters to landlords, and murdering them if the notes were unattended to. The celebrated Captain Thunder ruled in the southern counties, and his business seemed to be to procure wives for gentlemen who had not sufficient means to please the parents of the young ladies, or, perhaps, had not time for a long and intricate courtship. I had found my cousin Ulick at Dublin, grown very fat and very poor, hunted up by Jews and creditors, dwelling in all sorts of queer corners, from which he issued at nightfall to the castle, or to his card-party at his tavern. But he was always the courageous fellow, and I hinted to him the state of my affections regarding Lady Linden. "'The Countess of Linden,' said the poor Ulick. "'Well, that is a wonder. I myself have been mightily sweet upon a young lady, one of the killjoys of Ballyhack, who has ten thousand pounds to her fortune, and to whom her ladyship is a guardian. But how is a poor fellow without a coat to his back to get on with an heiress in such company as that? I might as well propose for the countess myself. You'd better not, said I, laughing. The man who tries runs a chance of going out of the world first. And I explained to him my own intention regarding Lady Linden. Honest Ulick, whose respect for me was prodigious when he saw how splendid my appearance was, and heard how wonderful my adventures and great my experience of fashionable life had been, was lost in admiration of my daring and energy when I confided to him my intention of marrying the greatest heiress in England. I bade Ulick go out of town on any pretext he chose, and put a letter into a post office near Castle Linden, which I prepared in a feigned hand and in which I gave a solemn warning to Lord George Poynings to quit the country, saying that the great prize was never meant for the likes of him, and that there were heiresses enough in England without coming to rob them out of the domains of Captain Fireball. The letter was written on a dirty piece of paper, in the worst spelling. It came to my lord by the post conveyance, and, being a high-spirited young man, he of course laughed at it, 
as ill luck would have it for him he appeared in dublin a very short time afterwards was introduced to the chevalier redmond barry at the lord lieutenant's table adjourned with him and several other gentlemen to the club at daly's and there in a dispute about the pedigree of a horse in which everybody said i was in the right words arose and a meeting was the consequence i had had no affair in dublin since my arrival and people were anxious to see whether i was equal to my reputation i make no boast about these matters but always do them when the time comes and poor lord george who had a neat hand and a quick eye enough but was bred in the clumsy english school only stood before my point until i had determined where i should hit him my sword went in under his guard and came out at his back when he fell he good-naturedly extended his hand to me and said mr barry i was wrong i felt not very well at ease when the poor fellow made this confession for the dispute had been of my making and to tell the truth i had never intended it should end in any other way than a meeting he lay on his bed for four months with the effects of that wound and the same post which conveyed to lady linden the news of the duel carried her a message from captain fireball to say this is number one you ulick said i shall be number two faith said my cousin one's enough but i had my plan regarding him and determined at once to benefit this honest fellow and to forward my own designs upon the widow End of chapter 14Chapter 15 of The Memoirs of Barry Lyndon, Esquire, by William Makepeace Thackeray. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 15 I Pay Court to My Lady Lyndon. As my uncle's attainder was not reversed for being out with the pretender in 1745, it would have been inconvenient for him to accompany his nephew to the land of our ancestors, where, if not hanging, at least a tedious process of imprisonment and a doubtful pardon would have awaited the good old gentleman. In any important crisis of my life his advice was always of advantage to me, and I did not fail to seek it at this juncture and to implore his counsel as regarded my pursuit of the widow. I told him of the situation of her heart, as I have described it in the last chapter, of the progress that young Poynings had made in her affections, and of her forgetfulness of her old admirer. And I got a letter, in reply, full of excellent suggestions, by which I did not fail to profit. The kind Chevalier prefaced it by saying that he was for the present boarding in the Minorite convent at Brussels, that he had thoughts of making his salut there, and retiring forever from the world devoting himself to the severest practices of religion. Meanwhile, he wrote with regard to the lovely widow. It was natural that a person of her vast wealth and not disagreeable person should have many adorers about her, and that, as in her husband's lifetime she had shown herself not at all disinclined to receive my addresses, I must make no manner of doubt I was not the first person whom she had so favoured nor was I likely to be the last. I would, my dear child, he added, that the ugly attainder round my neck, and the resolution I have formed of retiring from a world of sin and vanity altogether, did not prevent me from coming personally to your aid in this delicate crisis of your affairs. For to lead them to a good end, it requires not only the indomitable courage, swagger, and audacity which you possess beyond any young man I have ever known, as for the swagger as the chevalier calls it i deny it in toto being always the most modest in my demeanour but though you have the vigour to execute you have not the ingenuity to suggest plans of conduct for the following out of a scheme that is likely to be long and difficult of execution 
would you have ever thought of the brilliant scheme of the countess ida which so nearly made you the greatest fortune in europe but for the advice and experience of a poor old man now making up his accounts with the world and about to retire from it for good and all well with regard to the countess of linden your manner of winning her is quite en l'air at present to me nor can i advise day by day as i would according to circumstances as they arise but your general scheme should be this if i remember the letters you used to have from her during the period of the correspondence which the silly woman entertained you with much high-flown sentiments passed between you and especially was written by her ladyship herself she is a blue stocking and fond of writing she used to make her griefs with her husband the continual theme of her correspondence as women will do i recollect several passages in her letters bitterly deploring her fate in being united to one so unworthy of her surely in the mass of ba you possess from her there must be enough to compromise her look them well over select passages and threaten to do so write to her at first in the undoubting tone of a lover who has every claim upon her then if she is silent remonstrate alluding to former promises from her producing proofs of her former regard for you vowing despair destruction revenge if she prove unfaithful frighten her astonish her by some daring feat which will let her see your indomitable resolution you are the man to do it your sword has a reputation in europe and you have a character for boldness which was the first thing that caused my lady linden to turn her eyes upon you make the people talk about you at dublin be as splendid and as brave and as odd as possible how i wish i were near you you have no imagination to invent such a character as i would make for you but why speak have i not had enough of the world and its vanities there was much practical good sense in this advice which i quote unaccompanied with the lengthened description of his mortifications and devotions which my uncle indulged in finishing his letter as usual with earnest prayers for my conversion to the true faith but he was constant to his form of worship and i as a man of honor and principle, was resolute to mine, and have no doubt that the one, in this respect, will be as acceptable as the other. Under these directions it was, then, that I wrote to Lady Linden, to ask on my arrival when the most respectful of her admirers might be permitted to intrude upon her grief. Then, as her ladyship was silent, I demanded, had she forgotten old times, and one whom she had favoured with her intimacy at a very happy period had callista forgotten eugenio at the same time i sent down by my servant with this letter a present of a little sword for lord bullingdon and a private note to his governor whose note of hand by the way i possessed for a sum i forget what but such as the poor fellow would have been very unwilling to pay to this an answer came from her ladyship's amanuensis stating that lady linden was too much disturbed by grief at her recent dreadful calamity to see any one but her own relations and advices from my friend the boy's governor stating that my lord george poynings was the young kinsman who was about to console her this caused the quarrel between me and the young nobleman whom I took care to challenge on his first arrival at Dublin. When the news of the duel was brought to the widow at Castle Linden, my informant wrote me that Lady Linden shrieked and flung down the journal and said, The horrible monster! He would not shrink from murder, I believe. And little Lord Bullingdon, drawing his sword, the sword I had given him, the rascal, declared he would kill with it the man who had hurt Cousin George on mr runt telling him that i was the donor of the weapon the little rogue still vowed that he would kill me all the same indeed in spite of my kindness to him that boy always seemed to detest me 
her ladyship sent up daily couriers to inquire after the health of Lord George, and thinking to myself that she would probably be induced to come to Dublin if she were to hear that he was in danger. I managed to have her informed that he was in a precarious state, that he grew worse, that Redmond Barry had fled in consequence. Of this flight I caused the Mercury newspaper to give notice also, but indeed it did not carry me beyond the town of Bray, where my poor mother dwelt, and where, under the difficulties of a duel, I might be sure of having a welcome. Those readers who have the sentiment of filial duty strong in their mind will wonder that I have not yet described my interview with that kind mother, whose sacrifices for me in youth had been so considerable, and for whom a man of my warm and affectionate nature could not but feel the most enduring and sincere regard. But a man, moving in the exalted sphere of society in which I now stood, has his public duties to perform before he consults his private affections. And so upon my first arrival I dispatched a messenger to Mrs. Berry, stating my arrival, conveying to her my sentiments of respect and duty, and promising to pay them to her personally as soon as my business in Dublin would leave me free. This, I need not say, was very considerable. I had my horses to buy, my establishment to arrange, my entree into the genteel world to make, and having announced my intention to purchase horses and live in a genteel style, was in a couple of days so pestered by visits of the nobility and gentry, and so hampered by invitations to dinners and suppers, that it became exceedingly difficult for me during some days to manage my anxiously desired visit to Mrs. Barry. It appears that the good soul provided an entertainment as soon as she heard of my arrival, and invited all her humble acquaintances of Bray to be present, but I was engaged subsequently to my lord Ballyragget on the day appointed, and was of course obliged to break the promise I had made to Mrs. Barry to attend her humble festival. I endeavoured to sweeten the disappointment by sending my mother a handsome satin sack and a velvet robe which I purchased for her at the best mercers in Dublin, and indeed told her I had brought from Paris expressly for her, but the messenger whom I dispatched with the presents brought back the parcels, with the piece of satin torn halfway up the middle, and I did not need his descriptions to be aware that something had offended the good lady, who came out, he said, and abused him at the door and would have boxed his ears but that she was restrained by a gentleman in black, who, I concluded, with justice, was her clerical friend, Mr. Jowls. The reception of my presence made me rather dread than hope for an interview with Mrs. Berry, and delayed my visit to her for some days further. I wrote her a dutiful and soothing letter, to which there was no answer returned, although I mentioned that on my way to the capital I had been at Berryville, and revisited the old haunts of my youth, I don't care to own that she is the only human being whom I am afraid to face. I can recollect her fits of anger as a child, and the reconciliations, which used to be still more violent and painful. And so, instead of going myself, I sent my factotum, Ulick Brady, to her, who rode back, saying that he had met with a reception he would not again undergo for twenty guineas, that he had been dismissed the house, with strict injunctions to inform me that my mother disowned me forever. This parental anathema, as it were, affected me much, for I was always the most dutiful of sons, and I determined to go as soon as possible, and brave what I knew must be an inevitable scene of reproach and anger, for the sake, as I hoped, of as certain a reconciliation. I had been giving one night an entertainment to some of the genteelest company in Dublin, and was showing my lord Marquis downstairs with a pair of wax tapers, when I found a woman in a grey coat seated at my doorsteps, and to whom, taking her for a beggar, I tendered a piece of money, and whom my noble friends, who were rather hot with wine, began to joke, as my door closed and I bade them all good night. I was rather surprised and affected to find afterwards that the hooded woman was no other than my mother, 
whose pride had made her vow that she would not enter my doors, but whose natural maternal yearnings had made her long to see her son's face once again, and who had thus planted herself in disguise at my gate. Indeed, I have found in my experience that these are the only women who will never deceive a man, and whose affection remains constant through all trials. Think of the hours that the kind soul must have passed, lonely in the street, listening to the din and merriment within my apartments, the clinking of the glasses, the laughing, the choruses, and the cheering. When my affair with Lord George happened, and it became necessary to me, for the reasons I have stated, to be out of the way, now, thought I, is the time to make my peace with my good mother. She will never refuse me an asylum now that I am in distress. So sending to her a notice that I was coming, that I had had a duel which had brought me into trouble, and required I should go into hiding, I followed my messenger half an hour afterwards, and I warrant me there was no want of a good reception, for presently, being introduced into an empty room by the barefooted maid who waited upon Mrs. Berry, the door was opened, and the poor mother flung herself into my arms with a scream, and with transports of joy which I shall not attempt to describe. They are but to be comprehended by women who have held in their arms an only child after a twelve years' absence from him. The Reverend Mr. Jowles, my mother's director, was the only person to whom the door of her habitation was opened during my sojourn, and he would take no denial. He mixed for himself a glass of rum punch, which he seemed in the habit of drinking at my good mother's charge, groaned aloud, and forthwith began reading me a lecture upon the sinfulness of my past courses, and especially of the last horrible action I had been committing. Sinful? said my mother, bristling up when her son was attacked. Sure we're all sinners, and it's you, Mr. Jowles, who have given me the inexpressible blessing to let me know that. But how else would you have the poor child behave? I would have had the gentleman avoid the drink, and the quarrel, and this wicked duel altogether, answered the clergyman. But my mother cut him short, by saying such sort of conduct might be very well in a person of his cloth and his birth, but it neither became a Brady nor a Barry. In fact, she was quite delighted with the thought that I had pinked an English Marquis's son in a duel, and so, to console her, I told her of a score more in which I had been engaged, and of some of which I have already informed the reader. As my late antagonist was in no sort of danger when I spread that report of his perilous situation, there was no particular call that my hiding should be very close. But the widow did not know the fact as well as I did, and caused her house to be barricaded, and Becky, her barefooted serving wench, to be a perpetual sentinel to give alarm lest the officers should be in search of me. The only person I expected, however, was my cousin Ulick, who was to bring me the welcome intelligence of Lady Linden's arrival. And I own, after two days' close confinement at Bray, in which I narrated all the adventures of my life to my mother, and succeeded in making her accept the dresses she had formerly refused, and a considerable addition to her income which I was glad to make, I was very glad when I saw that reprobate, Ulick Brady, as my mother called him, ride up to the door in my carriage with the welcome intelligence for my mother that the young lord was out of danger, and, for me, that the Countess of Linden had arrived in Dublin. "'And I wish, Redmond, that the young gentleman had been in danger a little longer,' said the widow, her eyes filling with tears. "'And you'd have stayed so much the more with your poor old mother.' but I dried her tears, embracing her warmly, and promised to see her often, and hinted I would have, mayhap, a house of my own and a noble daughter to welcome her. "'Who is she, Redmond, dear?' said the old lady. "'One of the noblest and richest women in the empire, mother,' answered I. "'No mere Brady this time,' I added, laughing, with which hopes I left Mrs. Berry in the best of tempers. No man can bear less malice than I do, and, when I have once carried my point, 
I am one of the most placable creatures in the world. I was a week in Dublin before I thought it necessary to quit that capital. I had become quite reconciled to my rival in that time, made a point of calling at his lodgings, and speedily became an intimate consoler of his bedside. He had a gentleman to whom I did not neglect to be civil, and towards whom I ordered my people to be particular in their attentions for I was naturally anxious to learn what my Lord George's position with the lady of Castle Linden had really been, whether other suitors were about the widow, and how she would bear the news of his wound. The young nobleman himself enlightened me somewhat upon the subjects I was most desirous to inquire into. "'Chevalier,' said he to me one morning when I went to pay him my compliments, I find you are an old acquaintance with my kinswoman, the Countess of Linden. She writes me a page of abuse of you in a letter here. And the strange part of the story is this, that one day when there was talk about you at Castle Linden, and the splendid equipage you were exhibiting in Dublin, the fair widow vowed and protested that she never had heard of you. Oh, yes, mamma, said the little Bullingdon, the tall dark man at Spa with the cast in his eye who used to make my governor tipsy and sent me the sword. His name is Mr. Barry. But my lady ordered the boy out of the room and persisted in knowing nothing about you. And are you a kinsman and acquaintance of my lady Linden, my lord? said I, in a tone of grave surprise. Yes, indeed, answered the young gentleman. I left her house but to get this ugly wound from you. And it came at a most unlucky time, too. Why more unlucky now than at another moment? Why, look you, Chevalier, I think the widow was not unpartial to me. I think I might have induced her to make our connection a little closer. And faith, though she is older than I am, she is the richest party now in England. My Lord George, said I, will you let me ask you a frank, but an odd question? Will you show me her letters? "'Indeed, I'll do no such thing,' replied he, in a rage. "'Nay, don't be angry. "'If I show you letters of Lady Linden's to me, "'will you let me see hers to you?' "'What, in heaven's name, do you mean, Mr. Barry?' said the young gentleman. "'I mean that I passionately loved Lady Linden. "'I mean that I'm a—that I rather was not indifferent to her— I mean that I love her to distraction at this present moment, and will die myself, or kill the man who possesses her before me. You marry the greatest heiress and the noblest blood in England, said Lord George haughtily. There's no nobler blood in Europe than mine, answered I, and I tell you I don't know whether to hope or not. But this I know, that there were days in which, poor as I am, the great heiress did not disdain to look down upon my poverty, and that any man who marries her passes over my dead body to do it. It's lucky for you, I added gloomily, that on the occasion of my engagement with you I did not know what were your views regarding my Lady Linden. My poor boy, you are a lad of courage, and I love you. Mine is the first sword in Europe, and you would have been lying in a narrower bed than you now occupy. Boy, said Lord George, I am not four years younger than you are. You are forty years younger than I am in experience. I have passed through every grade of life. With my own skill and daring I have made my own fortune. I have been in fourteen pitched battles as a private soldier, and have been twenty-three times on the ground, and never was touched but once, and that was by the sword of a French maitre d'armes whom I killed. I started in life at seventeen a beggar, and am now at seven-and-twenty with twenty thousand guineas. Do you suppose a man of my courage and energy can't attain anything that he dares, and that having claims upon the widow I will not press them? This speech was not exactly true to the letter, for I had multiplied my pitched battles, my duels, and my wealth somewhat, but I saw that it made the impression I desired to effect upon the young gentleman's mind who listened to my statement with peculiar seriousness, and whom I presently left to digest it. A couple of days afterwards I called to see him again, 
when I brought with me some of the letters that had passed between me and my Lady Linden. Here, said I, look, I show it you in confidence. It is a lock of her ladyship's hair. Here are her letters signed Callista and addressed to Eugenio. Here is a poem. When Saul bedecks the mead with light, and pallid Cynthia sheds her ray, addressed by her ladyship to your humble servant. Callista, Eugenio, Saul bedecks the mead with light, cried the young lord. Am I dreaming? Why, my dear Barry, the widow has sent me the very poem herself. Rejoicing in the sunshine bright, or musing in the evening gray? I could not help laughing as he made the quotation. They were, in fact, the very words my Callista had addressed to me. And we found, upon comparing letters, that whole passages of eloquence figured in the one correspondence which appeared in the other. See what it is to be a blue-stocking and have a love of letter-writing. The young man put down the letters in great perturbation. Well, thank heaven, said he after a pause of some duration. Thank heaven for a good riddance. Ah, Mr. Berry, what a woman I might have married had these lucky papers not come in my way. I thought my Lady Linden had a heart, sir, I must confess, though not a very warm one, and that at least one could trust her. But marry her now. I would as lief send my servant into the street to get me a wife as put up with such an Ephesian matron as that. My Lord George, said I, you little know the world. Remember what a bad husband Lady Linden had, and don't be astonished that she on her side should be indifferent. Nor has she, I will dare to wager, ever passed beyond the bounds of harmless gallantry, or sinned beyond the composing of a sonnet or a billet doux. My wife, said the little lord, shall write no sonnets or billet doux, and I am heartily glad to think I have obtained in good time a knowledge of the heartless vixen with whom I thought myself for a moment in love. The wounded young nobleman was either, as I have said, very young and green in matters of the world. For to suppose that a man would give up forty thousand a year because, forsooth, the lady connected with it had written a few sentimental letters to a young fellow is too absurd. Or, as I am inclined to believe, he was glad of an excuse to quit the field altogether, being by no means anxious to meet the victorious sword of Redmond Barry a second time. When the idea of Poining's danger, or the reproaches probably addressed by him to the widow regarding myself, had brought this exceedingly weak and feeble woman up to Dublin as I expected, and my worthy Ulick had informed me of her arrival, I quitted my good mother, who was quite reconciled to me, indeed the duel had done that, and found the disconsolate Callista was in the habit of paying visits to the wounded swain. Much to the annoyance, the servants told me, of that gentleman. The English are often absurdly high and haughty upon a point of punctilio, and after his kinswoman's conduct, Lord Poynings swore he would have no more to do with her. I had this information from his lordship's gentleman, with whom, as I have said, I took particular care to be friends. Nor was I denied admission by his porter, when I chose to call as before. Her ladyship had most likely bribed that person, as I had, for she had found her way up, though denied admission, and, in fact, I had watched her from her own house to Lord George Poining's lodgings, and seen her descend from her chair there and enter, before I myself followed her. I proposed to await her quietly in the anteroom, to make a scene there and reproach her with infidelity if necessary. But matters were, as it happened, arranged much more conveniently for me, and walking unannounced into the outer room of his lordship's apartments, I had the felicity of hearing in the next chamber, of which the door was partially open, the voice of my Callista. She was in full cry, appealing to the poor patient, as he lay confined in his bed, and speaking in the most passionate manner. "'What can lead you, George?' she said to doubt of my faith. How can you break my heart by casting me off in this monstrous manner? Do you wish to drive your poor Callista to the grave? Well, well, 
I shall join there the dear departed angel. Who entered it three months since, said Lord George with a sneer. It's a wonder you have survived so long. Don't treat your poor Callista in this cruel, cruel manner, Antonio, cried the widow. Bah, said Lord George, my wound is bad. My doctors forbid me much talk. Suppose your Antonio tired, my dear. Can't you console yourself with somebody else? Heavens, Lord George! Antonio! Console yourself with Eugenio, said the young nobleman bitterly, and began ringing his bell, on which his valet, who was in an inner room, came out, and he bade him show her ladyship downstairs. Lady Linden issued from the room in the greatest flurry. She was dressed in deep weeds, with a veil over her face, and did not recognize the person waiting in the outer apartment. As she went down the stairs, I stepped lightly after her, and as her chairman opened her door, sprang forward and took her hand to place her in the vehicle. "'Dearest widow,' said I, "'his lordship spoke correctly. Console yourself with Eugenio.' She was too frightened even to scream as her chairman carried her away. She was set down at her house, and you may be sure that I was at the chair door as before to help her out. "'Monstrous man,' said she, "'I desire you to leave me.' "'Madam, it would be against my oath,' replied I. "'Recollect the vow Eugenio sent to Callista. "'If you do not quit me, I will call for the domestics to turn you from the door.' "'What, when I am come with my Callista's letters in my pocket to return them, mayhap? "'You can soothe, madam, but you cannot frighten Redmond Barry. "'What is it you would have of me, sir?' said the widow, rather agitated. "'Let me come upstairs, and I will tell you all,' I replied. And she condescended to give me her hand, and to permit me to lead her from her chair to her drawing-room. When we were alone, I opened my mind honorably to her. "'Dearest madam,' said I, "'do not let your cruelty drive a desperate slave to fatal measures. I adore you. In former days you allowed me to whisper my passion to you unrestrained.' At present you drive me from your door, leave my letters unanswered, and prefer another to me. My flesh and blood cannot bear such treatment. Look upon the punishment I have been obliged to inflict. Tremble at that which I may be compelled to administer to that unfortunate young man. So sure as he marries you, madam, he dies. I do not recognize, said the widow, the least right you have to give the law to the Countess of Linden. I do not in the least understand your threats or heed them. What has passed between me and an Irish adventurer that should authorize this impertinent intrusion? These have passed, madam, said I. Callista's letters to Eugenio. Well, they may have been very innocent, but will the world believe it? You may have only intended to play with the heart of the poor, artless Irish gentleman who adored and confided in you. But who will believe the stories of your innocence against the irrefragable testimony of your own handwriting? Who will believe that you could write these letters in the mere wantonness of coquetry, and not under the influence of affection? Villain, cried my Lady Linden, could you dare to construe out of those idle letters of mine any other meaning than that which they really bear? I will construe anything out of them, said I. Such is the passion which animates me towards you. I have sworn it. You must and shall be mine. Did you ever know me to promise to accomplish a thing and fail? Which will you prefer to have from me? A love such as woman never knew from man before, or a hatred to which there exists no parallel? A woman of my rank, sir can fear nothing from the hatred of an adventurer like yourself, replied the lady, drawing up stately. Look at your poinings. Was he of your rank? You are the cause of that young man's wound, madam, and, but that the instrument of your savage cruelty relented, would have been the author of his murder. Yes, of his murder, for if a wife is faithless, 
does not she arm the husband who punishes the seducer? And I look upon you, Honoria Linden, as my wife. Husband? Wife, sir? cried the widow, quite astonished. Yes, wife, husband. I'm not one of those poor souls with whom coquettes can play, and who may afterwards throw them aside. You would forget what passed between us at Spa. Callista would forget Eugenio, but I will not let you forget me. You thought to trifle with my heart, did you? When once moved, Honoria, it is moved forever. I love you, love as passionately now as I did when my passion was hopeless. And now that I can win you, do you think I will forego you? Cruel, cruel Callista. You little know the power of your own charms if you think their effect is so easily obliterated. You little know the constancy of this pure and noble heart if you think that, having once loved, it can ever cease to adore you. No. I swear by your cruelty that I will revenge it, by your wonderful beauty that I will win it, and be worthy to win it. Lovely, fascinating, fickle, cruel woman. You shall be mine, I swear it. Your wealth may be great, but am I not of a generous nature enough to use it worthily? Your rank is lofty, but not so lofty as my ambition. You threw yourself away once on a cold and spiritless debauchee. Give yourself now, Honoria, to a man, and one who, however lofty your rank may be, will enhance and become it. As I poured words to this effect out on the astonished widow, I stood over her and fascinated her with the glance of my eye, saw her turn red and pale with fear and wonder saw that my praise of her charms and the exposition of my passion were not unwelcome to her, and witnessed with triumphant composure the mastery I was gaining over her. Terror, be sure of that, is not a bad ingredient of love. A man who wills fiercely to win the heart of a weak and vaporish woman must succeed, if he have opportunity enough. Terrible man, said Lady Linden, shrinking from me as soon as I had done speaking. Indeed, I was at a loss for words, and thinking of another speech to make to her. Terrible man! Leave me! I saw that I had made an impression on her, from those very words. If she lets me into the house tomorrow, said I, she is mine. As I went downstairs, I put ten guineas into the hand of the hall porter who looked quite astonished at such a gift. "'It is to repay you for the trouble of opening the door to me,' said I. "'You will have to do so often.'" End of chapter 15「Chapter 16 of The Memoirs of Barry Lyndon, Esquire, by William Makepeace Thackeray. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 16. I Provide Nobly for My Family The next day when I went back, my fears were realized. The door was refused to me. My lady was not at home. This I knew to be false. I had watched the door the whole morning from a lodging I took at a house opposite. Your lady is not out, said I. She has denied me and I can't, of course, force my way to her. But listen, you are an Englishman. That I am, said the fellow, with an air of the utmost superiority. Your honor could tell that by my accent. Listen, then, said I, your lady's letters pass through your hands, don't they? A crown for every one that you bring me to read. There's a whiskey shop in the next street. Bring them there when you go to drink, and call for me by the name of Dermot. I recollect your honor at Spar, says the fellow, grinning. Seven's the main, hey? And being exceedingly proud of this reminiscence, I bade my inferior adieu. 
I do not defend this practice of letter-opening in private life, except in cases of the most urgent necessity, when we must follow the examples of our betters, the statesmen of all Europe, and, for the sake of a great good, infringe a little matter of ceremony. My Lady Linden's letters were none the worse for being opened, and a great deal the better, the knowledge obtained from the perusal of some of her multifarious epistles enabling me to become intimate with her character in a hundred ways, and obtain a power over her by which I was not slow to profit. By the aid of the letters and of my English friend, whom I always regaled with the best of liquor, and satisfied with presents of money still more agreeable, I used to put on a livery in order to meet him, and a red wig, in which it was impossible to know the dashing and elegant Redmond Barry. I got such an insight into the widow's movements as astonished her. I knew beforehand to which public places she would go. They were, on account of her widowhood, but few. And wherever she appeared, at church or in the park, I was always ready to offer her her book or canter on horseback by the side of her chariot. Many of her ladyship's letters were the most whimsical rodomontades that ever blue stocking penned. She was a woman who took up and threw off a greater number of dear friends than any one I ever knew. To some of these female darlings she began presently to write about my unworthy self, and it was with a sentiment of extreme satisfaction I found at length that the widow was growing dreadfully afraid of me, calling me her bête noire, her dark spirit, her murderous adorer, and a thousand other names indicative of her extreme disquietude and terror. It was, The wretch has been dogging my chariot through the park, or My fate pursued me at church, and My inevitable adorer handed me out of my chair at the mercers, or what not. My wish was to increase this sentiment of awe in her bosom, and to make her believe that I was a person from whom escape was impossible. To this end, I bribed a fortune-teller whom she consulted along with a number of the most foolish and distinguished people of Dublin in those days, and who, although she went dressed like one of her waiting-women, did not fail to recognize her real rank, and to describe as her future husband her persevering adorer, Redmond Berry, Esquire. This incident disturbed her very much. She wrote about it in terms of great wonder and terror to her female correspondents. Can this monster, she wrote, indeed do as he boasts and bend even fate to his will? Can he make me marry him, though I cordially detest him, and bring me a slave to his feet? The horrid look of his black serpent-like eyes fascinates and frightens me. It seems to follow me everywhere and even when I close my own eyes, the dreadful gaze penetrates the lids and is still upon me. When a woman begins to talk of a man in this way, he is an ass who does not win her. And for my part, I used to follow her about and put myself in an attitude opposite her and fascinate her with my glance, as she said, most assiduously. Lord George Poynings, her former admirer, was meanwhile keeping his room with his wound, and seemed determined to give up all claims to her favor, for he denied her admittance when she called, sent no answer to her multiplied correspondence, and contented himself by saying generally that the surgeon had forbidden him to receive visitors or to answer letters. Thus, while he went into the background, I came forward, and took care that no other rivals should present themselves with any chance of success for as soon as I heard of one, I had a quarrel fastened on him, and in this way pinked two more, besides my first victim, Lord George. I always took another pretext for quarrelling with them than the real one of attention to Lady Linden, so that no scandal or hurt to her ladyship's feelings might arise in consequence. But she very well knew what was the meaning of these duels, and the young fellows of Dublin, too, by laying two and two together, began to perceive that there was a certain dragon in watch for the wealthy heiress, and that the dragon must be subdued first, before they could get at the lady. 
I warrant that, after the first three, not many champions were found to address the lady, and have often laughed, in my sleeve, to see many of the young Dublin beaux riding by the side of her carriage scamper off as soon as my bay mare and green liveries made their appearance. I wanted to impress her with some great and awful instance of my power, and to this end had determined to confer a great benefit upon my honest cousin Ulick, and carry off for him the fair object of his affections, Miss Kiljoy, under the very eyes of her guardian and friend, Lady Linden, and in the teeth of the squires, the young lady's brothers, who passed the season at Dublin, and made as much swagger and to-do about their sister's ten thousand pounds Irish, as if she had a plum to her fortune. The girl was by no means averse to Mr. Brady, and it only shows how faint-spirited some men are, and how a superior genius can instantly overcome difficulties which to common minds seem insuperable, that he never had the thought of running off with her, as I at once, and boldly, did. Miss Kiljoy had been a ward in Chancery until she attained her majority, before which period it would have been a dangerous matter for me to put in execution the scheme I meditated concerning her. But, though now free to marry whom she liked, she was a young lady of timid disposition, and as much under fear of her brothers and relatives as though she had not been independent of them. They had some friend of their own in view for the young lady, and had scornfully rejected the proposal of Ulick Brady, the ruined gentleman, who was quite unworthy, as these rustic bucks thought, of the hand of such a prodigiously wealthy heiress as their sister. Finding herself lonely in her great house in Dublin, the Countess of Linden invited her friend Miss Amelia to pass the season with her at Dublin and, in a fit of maternal fondness, also sent for her son, the little Bullingdon, and my old acquaintance, his governor, to come to the capital and bear her company. A family coach brought the boy, the heiress, and the tutor from Castle Linden, and I determined to take the first opportunity of putting my plan in execution. For this chance I had not very long to wait. I have said in a former chapter of my biography, that the kingdom of Ireland was at this period ravaged by various parties of banditti, who, under the name of white boys, oak boys, steel boys, with captains at their head, killed proctors, fired stacks, hawked and maimed cattle, and took the law into their own hands. One of these bands, or several of them for what I know, was commanded by a mysterious personage called Captain Thunder, whose business seemed to be that of marrying people with or without their own consent, or that of their parents. The Dublin Gazettes and Mercuries of that period, the year 1772, teem with proclamations from the Lord Lieutenant, offering rewards for the apprehension of this dreadful Captain Thunder and his gang, and describing at length the various exploits of the savage aide-de-camp of Hymen. I determined to make use, if not of the services, at any rate of the name of Captain Thunder, and put my cousin Ulick in possession of his lady and her ten thousand pounds. She was no great beauty, and I presume it was the money he loved, rather than the owner of it. On account of her widowhood, Lady Linden could not as yet frequent the balls and routs which the hospitable nobility of Dublin were in the custom of giving but her friend Miss Kiljoy had no such cause for retirement, and was glad to attend any parties to which she might be invited. I made Ulick Brady a present of a couple of handsome suits of velvet, and by my influence procured him an invitation to many of the most elegant of these assemblies. But he had not my advantages or experience of the manners of court, was as shy with ladies as a young colt, and could no more dance a minuet than a donkey. He made very little way in the polite world or in his mistress's heart. In fact, I could see that she preferred several other young gentlemen to him, who were more at home in the ballroom than poor Ulick. He had made his first impression upon the heiress, and felt his first flame for her, in her father's house of Ballykiljoy, where he used to hunt and get drunk with the old gentleman. I could do them too well enough anyhow, 
Ulick would say, heaving a sigh. And if it's drinking or riding across country would do it, there's no man in Ireland would have a better chance with Amelia. Never fear, Ulick, was my reply. You shall have your Amelia, or my name is not Redmond Berry. My lord Charlemont, who was one of the most elegant and accomplished noblemen in Ireland in those days, a fine scholar and wit, a gentleman who had travelled much abroad, where I had the honour of knowing him, gave a magnificent masquerade at his house of Marino, some few miles from Dublin, on the Dunleary Road. And it was at this entertainment that I was determined that Ulick should be made happy for life. Miss Kiljoy was invited to the masquerade, and the little Lord Bullingdon, who longed to witness such a scene and it was agreed that he was to go under the guardianship of his governor, my old friend, the Reverend Mr. Runt. I learned what was the equipage in which the party were to be conveyed to the ball, and took my measures accordingly. Ulick Brady was not present. His fortune and quality were not sufficient to procure him an invitation to so distinguished a place, and I had it given out three days previous that he had been arrested for a debt, a rumor which surprised nobody who knew him. I appeared that night in a character with which I was very familiar, that of a private soldier in the King of Prussia's guard. I had a grotesque mask made, with an immense nose and moustaches, talked a jumble of broken English and German, in which the latter greatly predominated, and had crowds round me laughing at my droll accent and whose curiosity was increased by a knowledge of my previous history. Miss Kiljoy was attired as an antique princess, with little Bullingdon as a page of the times of chivalry. His hair was in powder, his doublet rose-color, and pea-green and silver, and he looked very handsome and saucy as he strutted about with my sword by his side. As for Mr. Runt, he walked about very demurely in a domino, and perpetually paid his respects to the buffet, and ate enough cold chicken and drank enough punch and champagne to satisfy a company of grenadiers. The Lord Lieutenant came and went in state. The ball was magnificent. Miss Kiljoy had partners in plenty, among whom was myself, who walked a minuet with her, if the clumsy waddling of the Irish heiress may be called by such a name and I took occasion to plead my passion for Lady Linden in the most pathetic terms, and to beg her friend's interference in my favour. It was three hours past midnight when the party for Linden House went away. Little Bullingdon had long since been asleep in one of Lady Charlemont's china closets. Mr. Runt was exceedingly husky in talk, and unsteady in gait. A young lady of the present day would be alarmed to see a gentleman in such a condition, but it was a common sight in those jolly old times, when a gentleman was thought a milksop, unless he was occasionally tipsy. I saw Miss Kiljoy to her carriage, with several other gentlemen, and, peering through the crowd of ragged link boys, drivers, beggars, drunken men and women, who used invariably to wait round great men's doors when festivities were going on, saw the carriage drive off with a hurrah from the mob. Then came back presently to the supper-room, where I talked German, favoured the three or four topers still there with a high Dutch chorus, and attacked the dishes and wine with great resolution. "'How can you drink Ainsy with that big nose on?' said one gentleman. "'Go and be hanged,' said I, in the true accent." applying myself again to the wine, with which the others laughed, and I pursued my supper in silence. There was a gentleman present who had seen the Linden party go off, with whom I had made a bet, which I lost, and the next morning I called upon him and paid at him. All which particulars the reader will be surprised at hearing enumerated, but the fact is that it was not I who went back to the party, but my late German valet, who was of my size, and, dressed in my mask, could perfectly pass for me. We changed clothes in a hackney-coach that stood near Lady Linden's chariot, 
and driving after it, speedily overtook it. The fated vehicle which bore the lovely object of Ulick Brady's affections had not advanced very far, when, in the midst of a deep rut in the road, it came suddenly to with a jolt. The footman, springing off the back, cried, Stop! to the coachman, warning him that a wheel was off and that it would be dangerous to proceed with only three. Wheel caps had not been invented in those days, as they have since been by the ingenious builders of Longacre. And how the linchpin of the wheel had come out I do not pretend to say. But it possibly may have been extracted by some rogues among the crowd before Lord Charlemont's gate. Miss Kiljoy thrust her head out of the window, screaming as ladies do. Mr. Runt, the chaplain, woke up from his boozy slumbers, and little Bullingdon, staring up and drawing his little sword, said, Don't be afraid, Miss Amelia. If it's footpads, I am armed. The young rascal had the spirit of a lion. That's the truth, as I must acknowledge in spite of all my after quarrels with him. The hackney coach which had been following Lady Lyndon's chariot by this time came up, and the coachman, seeing the disaster, stepped down from the box and politely requested her ladyship's honour to enter his vehicle, which was as clean and elegant as any person of tip-top quality might desire. The invitation was, after a minute or two, accepted by the passengers of the chariot, the hackney coachman promising to drive them to Dublin in a hurry. Thady, the valet, proposed to accompany his young master and the young lady, and the coachman, who had a friend seemingly drunk by his side on the box, with a grin told Thady to get up behind. However, as the footboard there was covered with spikes, as a defense against the street boys, who love a ride gratis, Thady's fidelity would not induce him to brave these, and he was persuaded to remain by the wounded chariot, for which he and the coachman manufactured a linchpin out of a neighboring hedge. Meanwhile, although the hackney coachman drove on rapidly, yet the party within seemed to consider it was a long distance from Dublin. And what was Miss Kiljoy's astonishment, on looking out of the window at length, to see around her a lonely heath with no signs of buildings or city. She began forthwith to scream out to the coachman to stop, but the man only whipped the horses the faster for her noise, and bade her ladyship, Hold on, t'was a short cut he was taking. Miss Kiljoy continued screaming, the coachman flogging, the horses galloping, until two or three men appeared suddenly from a hedge, to whom the fair one cried for assistance, and the young Bullingdon, opening the coach door, jumped valiantly out, toppling over head and heels as he fell. But, jumping up in an instant, he drew his little sword, and, running towards the carriage, exclaimed, This way, gentlemen, stop the rascal! Stop! cried the men, at which the coachman pulled up with extraordinary obedience. Runt, all the while, lay tipsy in the carriage, having only a dreamy half-consciousness of all that was going on. The newly arrived champions of female distress now held a consultation, in which they looked at the young lord and laughed considerably. "'Do not be alarmed,' said the leader, coming up to the door. "'One of my people shall mount the box by the side of that treacherous rascal, and, with your ladyship's leave, I and my companions will get in and see you home. We are well armed, and can defend you in case of danger. With this, and without more ado, he jumped into the carriage, his companion following him. "'Know your place, fellow!' cried out little Bullingdon indignantly, "'and give place to the Lord Viscount Bullingdon!' and put himself before the huge person of the newcomer, who was about to enter the hackney coach. "'Get out of that, my lord,' said the man, in a broad brogue and shoving him aside, on which the boy, crying, "'Thieves! Thieves!' drew out his little hanger, and ran at the man, as would have wounded him, for a small sword will wound as well as a great one. But his opponent, who was armed with a long stick, struck the weapon luckily out of the lad's hands. 
it went flying over his head and left him aghast and mortified at his discomfiture. He then pulled off his hat, making his lordship a low bow, and entered the carriage, the door of which was shut upon him by his confederate who was to mount the box. Miss Kiljoy might have screamed, but I presume her shrieks were stopped by the sight of an enormous horse-pistol which one of her champions produced, and who said, "'No harm is intended you, ma'am, but if you cry out we must gag you,' on which she suddenly became as mute as a fish. All these events took place in an exceedingly short space of time, and when the three invaders had taken possession of the carriage, the poor little Bullingdon being left bewildered and astonished on the heath, one of them, putting his head out of the window, said, "'My lord, a word with you.' "'What is it?' said the boy, beginning to whimper. He was but eleven years old, and his courage had been excellent hitherto. "'You are only two miles from Marino. Walk back till you come to a big stone. There turn to the right, and keep on straight till you get to the high road, when you will easily find your way back. And when you see her ladyship your mamma, give Captain Thunder's compliments, and say Miss Amelia Kiljoy is going to be married.' "'Oh, heavens!' sighed out that young lady. The carriage drove swiftly on, and the poor little nobleman was left alone on the heath, just as the morning was beginning to break. He was fairly frightened, and no wonder. He thought of running after the coach, but his courage and his little legs failed him, so he sat down upon a stone and cried for vexation. It was in this way that Ulick Brady made what I call a Sabine marriage. When he halted with his two groomsmen at the cottage where the ceremony was to be performed, Mr. Runt, the chaplain, at first declined to perform it. But a pistol was held at the head of that unfortunate preceptor, and he was told with dreadful oaths that his miserable brains would be blown out when he consented to read the service. The lovely Amelia had, very likely, a similar inducement held out to her, but of that I know nothing, for I drove back to town with the coachman as soon as we had set the bridal party down, and had the satisfaction of finding Fritz, my German, arrived before me. He had come back in my carriage in my dress, having left the masquerade undiscovered, and done everything there according to my orders. Poor Runt came back the next day in a piteous plight, keeping silence as to his share in the occurrences of the evening and with a dismal story of having been drunk, of having been waylaid and bound, of having been left on the road and picked up by a Wicklow cart, which was coming in with provisions to Dublin, and found him helpless on the road. There was no possible means of fixing any share of the conspiracy upon him. Little Bullingdon, who, too, found his way home, was unable in any way to identify me. But Lady Linden knew that I was concerned in the plot, for I met her hurrying the next day to the castle, all the town being up about the enlèvement. And I saluted her with a smile so diabolical that I knew she was aware that I had been concerned in the daring and ingenious scheme. Thus it was that I repaid Ulick Brady's kindness to me in early days, and had the satisfaction of restoring the fallen fortunes of a deserving branch of my family. He took his bride into Wicklow, where he lived with her in the strictest seclusion until the affair was blown over, the Kiljoys striving everywhere in vain to discover his retreat. They did not for a while even know who was the lucky man who had carried off the heiress, nor was it until she wrote a letter some week afterwards, signed Amelia Brady, and expressing perfect happiness in her new condition, and stating that she had been married by Lady Linden's chaplain, Mr. Runt, that the truth was known, and my worthy friend confessed his share of the transaction. As his good-natured mistress did not dismiss him from his post in consequence, everybody persisted in supposing that poor Lady Linden was privy to the plot, and the story of her ladyship's passionate attachment for me gained more and more credit. 
I was not slow, you may be sure, in profiting by these rumors. Everyone thought I had a share in the Brady marriage, though no one could prove it. Everyone thought I was well with the widowed countess, though no one could show that I said so. But there is a way of proving a thing even while you contradict it. And I used to laugh and joke so apropos that all men began to wish me joy of my great fortune and look up to me as the affianced husband of the greatest heiress in the kingdom. The papers took up the matter. The female friends of Lady Linden remonstrated with her and cried, Fie! Even the English journals and magazines, which in those days were very scandalous, talked of the matter, and whispered that a beautiful and accomplished widow, with a title and the largest possessions in the two kingdoms, was about to bestow her hand upon a young gentleman of high birth and fashion, who had distinguished himself in the service of his M blank 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 Y the K blank of Pr blank. I won't say who was the author of these paragraphs, or how two pictures, one representing myself under the title of the Prussian Irishman, and the other Lady Linden as the Countess of Ephesus, actually appeared in the Town and Country magazine, published at London and containing the fashionable tittle-tattle of the day. Lady Linden was so perplexed and terrified by this continual hold upon her, that she determined to leave the country. Well, she did. And who was the first to receive her on landing at Hollyhead? Your humble servant, Redmond Berry, Esquire. And to crown all, the Dublin Mercury, which announced her ladyship's departure, announced mine the day before. There was not a soul but thought she had followed me to England, whereas she was only flying me. Vain hope! A man of my resolution was not thus to be balked in pursuit. Had she fled to the Antipodes, I would have been there. I and would have followed her as far as Orpheus did Eurydice. Her ladyship had a house in Berkeley Square, London, more splendid than that which she possessed in Dublin, and, knowing that she would come thither, I preceded her to the English capital, and took handsome apartments in Hill Street, hard by. I had the same intelligence in her London house which I had procured in Dublin. The same faithful porter was there to give me all the information I required. I promised to treble his wages as soon as a certain event should happen. I won over Lady Linden's companion by a present of a hundred guineas down, and a promise of two thousand when I should be married, and gained the favors of her favorite lady's maid by a bribe of similar magnitude. My reputation had so far preceded me in London that, on my arrival, numbers of the genteel were eager to receive me at their routes. We have no idea in this humdrum age what a gay and splendid place London was then. What a passion for play there was among young and old, male and female. What thousands were lost and won in a night. What beauties there were. How brilliant, gay, and dashing. Everybody was delightfully wicked. The royal dukes of Gloucester and Cumberland set the example, and nobles followed close behind. Running away was the fashion. Ah, it was a pleasant time, and lucky was he who had fire and youth and money and could live in it. I had all these, and the old frequenters of whites, watiers, and goose-trees could tell stories of the gallantry, spirit, and high fashion of Captain Barry. The progress of a love story is tedious to all those who are not concerned, and I leave such themes to the hack novel-writers and the young boarding-school misses for whom they write. It is not my intention to follow, step by step, the incidents of my courtship, or to narrate all the difficulties I had to contend with, and my triumphant manner of surmounting them. Suffice it to say, I did overcome these difficulties. I am of the opinion, with my friend the late ingenious Mr. Wilkes, that such impediments are nothing in the way of a man of spirit, 
and that he can convert indifference and aversion into love, if he have perseverance and cleverness sufficient. By the time the countess's widowhood was expired, I had found means to be received into her house. I had her women perpetually talking in my favor, vaunting my powers, expatiating upon my reputation, and boasting of my success and popularity in the fashionable world. Also, the best friends I had in the prosecution of my tender suit were the countess's noble relatives, who were far from knowing the service that they did me, and to whom I beg leave to tender my heartfelt thanks for the abuse which they then loaded me, and to whom I fling my utter contempt for the calumny and hatred with which they have subsequently pursued me. The chief of these amiable persons was the Marchioness of Tiptoff, mother of the young gentleman whose audacity I had punished at Dublin. This old harridan, on the Countess's first arrival in London, waited upon her, and favored her with such a storm of abuse for her encouragement of me, that I do believe she advanced my cause more than six months' courtship could have done or the pinking of a half-dozen of rivals. It was in vain that poor Lady Linden pleaded her entire innocence, and vowed she had never encouraged me. Never encouraged him, screamed out the old fury. Didn't you encourage the wretch at Spa, during Sir Charles's own life? Didn't you marry a dependent of yours to one of this profligate's bankrupt cousins? When he set off for England, didn't you follow him like a madwoman the very next day? Didn't he take lodgings at your very door, almost? And do you call this no encouragement? For shame, madam, shame! You might have married my son, my dear and noble George, but that he did not choose to interfere with your shameful passion for the beggarly upstart whom you caused to assassinate him. And the only counsel I have to give your ladyship is this to legitimize the ties which you have contracted with this shameless adventurer, to make that connection legal which, real as it is now, is against both decency and religion, and to spare your family and your son the shame of your present line of life. With this, the old fury of a marchioness left the room, and Lady Linden in tears. I had the whole particulars of the conversation from her ladyship's companion, and augured the best result from it in my favor. Thus, by the sage influence of my Lady Tiptoff, the Countess of Linden's natural friends and family were kept from her society. Even when Lady Linden went to court, the most august lady in the realm received her with such marked coldness that the unfortunate widow came home and took to her bed with vexation. And thus I may say, that royalty itself became an agent in advancing my suit, and helping the plans of the poor Irish soldier of fortune. So is it that fate works with agents, great and small, and by means over which they have no control, the destinies of men and women are accomplished. I shall always consider the conduct of Mrs. Bridget, Lady Linden's favorite maid at this juncture, as a masterpiece of ingenuity, and indeed had such an opinion of her diplomatic skill that the very instant I became master of the Linden estates and paid her the promised sum, I am a man of honor, and rather than not keep my word with the woman, I raised the money of the Jews at an exorbitant interest. As soon, I say, as I achieved my triumph, I took Mrs. Bridget by the hand and said, Madam, you have shown such unexampled fidelity in my service that I am glad to reward you, according to my promise. But you have given proofs of such extraordinary cleverness and dissimulation that I must decline keeping you in Lady Linden's establishment, and beg you will leave it this very day. Which she did, and went over to the Tiptoff faction, and has abused me ever since. But I must tell you, what she did which was so clever. Why, it was the simplest thing in the world, as all master strokes are. 
when lady linden lamented her fate and my as she was pleased to call it shameful treatment of her mrs bridget said why should not your ladyship write this young gentleman word of the evil which he is causing you appeal to his feelings which i have heard say are very good indeed the whole town is ringing with accounts of his spirit and generosity and beg him to desist from a pursuit which causes the best of ladies so much pain do do my lady write i know your style is so elegant that i for my part have many a time burst into tears in reading your charming letters and i have no doubt mr barry will sacrifice anything rather than hurt your feelings and of course the abigail swore to the fact do you think so bridget said her ladyship and my mistress forthwith penned me a letter in her most fascinating and winning manner why sir wrote she will you pursue me why environ me in a web of intrigue so frightful that my spirit sinks under it seeing escape is hopeless from your frightful your diabolical art they say you are generous to others be so to me i know your bravery but too well exercise it on men who can meet your sword not on a poor feeble woman who cannot resist you remember the friendship you once professed for me and now i beseech you i implore you to give a proof of it contradict the calumnies which you have spread against me and repair if you can and if you have a spark of honour left the miseries which you have caused to the heart-broken h linden what was this letter meant for but that i should answer it in person my excellent ally told me where i should meet lady linden and accordingly i followed and found her at the pantheon i repeated the scene at dublin over again showed her how prodigious my power was humble as i was and that my energy was still untired but i added i am as great in good as i am in evil as fond and faithful as a friend as i am terrible as an enemy i will do everything i said which you ask of me except when you bid me not to love you that is beyond my power and while my heart has a pulse i must follow you it is my fate your fate cease to battle against it and be mine loveliest of your sex with life alone can end my passion for you and indeed it is only by dying at your command that i can be brought to obey you do you wish me to die she said laughing for she was a woman of a lively humorous turn that she did not wish me to commit self-murder and i felt from that moment that she was mine a year from that day on the fifteenth of may in the year seventeen seventy three i had the honour and happiness to lead to the altar honoria countess of linden widow of the late right honourable sir charles linden k b the ceremony was performed at st george's hanover square by the rev samuel runt her ladyship's chaplain a magnificent supper and ball was given at our house in berkeley square and the next morning i had a duke four earls three generals and a crowd of the most distinguished people in london at my levee walpole made a lampoon about the marriage and selwyn cut jokes at the cocoa tree old lady tiptoff although she had recommended it was ready to bite off her fingers with vexation and as for young bullingdon who was grown a tall lad of fourteen when called upon by the countess to embrace his papa he shook his fist in my face and said he my father i would as soon call one of your ladyship's footmen papa but i could afford to laugh at the rage of the boy and the old woman and at the jokes of the wits of st james's i sent off a flaming account of our nuptials to my mother and my uncle the good chevalier and now 
arrived at the pitch of prosperity, and having, at thirty years of age, by my own merits and energy, raised myself to one of the highest social positions that any man in England could occupy, I determined to enjoy myself as became a man of quality for the remainder of my life. After we had received the congratulations of our friends in London, for in those days people were not ashamed of being married as they seem to be now, I and Honoria, who was all complacency and a most handsome, sprightly, and agreeable companion, set off to visit our estates in the west of England, where I had never as yet set foot. We left London in three chariots, each with four horses, and my uncle would have been pleased could he have seen painted on their panels the Irish crown and the ancient coat of the berries beside the countess's coronet and the noble cognizance of the noble family of Linden. Before quitting London, I procured His Majesty's gracious permission to add the name of my lovely lady to my own, and henceforward assumed the style and title of Barry Linden, as I have written it in this autobiography. End of chapter 16Chapter 17 of The Memoirs of Barry Lyndon, Esquire, by William Makepeace Thackeray. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 17 I Appear as an Ornament of English Society All the journey down to Hackton Castle, the largest and most ancient of our ancestral seats in Devonshire, was performed with the slow and sober state becoming people of the first quality in the realm. An outrider in my livery went on before us, and bespoke our lodging from town to town, and thus we lay in state at Andover, Ilminster, and Exeter, and the fourth evening arrived in time for supper before the antique baronial mansion, of which the gate was in an odious gothic taste that would have set Mr. Walpole wild with pleasure. The first days of a marriage are commonly very trying, and I have known couples who live together like turtle doves for the rest of their lives peck each other's eyes out almost during the honeymoon. I did not escape the common lot. In our journey westward my Lady Linden chose to quarrel with me because I pulled out a pipe of tobacco, the habit of smoking which I had acquired in Germany when a soldier in Bulos, and could never give it over and smoked it in the carriage. And also her ladyship chose to take umbrage both at Ilminster and Andover, because in the evenings when we lay there, I chose to invite the landlords of the Bell and the Lion to crack a bottle with me. Lady Linden was a haughty woman, and I hate pride, and I promise you that in both instances I overcame this vice in her on the third day of our journey I had her to light my pipe match with her own hands, and made her deliver it to me with tears in her eyes. And at the Swan Inn at Exeter I had so completely subdued her that she asked me humbly whether I would not wish the landlady as well as the host to step up to dinner with us. To this I should have had no objection, for indeed Mrs. Boniface was a very good-looking woman but we expected a visit from my lord bishop, a kinsman of Lady Linden, and the bienseance did not permit the indulgence of my wife's request. I appeared with her at evening service, to compliment our right reverend cousin, and put her name down for twenty-five guineas, and my own for one hundred, to the famous new organ which was then being built for the cathedral. This conduct, at the very outset of my career in the county, made me not a little popular, and the residentiary canon, who did me the favor to sup with me at the inn, went away after the sixth bottle, hiccuping the most solemn vows for the welfare of such a p -p -p pious gentleman. Before we reached Hackton Castle, we had to drive through ten miles of the Linden Estates, where the people were out to visit us, and the church bells set a-ringing the parson and the farmers assembled in their best by the roadside, 
and the school-children and the laboring people were loud in their hurrahs for her ladyship. I flung money among these worthy characters, stopped to bow and chat with his reverence and the farmers, and if I found that the Devonshire girls were among the handsomest in the kingdom, is it my fault? These remarks my Lady Linden especially would take in great dudgeon, and I do believe she was made more angry by my admiration of the red cheeks of Miss Betsy Corrington of Clumpton than by any previous speech or act of mine in the journey. Ah, ah, my fine madam, you're jealous, are you? thought I, and reflected, not without deep sorrow, how lightly she had acted in her husband's lifetime, and that those are most jealous who themselves give most cause for jealousy. Round Hackton Village the scene of welcome was particularly gay. A band of music had been brought from Plymouth, and arches and flags had been raised, especially before the attorneys and the doctors' houses, who were both in the employ of the family. There were many hundreds of stout people at the great lodge, which, with the park wall, bounds one side of Hackton Green, and from which, for three miles, goes, or rather went, an avenue of noble elms up to the towers of the old castle. I wished they had been oak when I cut the trees down in seventy-nine, for they would have fetched three times the money. I know nothing more culpable than the carelessness of ancestors in planting their grounds with timber of small value, when they might just as easily raise oak. Thus I have always said that the round-head linden of Hackton who planted these elms in Charles the Second's time, cheated me of ten thousand pounds. For the first few days after our arrival, my time was agreeably spent in receiving the visits of the nobility and gentry who came to pay their respects to the noble new married couple, and, like Bluebeard's wife in the fairy tale, in inspecting the treasures, the furniture, and the numerous chambers of the castle. It is a huge old place, built as far back as Henry V's time, besieged and battered by the Cromwellians in the Revolution, and altered and patched up in an odious, old-fashioned taste by the round-head Linden, who succeeded to the property at the death of a brother whose principles were excellent and of the true cavalier sort, but who ruined himself chiefly by drinking, dicing, and a dissolute life, and a little by supporting the king. The castle stands in a fine chase, which was prettily speckled over with deer, and I can't but own that my pleasure was considerable at first, as I sat in the oak parlour of summer evenings, with the windows open, the gold and silver plate shining in a hundred dazzling colours on the sideboards, a dozen jolly companions round the table, and could look out over the wide green park and the waving woods, and see the sun setting on the lake, and hear the deer calling to one another. The exterior was, when I first arrived, a quaint composition of all sorts of architecture, of feudal towers and gable ends in Queen Bess's style, and rough patched walls built up to repair the ravages of the round-head cannon. But I need not speak of this at large, having had the place new-faced at a vast expense, under a fashionable architect, and the façade laid out in the latest French-Greek and most classical style. There had been moats and drawbridges and outer walls. These I had shaved away into elegant terraces and handsomely laid out in parterres according to the plans of Monsieur Cornichon, the great Parisian architect, who visited England for the purpose. After ascending the outer steps, you entered an antique hall of vast dimensions, wainscoted with black carved oak, and ornamented with portraits of our ancestors. From the square beard of Brook Linden, the great lawyer in Queen Bess's time, to the loose stomacher and ringlets of Lady Saccharissa Linden, whom Van Dyck painted when she was a maid of honour to Queen Henrietta Maria, and down to Sir Charles Linden, with his ribbon as Knight of the Bath and my lady, painted by Hudson, in a white satin sack and the family diamonds, as she was presented to the old King George the Second. These diamonds were very fine. 
I first had them reset by Bomer when we appeared before their French majesties at Versailles, and finally raised eighteen thousand pounds upon them, after that infernal run of ill luck at goose trees when Jemmy Twitcher, as we called my lord Sandwich, Carlyle, Charlie Fox, and I played ombre for four and forty hours sang de saint pare Bows and pikes, huge stag heads and hunting implements, and rusty old suits of armor, that may have been worn in the days of Gog and Magog, for what I know, formed the other old ornaments of this huge apartment, and were ranged round a fireplace where you might have turned a coach and six. This I kept pretty much in its antique condition, but had the armor eventually turned out and consigned to the lumber room upstairs, replacing it with china monsters, gilded settees from France, and elegant marbles of which the broken noses and limbs and ugliness undeniably proved their antiquity, and which an agent purchased for me at Rome. But such was the taste of the times, and, perhaps, the rascality of my agent, that thirty thousand pounds worth of these gems of art only went for three hundred guineas at a subsequent period, when I found it necessary to raise money on my collections. From this main hall branched off on either side the long series of state rooms, poorly furnished with high-backed chairs and long queer Venice glasses, when first I came to the property but afterwards rendered so splendid by me, with the gold damasks of Lyon and the magnificent Gobelin tapestries I won from Richelieu at play. There were thirty-six bedrooms de maître, of which I only kept three in their antique condition, the haunted room, as it was called, where the murder was done in James the Second's time, the bed where William slept after landing at Torbay, and Queen Elizabeth's stateroom. All the rest were redecorated by Cornichon in the most elegant taste, not a little to the scandal of some of the steady old country dowagers, for I had pictures of Boucher and Van Lu to decorate the principal apartments, in which the Cupids and Venuses were painted in a manner so natural that I recollect the old wizened Countess of Frumpington painting over the curtains of her bed and sending her daughter Lady Blanche Whalebone, to sleep with her waiting-woman rather than allow her to lie in a chamber hung all over with looking-glasses, after the exact fashion of the Queen's closet at Versailles. For many of these ornaments I was not so much answerable as Cornichon, whom Laura Gay lent me, and who was the intendant of my buildings during my absence abroad. I had given the man carte blanche, and when he fell down and broke his leg, as he was decorating a theatre in the room which had been the old chapel of the castle, the people of the country thought it was a judgment of heaven upon him. In his rage for improvement the fellow dared anything. Without my orders he cut down an old rookery which was sacred in the county, and had a prophecy regarding it, stating, When the rookwood shall fall, down goes Hackton Hall. The rooks went over and colonized tip-toff woods, which lay near us, and be hanged to them. And Cornichon built a temple to Venus and two lovely fountains on their site. Venuses and Cupids were the rascal's adoration. He wanted to take down the Gothic screen and place Cupids in our pew there, but old Dr. Huff, the rector, came out with a large oak stick and addressed the unlucky architect in Latin of which he did not comprehend a word, yet made him understand that he would break his bones if he laid a single finger upon the sacred edifice. Cornichon made complaints about the Abbé Oeuf, as he called him. A quel abbé, grand Dieu, added he, quite bewildered. Un abbé avec deux enfants. But I encouraged the church in this respect, and bade Cornichon exert his talents only in the castle. There was a magnificent collection of ancient plate, to which I added much of the most splendid modern kind. A cellar, which, however well furnished, required continual replenishing, and a kitchen, which I reformed altogether. My friend Jack Wilkes sent me down a cook from the mansion-house for the English cookery, 
the turtle and venison department. I had a chef, who called out the Englishman, by the way, and complained sadly of the gros cochon, who wanted to meet him with coup de poing, and a couple of aides from Paris, and an Italian confectioner as my officier de bouche. All which general appendages to a man of fashion, the odious stingy old Tiptoff, my kinsman and neighbor, affected to view with horror, and he spread through the country a report that I had my victuals cooked by papists, lived upon frogs, and, he verily believed, fricasseed little children. But the squires ate my dinners very readily for all that, and old Dr. Huff himself was compelled to allow that my venison and turtle were most orthodox. The former gentry I knew how to conciliate, too, in other ways. There had been only a subscription pack of foxhounds in the country, and a few beggarly couples of mangy beagles, with which old Tiptoff pattered about his grounds. I built a kennel and stables which cost thirty thousand pounds, and stocked them in a manner which was worthy of my ancestors, the Irish kings. I had two packs of hounds, and took the field in the season four times a week, with three gentlemen in my hunt uniform to follow me, and open house at Hackton for all who belonged to the hunt. These changes and this train de vivre required, as may be supposed, no small outlay, and I confess that I have little of that base spirit of economy in my composition which some people practice and admire. For instance, old Tiptoff was hoarding up his money to repair his father's extravagance and disencumber his estates. A good deal of the money with which he paid off his mortgages, my agent procured upon mine. And besides, it must be remembered, I had only a life interest upon the Linden property, was always of an easy temper in dealing with the money brokers, and had to pay heavily for insuring her ladyship's life. At the end of the year, Lady Linden presented me with a son. Brian Linden, I called him, in compliment to my royal ancestry. But what more had I to leave him than a noble name? Was not the estate of his mother entailed upon the odious little Turk Lord Bullingdon? And whom, by the way, I have not mentioned as yet, though he was living at Hackton, consigned to a new governor. The insubordination of that boy was dreadful. He used to quote passages of Hamlet to his mother, which made her very angry. Once, when I took a horsewhip to chastise him, he drew a knife and would have stabbed me. And faith, I recollected my own youth, which was pretty similar, and, holding out my hand, burst out laughing and proposed to him to be friends. We were reconciled for that time, and the next, and the next, but there was no love lost between us, and his hatred for me seemed to grow as he grew, which was apace. I determined to endow my darling boy Brian with a property and to this end cut down twelve thousand pounds worth of timber on Lady Linden's Yorkshire and Irish estates, at which proceeding Bullingdon's guardian, Tiptoff, cried out as usual, and swore I had no right to touch a stick of the trees. But down they went, and I commissioned my mother to repurchase the ancient lands of Ballyberry and Berryog, which had once formed a part of the immense possessions of my house. These she bought back with excellent prudence and extreme joy, for her heart was gladdened at the idea that a son was born to my name, and with the notion of my magnificent fortunes. To say truth, I was rather afraid now that I lived in a very different sphere from that in which she was accustomed to move, lest she should come to pay me a visit and astonish my English friends by her bragging and her brogue, her rouge and her old hoops and furbelows of the time of George the Second, in which she had figured advantageously in her youth, and which she still fondly thought would be at the height of the fashion. So I wrote to her, putting off her visit, begging her to visit us when the left wing of the castle was finished, or the stables built, and so forth. There was no need of such precaution. A hint's enough for me, Redmond, the old lady would reply. 
i am not coming to disturb you among your great english friends with my old-fashioned irish ways it's a blessing to me to think that my darling boy has attained the position which i always knew was his due and for which i pinched myself to educate him you must bring me the little brian that his grandmother may kiss him one day present my respectful blessing to her ladyship his mamma tell her she has got a treasure in her husband which she couldn't have had had she taken a duke to marry her and that the berries and the bradys though without titles have the best of blood in their veins i shall never rest until i see you earl of ballyberry and my grandson lord viscount berry Og. the very title she had pitched upon had also been selected naturally enough by me and i don't mind confessing that i had filled a dozen sheets of paper with my signature under the names of ballyberry and berry Og, and had determined with my usual impetuosity to carry my point my mother went and established herself at ballyberry living with the priest there until a tenement could be erected and dating from ballyberry castle which you may be sure i gave out to be a place of no small importance i had a plan of the estate in my study both at hackton and in berkeley square and the plans of the elevation of ballyberry castle the ancestral residence of berry linden esq with the projected improvements in which the castle was represented as about the size of windsor with more ornaments to the architecture and eight hundred acres of bog falling in handy i purchased them at three pounds an acre so that my estate upon the map looked to be no insignificant one footnote on the strength of this estate and pledging his honour that it was not mortgaged mr barry linden borrowed seventeen thousand pounds in the year seventeen eighty six from young captain pigeon the city merchant's son who had just come in for his property as for the polwellen estate and mines the cause of endless litigation it must be owned that our hero purchased them but he never paid more than the first five thousand of the purchase money hence the litigation of which he complains and the famous chancery suit of trecothic v linden in which mr john scott greatly distinguished himself editor and footnote i also in this year made arrangements for purchasing the polwellen estate and mines in cornwall from sir john trecothick for seventy thousand pounds an imprudent bargain which was afterwards the cause to me of much dispute and litigation the troubles of property the rascality of agents the quibbles of lawyers are endless humble people envy us great men and fancy that our lives are all pleasure many a time in the course of my prosperity i have sighed for the days of my meanest fortune and envied the boon companions at my table with no clothes to their backs but such as my credit supplied them without a guinea but what came from my pocket but without one of the harassing cares and responsibilities which are the dismal adjuncts of great rank and property i did little more than make my appearance and assume the command of my estates in the kingdom of ireland rewarding generously those persons who had been kind to me in my former adversities and taking my fitting place among the aristocracy of the land but in truth i had small inducements to remain in it after having tasted of the genteeler and more complete pleasures of english and continental life and we passed our summers at buxton bath and harrogate while hackton castle was being beautified in the elegant manner already described by me and the season at our mansion in berkeley square it is wonderful how the possession of wealth brings out the virtues of a man or at any rate acts as a varnish or lustre to them and brings out their brilliancy and colour in a manner never known when the individual stood in the cold grey atmosphere of poverty i assure you it was a very short time before i was a pretty fellow of the first class made no small sensation at the coffee-houses in pall mall and afterwards at the most famous clubs my style equipages and elegant entertainments were in everybody's mouth and were described in all the morning prints the needier part of lady linden's relatives and such as been offended by the intolerable pomposity of old tiptoff 
began to appear at our routs and assemblies, and as for relations of my own, I found in London and Ireland more than I had ever dreamed of, of cousins who claimed affinity with me. There were, of course, natives of my own country, of which I was not particularly proud, and I received visits from three or four swaggering shabby temple bucks, with tarnished lace and tipperary brogue, who were eating their way to the bar in London, from several gambling adventurers at the watering places, whom I speedily let to know their place, and from others of a more reputable condition. Among them I may mention my cousin the Lord Kilberry, who, on the score of his relationship, borrowed thirty pieces from me to pay his landlady in Swallow Street, and whom, for my own reasons, I allowed to maintain and credit a connection for which the Herald's College gave no authority whatsoever. Kilberry had a cover at my table, punted at play, and paid when he liked, which was seldom. Had an intimacy with, and was under considerable obligations to, my tailor, and always boasted of his cousin the great Barry Lyndon of the West Country. Her ladyship and I lived, after a while, pretty separate when in London. She preferred quiet, or to say the truth, I preferred it, being a great friend to a modest, tranquil behavior in woman, and a taste for the domestic pleasures. Hence I encouraged her to dine at home with her ladies, her chaplain, and a few of her friends, admitted three or four proper and discreet persons to accompany her to her box at the opera, or play on proper occasions, and indeed declined for her the two frequent visits of her friends and family, preferring to receive them only twice or thrice in a season on our grand reception days. Besides, she was a mother, and had great comfort in the dressing, educating and dandling our little Brian, for whose sake it was fit that she should give up the pleasures and frivolities of the world. So she left that part of the duty of every family of distinction to be performed by me. To say the truth, Lady Lyndon's figure and appearance were not at this time such as to make for their owner any very brilliant appearance in the fashionable world. She had grown very fat, was short-sighted, pale in complexion, careless about her dress, dull in demeanor. Her conversations with me, characterized by a stupid despair, or a silly, blundering attempt at forced cheerfulness still more disagreeable. Hence our intercourse was but trifling, and my temptations to carry her into the world, or to remain in her society, of necessity exceedingly small. She would try my temper at home, too, in a thousand ways. When requested by me, often I own rather roughly, to entertain the company with conversation, wit, and learning, of which she was a mistress, or music, of which she was an accomplished performer, she would, as often as not, begin to cry and leave the room. My company, from this, of course, fancied I was a tyrant over her, whereas I was only a severe and careful guardian over a silly, bad-tempered, weak-minded lady. She was luckily very fond of her youngest son, and through him I had a wholesome and effectual hold of her, for if in any of her tantrums or fits of haughtiness, for this woman was intolerably proud and repeatedly at first in our quarrels, dared to twit me with my own original poverty and low birth, if, I say, in our disputes she pretended to have the upper hand, to assert her authority against mine, to refuse to sign such papers as I might think necessary for the distribution of our large and complicated property, I would have Master Brian carried off to Chiswick for a couple of days, and I warrant me this lady mother could hold out no longer and would agree to anything. I chose to propose. The servants about her I took care should be in my pay, not hers. Especially the child's head nurse was under my orders, not those of my lady. And a very handsome, red-cheeked, impudent jade she was, and a great fool she made me make of myself. This woman was more mistress of the house than the poor-spirited lady who owned it. She gave the law to the servants, 
and if I showed any particular attention to any of the ladies who visited us, the slut would not scruple to show her jealousy, and to find means to send them packing. The fact is, a generous man is always made a fool of by some woman or other, and this one had such an influence over me that she could turn me round her finger. Footnote. From these curious confessions, it would appear that Mr. Linden maltreated his lady in every possible way, that he denied her society, bullied her into signing away property, spent it in gambling and taverns, and was openly unfaithful to her, and, when she complained, threatened to remove her children from her. Nor, indeed, is he the only husband who has done the like, and has passed for nobody's enemy but his own, a jovial, good-natured fellow. The world contains scores of such amiable people, and, indeed, it is because justice has not been done them that we have edited this autobiography. Had it been of that of a mere hero of romance, one of those heroic youths who figure in the novels of Scott and James, there would have been no call to introduce the reader to a personage already so often and so charmingly depicted. Mr. Barry Lyndon is not, we repeat, a hero of the common pattern. But let the reader look round and ask himself, do not as many rogues succeed in life as honest men, more fools than men of talent? And is it not just that the lives of this class should be described by the student of human nature, as well as the actions of those fairy-tale princes, those perfect impossible heroes, whom our writers love to describe? There is something naive and simple in that time-honored style of novel-writing by which Prince Prettyman, at the end of his adventures, is put in possession of every worldly prosperity, as he has been endowed with every mental and bodily excellence previously. The novelist thinks that he can do no more for his darling hero than make him a lord. Is it not a poor standard, that, of the summum bonum? The greatest good in life is not to be a lord, perhaps not even to be happy. Poverty, illness, a humpback, may be rewards and conditions of good, as well as that bodily prosperity which all of us unconsciously set up for worship. But this is a subject for an essay, not a note, and it is best to allow Mr. Linden to resume the candid and ingenious narrative of his virtues and defects. End footnote. Her infernal temper, Mrs. Stammer was the jade's name, and my wife's moody despondency, made my house and home not over-pleasant. Hence I was driven a good deal abroad, where, as play was the fashion at every club, tavern, and assembly, I, of course, was obliged to resume my old habit, and to commence as an amateur those games at which I was once unrivaled in Europe. But whether a man's temper changes with prosperity, or his skill leaves him when, deprived of a confederate, and pursuing the game no longer professionally, he joins in it, like the rest of the world, for pastime, I know not. But certain it is that in the seasons of 1774-75, I lost much money at White's and the Cocoa Tree, and was compelled to meet my losses by borrowing largely upon my wife's annuities, insuring her ladyship's life, and so forth. The terms at which I raised these necessary sums, and the outlays requisite for my improvements, were, of course, very onerous, and clipped the property considerably. And it was some of these papers which my Lady Linden, who was of a narrow, timid, and stingy turn, occasionally refused to sign, until I persuaded her as I have before shown. My dealings on the turf ought to be mentioned, as forming part of my history at this time, but in truth I have no particular pleasure in recalling my new market doings. I was infernally bit and bubbled in almost every one of my transactions there, and though I could ride a horse as well as any man in England, was no match with the English nobleman at backing him. 
Fifteen years after my horse, Bay Bulo, by Sophie Hardcastle out of Eclipse, lost the new market stakes for which he was the first favorite, I found that a noble earl, who shall be nameless, had got into his stable the morning before he ran. And the consequence was that an outside horse won, and your humble servant was out to the amount of fifteen thousand pounds. Strangers had no chance in those days, on the heath, and though dazzled by the splendor and fashion assembled there, and surrounded by the greatest persons of the land, the royal dukes with their wives and splendid equipages, old Grafton with his queer bevy of company, and such men as Ancaster, Sandwich, Lorne, a man might have considered himself certain of fair play, and have been not a little proud of the society he kept. Yet I promise you that, exalted as it was, there was no set of men in Europe who knew how to rob more genteely, to bubble a stranger, to bribe a jockey, to doctor a horse, or to arrange a betting book. Even I couldn't stand against these accomplished gamesters of the highest families in Europe. Was it my own want of style or my want of fortune? I know not. But now I was arrived at the height of my ambition, both my skill and my luck seemed to be deserting me. Everything I touched crumbled in my hand, every speculation I had failed, every agent I trusted deceived me. I am indeed one of those born to make, and not to keep, fortunes. For the qualities and energy which lead a man to affect the first are often the very causes of his ruin in the latter case. Indeed, I know of no other reason for the misfortunes which finally befell me. Footnote. The memoirs seem to have been written about the year 1814, in that calm retreat which fortune had selected for the author at the close of his life. End footnote. I had always a taste for men of letters, and perhaps, if the truth must be told, have no objection to playing the fine gentleman and patron among the wits. Such people are usually needy, and of low birth, and have an instinctive awe and love of a gentleman and laced coat, as all must have remarked who have frequented their society. Mr. Reynolds, who was afterwards knighted, and certainly the most elegant painter of his day, was a pretty dexterous courtier of the wit tribe, and it was through this gentleman, who painted a piece of me, Lady Linden, and our little Brian, which was greatly admired at the exhibition. I was represented as quitting my wife in the costume of the Tippleton Yeomanry, of which I was a major, the child starting back from my helmet like, what do you call him, Hector's son, as described by Mr. Pope in his Iliad. It was through Mr. Reynolds that I was introduced to a score of these gentlemen, and their great chief, Mr. Johnson. I always thought their great chief a great bear. He drank tea twice or thrice at my house, misbehaving himself most grossly, treating my opinions with no more respect than those of a schoolboy, and telling me to mind my horses and tailors, and not trouble myself about letters. His Scotch bear leader, Mr. Boswell, was a butt of the first quality. I never saw such a figure as the fellow cut in what he called a Corsican habit at one of Mrs. Cornelli's balls at Carlisle House, Soho. But that the stories connected with that same establishment are not the most profitable tales in the world, I could tell tales of scores of queer doings there. All the high and low demi-reps of the town gathered there, from His Grace of Ancaster down to my countryman, poor Mr. Oliver Goldsmith, the poet, and from the Duchess of Kingston down to the bird of paradise, or Kitty Fisher. Here I have met very queer characters, who came to queer ends, too. Poor Hackman, that afterwards was hanged for killing Miss Rie, and, on the sly, his reverence Dr. Simony, whom my friend Sam Foote, of the little theatre, bad to live even after forgery and the rope cut short the unlucky parson's career. It was a merry place, London, in those days, and that's the truth. I'm writing now in my gouty old age, and people have grown vastly more 
moral and matter-of-fact than they were at the close of the last century, when the world was young with me. There was a difference between a gentleman and a common fellow in those times. We wore silk and embroidery then. Now every man has the same coachman-like look in his belcher and caped coat, and there's no outward difference between my lord and his groom. Then it took a man of fashion a couple of hours to make his toilette, and he could show some taste and genius in the selecting it. What a blaze of splendor was a drawing-room or an opera or a gala night! What sums of money were lost and won at the delicious faro-table! My gilt curricle and outriders blazing in green and gold were very different objects from the equipages you see nowadays in the ring, with the stunted grooms behind them. A man could drink four times as much as the milksops nowadays can swallow. But tis useless expatiating on this theme. Gentlemen are dead and gone. The fashion is now turned upon your soldiers and sailors, and I grow quite moody and sad when I think of thirty years ago. This is a chapter devoted to reminiscences of what was a very happy and splendid time with me, but presenting little of mark in the way of adventure, as is generally the case when times are happy and easy. It would seem idle to fill pages with accounts of the everyday occupations of a man of fashion. The fair ladies who smiled upon him, the dresses he wore, the matches he played and won or lost. At this period of time, when youngsters are employed cutting the Frenchmen's throats in Spain and France, lying out in bivouacs and feeding off commissariat beef and biscuit, they would not understand what a life their ancestors led and so I shall leave further discourse upon the pleasure of the times when even the prince was a lad in leading strings, when Charles Fox had not subsided into a mere statesman, and Bonaparte was a beggarly brat in his native island. Whilst these improvements were going on in my estates, my house from an antique Norman castle being changed to an elegant Greek temple or palace, my gardens and woods were losing their rustic appearance, to be adapted in the most genteel French style. My child growing up at his mother's knees and my influence in the country increasing, it must not be imagined that I stayed in Devonshire all this while, and that I neglected to make visits to London and my various estates in England and Ireland. I was to reside at the Tracothic estate and the Polwellyn Wheel, where I found, instead of profit, every kind of pettifogging chicanery. I passed over in state to our territories in Ireland, where I entertained the gentry in a style that the Lord Lieutenant himself could not equal, gave the fashion to Dublin. To be sure, it was a beggarly, savage city in those days, and, since the time there has been a pother about the Union and the misfortunes attending it, I have been at a loss to account for the mad praises of the old order of things which the fond Irish patriots have invented. I say I set the fashion to Dublin, and small praise to me for a poor place it was in those times, whatever the Irish party may say. In a former chapter I have given you a description of it. It was the Warsaw of our part of the world. There was a splendid, ruined, half-civilized nobility ruling over a half-savage population. I say half-savage advisedly. The commonality in the streets were wild, unshorn, and in rags. The most public places were not safe after nightfall. The college, the public buildings, and the great gentry's houses were splendid, the latter unfinished for the most part, but the people were in a state more wretched than any vulgar I have ever known. The exercise of their religion was only half allowed to them, their clergy were forced to be educated out of the country. Their aristocracy was quite distinct from them. There was a Protestant nobility, and in the towns poor, insolent Irish corporations, with a bankrupt retinue of mayors, aldermen, and municipal officers, all of whom figured in addresses and had the public voice in the country. But there was no sympathy and connection between the upper and the lower people of the Irish. To one who had been bred so much abroad as myself, the difference between Catholic and Protestant was doubly striking, and though as firm as a rock in my own faith, 
yet I could not help remembering my grandfather held a different one, and wondering that there should be such a political difference between the two. I passed among my neighbors for a dangerous leveler, for entertaining and expressing such opinions, and especially for asking the priest of the parish to my table at Castle Linden. He was a gentleman, educated at Salamanca, and to my mind a far better bred and more agreeable companion than his comrade the rector, who had but a dozen Protestants for his congregation. Who was a lord's son, to be sure, but he could hardly spell, and the great field of his labors was in the kennel and cockpit. I did not extend and beautify the house of Castle Linden, as I had done our other estates, but contented myself with paying an occasional visit there, exercising an almost royal hospitality, and keeping open house during my stay. When absent I gave to my aunt, the widow Brady, and her six unmarried daughters, although they always detested me, permission to inhabit the place, my mother preferring my new mansion of Berrioge. As my Lord Bullingdon was by this time grown excessively tall and troublesome, I determined to leave him under the care of a proper governor in Ireland, with Mrs. Brady and her six daughters to take care of him, and he was welcome to fall in love with all the old ladies if he were so minded, and thereby imitate his stepfather's example. When tired of Castle Linden, his lordship was at liberty to go and reside at my house with my mamma, but there was no love lost between him and her and on account of my son Brian, I think she hated him as cordially as ever I myself could possibly do. The county of Devon is not so lucky as the neighboring county of Cornwall, and has not the share of representatives which the latter possesses. Where I have known a moderate country gentleman, with a few score of hundreds per annum from his estate, trouble his income by returning three or four members to Parliament and by the influence with ministers which these seats gave him. The parliamentary interest of the House of Linden had been grossly neglected during my wife's minority, and the incapacity of the Earl, her father, or, to speak more correctly, it had been smuggled away from the Linden family altogether by the adroit old hypocrite of Tiptoff Castle, who acted as most kinsmen and guardians do by their wards and relatives, and robbed them. The Marquis of Tiptoff returned four members to Parliament, two for the borough of Tippleton, which, as all the world knows, lies at the foot of our estate of Hackton, bounded on the other side by Tiptoff Park. For time out of mind we had sent members for that borough, until Tiptoff, taking advantage of the late lord's imbecility, put in his own nominees. When his eldest son became of age, of course my lord was to take his seat for Tippleton. When Rigby, Nabob Rigby, who made his fortune under Clive in India, died, the Marquis thought fit to bring down his second son, my Lord George Poynings, to whom I have introduced the reader in a former chapter, and determined, in his high mightiness, that he too should go in and swell the ranks of the opposition, the big old Whigs with whom the Marquis acted. Rigby had been for some time in an ailing condition previous to his demise, and you may be sure that the consequence of his failing health had not been passed over by the gentry of the country, who were staunch government men for the most part, and hated my lord Tiptoff's principles as dangerous and ruinous. "'We have been looking out for a man to fight against him,' said the old squires to me. "'We can only match Tiptoff out of Hackton Castle. "'You, Mr. Linden, are our man.' and at the next county election we will swear to bring you in. I hated the Tiptoffs so that I would have fought them at any election. They not only would not visit at Hackton, but declined to receive those who visited us. They kept the women of the county from receiving my wife. They invented half the wild stories of my profligacy and extravagance with which the neighborhood was entertained. They said I had frightened my wife into marriage, and that she was a lost woman. They hinted that Bullingdon's life was not secure under my roof, that his treatment was odious, and that I wanted to put him out of the way to make place for Brian, my son. I could scarce have a friend to Hackton, but they counted the bottles drunk at my table. They ferreted out my dealings with my lawyers and agents. 
If a creditor was unpaid, every item of his bill was known at Tiptoff Hall. If I looked at a farmer's daughter, it was said I had ruined her. My faults are many, I confess, and as a domestic character I can't boast of any particular regularity or temper. But Lady Linden and I did not quarrel more than fashionable people do, and at first we always used to make it up pretty well. I am a man full of errors, certainly, but not the devil that these odious backbiters at Tiptoff represented me to be. For the first three years I never struck my wife but when I was in liquor. When I flung the carving knife at Bullingdon I was drunk, as everybody present can testify. But as for having any systematic scheme against the poor lad, I can declare solemnly that, beyond merely hating him, and one's inclinations are not in one's power, I am guilty of no evil towards him. I had sufficient motives, then, for enmity against the Tiptoffs, and am not a man to let a feeling of that kind lie inactive. Though a Whig, or perhaps because a Whig, the Marquis was one of the haughtiest men breathing, and treated commoners as his idol the great Earl used to treat them, after he came to a coronet himself, as so many low vassals who might be proud to lick his shoe-buckle. When the Tippleton mayor and corporation waited upon him, he received them covered, never offered Mr. Mayor a chair, but retired when the refreshments were brought, or had them served to the worshipful aldermen in the steward's room. These honest Britons never rebelled against such treatment, until instructed to do so by my patriotism. No, the dogs liked to be bullied, and in the course of a long experience I have met with but very few Englishmen who were not of their way of thinking. It was not until I opened their eyes that they knew their degradation. I invited the mayor to Hackton, and Mrs. Mayoress, a very buxom, pretty groceress she was, by the way, I made sit by my wife, and drove them both out to the races in my curricle. Lady Linden fought very hard against this condescension, but I had a way with her, as the saying is, and though she had a temper, yet I had a better one. A temper. Sha! A wildcat has a temper, but a keeper can get the better of it, and I know very few women in the world whom I could not master. Well, I made much of the old mayor and corporation, sent them bucks for their dinners or asked them to mine, made a point of attending their assemblies, dancing with their wives and daughters, going through, in short, all the acts of politeness which are necessary on such occasions. And though old Tiptoff must have seen my goings-on, yet his head was so much in the clouds that he never once condescended to imagine his dynasty could be overthrown in his own town of Tippleton, and issued his mandates as securely as if he had been the Grand Turk, and the Tippletonians no better than so many slaves of his will. Every post which brought us any account of Rigby's increasing illness was the sure occasion of a dinner from me, so much so that my friends of the hunt used to laugh and say, Rigby's worse, there's a corporation dinner at Hackton. It was in 1776, when the American War broke out, that I came into Parliament. My Lord Chatham, whose wisdom his party in those days used to call superhuman, raised his oracular voice in the House of Peers against the American contest and my countryman Mr. Burke, a great philosopher but a plaguy long-winded orator, was the champion of the rebels in the commons, where, however, thanks to British patriotism, he could get very few to back him. Old Tiptoff would have sworn black was white if the great earl had bidden him, and he made his son give up his commission in the guards, in imitation of my lord Pitt, who resigned his ensigncy rather than fight against what he called his American brethren. But this was a height of patriotism extremely little relished in England, where, ever since the breaking out of hostilities, our people had hated the Americans heartily, and where, when we heard of the fight of Lexington, 
and the glorious victory of Bunker's Hill, as we used to call it in those days, the nation flushed out in its usual hot-headed anger. The talk was all against the philosophers after that, and the people were most indomitably loyal. It was not until the land tax was increased that the gentry began to grumble a little. But still, my party in the West was very strong against the tip-toffs, and I determined to take the field and win, as usual. The old Marquis neglected every one of the decent precautions which are requisite in a parliamentary campaign. He signified to the corporation and freeholders his intention of presenting his son, Lord George, and his desire that the latter should be elected their burgess, but he scarcely gave so much as a glass of beer to wet the devotedness of his adherents. And I, as I need not say, engaged every tavern in Tippleton in my behalf. There is no need to go over the twenty times told tale of an election. I rescued the borough of Tippleton from the hands of Lord Tiptoff and his son, Lord George. I had a savage sort of satisfaction, too, in forcing my wife, who had been at one time exceedingly smitten by her kinsman, as I have already related, to take part against him, and to wear and distribute my colors when the day of election came. And when we spoke at one another, I told the crowd that I had beaten Lord George in love, that I had beaten him in war, and that I would now beat him in Parliament. And so I did, as the event proved. For, to the inexpressible anger of the old Marquis, Barry Linden, Esquire, was returned Member of Parliament for Tippleton, in place of John Rigby, Esquire, deceased, and I threatened him at the next election to turn him out of both his seats, and went to attend my duties in Parliament. It was then I seriously determined on achieving for myself the Irish peerage, to be enjoyed after me by my beloved son, and air. End of chapter 17。Chapter 18 of The Memoirs of Barry Linden, Esquire, by William Makepeace Thackeray. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 18 My Good Fortune Begins to Waver. And now, if any people should be disposed to think my history immoral, for I have heard some assert that I was a man who never deserved that so much prosperity should fall to my share, I will beg those cavillers to do me the favor to read the conclusion of my adventures, when they will see it was no such great prize that I had won, and that wealth, splendor, thirty thousand per annum, and a seat in Parliament, are often purchased at too dear a rate, when one has to buy those enjoyments at the price of personal liberty, and saddled with the charge of a troublesome wife. They are the deuce, these troublesome wives, and that is the truth. No man knows until he tries how wearisome and disheartening the burthen of one of them is, and how the annoyance grows and strengthens from year to year, and the courage becomes weaker to bear it, so that that trouble which seemed light and trivial the first year becomes intolerable ten years after. I have heard of one of the classical fellows in the dictionary who began by carrying a calf up a hill every day, and so continued until the animal grew to be a bull, which he still easily accommodated upon his shoulders. But take my word for it, young, unmarried gentleman, a wife is a very much harder pack to the back than the biggest heifer in Smithfield. And if I can prevent one of you from marrying, the memoirs of Barry Linden, Esquire, will not have been written in vain. Not that my lady was a scold or a shrew, as some wives are. I could have managed to have cured her of that. But she was of a cowardly, crying, melancholy, maudlin temper, which is to me still more odious. Do what one would to please her, she would never be happy or in good humor. I left her alone after a while, 
and because, as was natural in my case, where a disagreeable home obliged me to seek amusement and companions abroad, she added a mean, detestable jealousy to all her other faults. I could not for some time pay the commonest attention to any other woman, but my Lady Lyndon must weep and wring her hands and threaten to commit suicide and I know not what. Her death would have been no comfort to me, as I leave any person of common prudence to imagine. For that scoundrel of a young Bullingdon, who was now growing up a tall, gawky, swarthy lad, and about to become my greatest plague and annoyance, would have inherited every penny of the property, and I should have been left considerably poorer even than when I married the widow, for I spent my personal fortune, as well as the lady's income, in the keeping up of our rank and was always too much a man of honor and spirit to save a penny of Lady Linden's income. Let this be flung in the teeth of my detractors, who say I never could have so injured the Linden property had I not been making a private purse for myself, and who believe that, even in my present painful situation, I have hordes of gold laid by somewhere, and could come out as a Croesus when I chose. I never raised a shilling upon Lady Linden's property, but I spent it like a man of honor. Besides incurring numberless personal obligations for money, which all went to the common stock. Independent of the Linden mortgages and encumbrances, I owe myself at least one hundred and twenty thousand pounds, which I spent while in occupancy of my wife's estate, so that I may justly say that property is indebted to me in the above-mentioned sum. Although I have described the utter disgust and distaste which speedily took possession of my breast as regarded Lady Linden, and although I took no particular pains, for I am all frankness and above board, to disguise my feelings in general, yet she was of such a mean spirit that she pursued me with her regard in spite of my indifference to her and would kindle up at the smallest kind word I spoke to her. The fact is, between my respected reader and myself, that I was one of the handsomest and most dashing young men of England in those days, and my wife was violently in love with me. And though I say it who shouldn't, as the phrase goes, my wife was not the only woman of rank in London who had a favorable opinion of the humble Irish adventurer. What a riddle these women are, I have often thought. I have seen the most elegant creatures at St. James's grow wild for love of the coarsest and most vulgar of men. The cleverest women passionately admire the most illiterate of our sex, and so on. There is no end to the contrariety in the foolish creatures. And though I don't mean to hint that I am vulgar or illiterate, as the persons mentioned above, I would cut the throat of any man who dared to whisper a word against my birth or my breeding. Yet I have shown that Lady Linden had plenty of reason to dislike me if she chose. But, like the rest of her silly sex, she was governed by infatuation, not reason. And up to the very last day of our being together would be reconciled to me and fondle me if I addressed her a single kind word. Ah, she would say in these moments of tenderness, ah, Redmond, if you would always be so. And in these fits of love she was the most easy creature in the world to be persuaded, and would have signed away her whole property had it been possible. And I must confess, it was with very little attention on my part that I could bring her into good humor. To walk with her on the Mall or at Ranelagh, or attend her to church at St. James's. To purchase any little present or trinket for her was enough to coax her. Such is female inconsistency. The next day she'd be calling me Mr. Barry, probably, and be bemoaning her miserable fate that she ever should have been united to such a monster. So it was she was pleased to call one of the most brilliant men in His Majesty's Three Kingdoms. And I warrant me other ladies had a much more flattering opinion of me. Then she would threaten to leave me. 
but I had a hold of her in the person of her son, of whom she was passionately fond. I don't know why, for she had always neglected Bullingdon, her older son, and never bestowed a thought upon his health, his welfare, or his education. It was our young boy, then, who formed the great bond of union between me and her ladyship. And there was no plan of ambition I could propose in which she would not join for the poor lad's behoof, and no expense she would not eagerly incur if it might by any means be shown to tend to his advancement. I can tell you, bribes were administered, and in high places too, so near the royal person of his majesty that you would be astonished were I to mention what great personages condescended to receive our loans. I got from the English and Irish heralds a description and detailed pedigree of the barony of Berriog, and claimed respectfully to be reinstated in my ancestral titles, and also to be rewarded with the viscounty of Ballyberry. This head would become a coronet, my lady would sometimes say, in her fond moments, smoothing down my hair. And indeed there is many a puny whipster in their lordship's house, who has neither my presence, nor my courage, my pedigree, nor any of my merits. The striving after this peerage I considered to have been one of the most unlucky of all my unlucky dealings at this period. I made unheard of sacrifices to bring it about. I lavished money here and diamonds there. I bought lands at ten times their value, purchased pictures and articles of vertu at ruinous prices. I gave repeated entertainments to those friends to my claim who, being about the royal person, were likely to advance it. I lost many a bet to the royal dukes, his majesty's brothers. <laughs> but let these matters be forgotten. And, because of my private injuries, let me not be deficient in my loyalty to my sovereign. The only person in this transaction whom I shall mention openly is that old scamp and swindler, Gustavus Adolphus, 13th Earl of Crabs. This nobleman was one of the gentlemen of His Majesty's closet, and one with whom the revered monarch was on terms of considerable intimacy. A close regard had sprung up between them in the old king's time, when His Royal Highness, playing at battledore and shuttlecock with the young lord on the landing-place of the great staircase at Kew, in some moment of irritation the Prince of Wales kicked the young earl downstairs, who, falling, broke his leg. The prince's hearty repentance for his violence caused him to ally himself closely with the person whom he had injured and when his majesty came to the throne there was no man, it is said, of whom the Earl of Butte was so jealous as my lord Crabbe's. The latter was poor and extravagant, and Butte got him out of the way by sending him on the Russian and other embassies. But on this favorite's dismissal, Crabbe's sped back from the continent, and was appointed almost immediately to a place about his majesty's person. It was with this disreputable nobleman that I contracted an unlucky intimacy, when, fresh and unsuspecting, I first established myself in town after my marriage with Lady Lyndon. And, as Crabbe's was really one of the most entertaining fellows in the world, I took a sincere pleasure in his company. Besides the interesting desire I had in cultivating the society of a man who was so near the person, of the highest personage in the realm. To hear the fellow you would fancy that there was scarce any appointment made in which he had not a share. He told me, for instance, of Charles Fox being turned out of his place a day before poor Charlie himself was aware of the fact. He told me when the Howes were coming back from America, and who was going to succeed to the command there not to multiply instances, it was upon this person 
that I fixed my chief reliance for the advancement of my claim to the barony of Berriog and the viscounty which I proposed to get. One of the main causes of expense which this ambition of mine entailed upon me was the fitting out and arming a company of infantry from the Castle Linden and Hackton estates in Ireland, which I offered to my gracious sovereign for the campaign against the American rebels. These troops, superbly equipped and clothed, were embarked at Portsmouth in the year 1778, and the patriotism of the gentleman who had raised them was so acceptable at court that, on being presented by my lord North, his majesty condescended to notice me particularly, and said, That's right, Mr. Linden, raise another company, and go with them too. But this was by no means, as the reader may suppose, to my notions. A man with thirty thousand pounds per annum is a fool to risk his life like a common beggar. And on this account I have always admired the conduct of my friend Jack Bolter, who had been a most active and resolute cornet of horse, and as such engaged in every scrape and skirmish which could fall to his lot. But just before the Battle of Minden he received news that his uncle, the great army contractor, was dead, and had left him five thousand per annum. Jack that instant applied for leave, and, as it was refused him on the eve of a general action, my gentleman took it, and never fired a pistol again, except against an officer who questioned his courage, and whom he winged in such a cool and determined manner, as showed all the world that it was from prudence and a desire of enjoying his money, not from cowardice, that he quitted the profession of arms. When this Hackton company was raised, my stepson, who was now sixteen years of age, was most eager to be allowed to join it, and I would have gladly consented to have been rid of the young man, but his guardian, Lord Tiptoff, who thwarted me in everything, refused his permission, and the lad's military inclinations were balked. If he could have gone on the expedition, and a rebel rifle had put an end to him, I believe, to tell the truth, I should not have been grieved over much, and I should have had the pleasure of seeing my other son, the heir to the estate which his father had won with so much pains. The education of this young nobleman had been, I confess, some of the loosest, and perhaps the truth is, I did neglect the brat. He was of so wild, savage, and insubordinate a nature that I never had the least regard for him, and before me and his mother at least was so moody and dull that I thought instruction thrown away upon him, and left him for the most part to shift for himself. For two whole years he remained in Ireland away from us, and when in England we kept him mainly at Hackton, never caring to have the uncouth, ungainly lad in the genteel company in the capital in which we naturally mingled. My own poor boy, on the contrary, was the most polite and engaging child ever seen. It was a pleasure to treat him with kindness and distinction and before he was five years old, the little fellow was the pink of fashion, beauty, and good breeding. In fact, he could not have been otherwise, with the care both his parents bestowed upon him, and the attentions that were lavished upon him in every way. When he was four years old, I quarreled with the English nurse who had attended upon him, and about whom my wife had been so jealous and procured for him a French gouvernante, who had lived with families of the first quality in Paris, and who, of course, must set my Lady Linden jealous, too. Under the care of this young woman, my little rogue learned to chatter French most charmingly. It would have done your heart good to hear the dear rascal swear, Mort de ma vie, and see him stamp his little foot and send the manance and canaille of the domestics to the trente mille diables. 
he was precocious in all things. At a very early age he would mimic everybody. At five he would sit at table and drink his glass of champagne with the best of us, and his nurse would teach him little French catches and the last Parisian songs of Vade and Collard. Pretty songs they were, too, and would make such of his hearers as understood French burst with laughing, and, I promise you, scandalize some of the old dowagers who were admitted into the society of his mamma. Not that there were many of them, for I did not encourage the visits of what you call respectable people to Lady Linden. They are sad spoilers of sport, tail-bearers, envious, narrow-minded people, making mischief between man and wife. Whenever any of these grave personages in hoops and high heels used to make their appearance at Hackton, or in Berkeley Square, it was my chief pleasure to frighten them off, and I would make my little Brian dance, sing, and play the diable à quatre, and aid him myself, so as to scare the old frumps. I shall never forget the solemn remonstrances of our old square toes of a rector at Hackton, who made one or two vain attempts to teach little Brian Latin, and with whose innumerable children I sometimes allowed the boy to associate. They learned some of Brian's French songs from him, which their mother, a poor soul who understood pickles and custards much better than French, used fondly to encourage them in singing but which their father, one day hearing, he sent Miss Sarah to her bedroom and bread and water for a week, and solemnly horsed Master Jacob in the presence of all his brothers and sisters, and of Brian, to whom he hoped that flogging would act as a warning. But my little rogue kicked and plunged at the old parson's shins until he was obliged to get his sexton to hold him down, and swore, corble, morble, ventreble, that his young friend Jacob should not be maltreated. After this scene, his reverence forbade Brian in the rectory house, on which I swore that his eldest son, who was bringing up for the ministry, should never have the succession of the living of Hackton, which I had thoughts of bestowing on him. And his father said, with a canting, hypocritical air which I hate, that heaven's will must be done that he would not have his children disobedient or corrupted for the sake of a bishopric, and wrote me a pompous and solemn letter, charged with Latin quotations, taking farewell of me and my house. I do so with regret, added the old gentleman, for I have received so many kindnesses from the Hackton family that it goes to my heart to be disunited from them. My poor, I fear, may suffer in consequence of my separation from you, and my being henceforward unable to bring to your notice instances of distress and affliction, which, when they were known to you, I will do you the justice to say, your generosity was always prompt to relieve. There may have been some truth in this, for the old gentleman was perpetually pestering me with petitions, and I know, for a certainty, from his own charities was often without a shilling in his pocket. But I suspect the good dinners at Hackton had a considerable share in causing his regrets at the dissolution of our intimacy. And I know that his wife was quite sorry to forego the acquaintance of Brian's gouvernante, Mademoiselle Louison, who had all the newest French fashions at her finger's ends, and who never went to the rectory but you would see the girls of the family turn out in new sacks or mantles the Sunday after. I used to punish the old rebel by snoring very loud in my pew on Sundays during sermon time, and I got a governor presently for Brian, and a chaplain of my own, when he became of age sufficient to be separated from the women's society and guardianship. His English nurse I married to my head gardener with a handsome portion. His French gouvernante I bestowed upon my faithful German, Fritz, not forgetting the dowry in the latter instance. And they set up a French dining house in Soho, and I believe at the time I write they are richer in the world's goods than their generous and free-handed master. 
For Brian, I now got a young gentleman from Oxford, the Reverend Edmund Lavender, who was commissioned to teach him Latin, when the boy was in the humor, and to ground him in history, grammar, and the other qualifications of a gentleman. Lavender was a precious addition to our society at Hackton. He was the means of making a great deal of fun there. He was the butt of all our jokes, and bore them with the most admirable and martyr-like patience. He was one of that sort of men who would rather be kicked by a great man than not be noticed by him. And I have often put his wig into the fire in the face of the company, when he would laugh at the joke as well as any man there. It was a delight to put him on a high-mettled horse and send him after the hounds, pale, sweating, calling on us for heaven's sake to stop, and holding on for dear life by the mane and the crupper. How it happened that the fellow was never killed I know not, but I suppose hanging is the way in which his neck will be broke. He never met with any accident to speak of in our hunting matches but you are pretty sure to find him at dinner in his place at the bottom of the table, making the punch, whence he would be carried off, fuddled, to bed before the night was over. Many a time have Brian and I painted his face black upon those occasions. We put him into a haunted room and frightened his soul out of his body with ghosts. We let loose cargoes of rats upon his bed, we cried fire and filled his boots with water. We cut the legs of his preaching chair and filled his sermon book with snuff. Poor Lavender bore it all with patience, and at our parties or when we came to London was amply repaid by being allowed to sit with the gentlefolks and to fancy himself in the society of men of fashion. It was good to hear the contempt with which he talked about our rector. He has a son, sir, who is a servitor, and a servitor at a small college, he would say. How could you, my dear sir, think of giving the reversion of Hackton to such a low-bred creature? I should now speak of my other son, at least my Lady Lyndon's. I mean the Viscount Bullingdon. I kept him in Ireland for some years, under the guardianship of my mother, whom I had installed at Castle Linden. And great, I promise you, was her state in that occupation, and prodigious the good soul's splendor and haughty bearing. With all her oddities, the Castle Linden estate was the best managed of all our possessions. The rents were excellently paid, the charges of getting them in smaller than they would have been under the management of any steward. It was astonishing what small expenses the good widow incurred. Although she kept up the dignity of the two families, as she would say. She had a set of domestics to attend upon the young lord. She never went out herself but in an old gilt coach and six. The house was kept clean and tight. The furniture and gardens in the best repair, and in our occasional visits to Ireland we never found any house we visited in such good condition as our own. There were a score of ready serving lasses, and half as many trim men about the castle, and everything in as fine condition as the best housekeeper could make it. All this she did with scarcely any charges to us, for she fed sheep and cattle in the parks, and made a handsome profit of them at Ballinus Low. She supplied I don't know how many towns with butter and bacon, and the fruit and vegetables from the gardens of Castle Linden got the highest prices in Dublin market. She had no waste in the kitchen as there used to be in most of our Irish houses, and there was no consumption of liquor in the cellars, for the old lady drank water and saw little or no company. All her society was a couple of the girls of my ancient flame, Nora Brady, now Mrs. Quinn who with her husband had spent almost all their property, and who came to see me once in London, looking very old, fat and slatternly, with two dirty children at her side. She wept very much when she saw me, called me Sir and Mr. Linden, at which I was not sorry, and begged me to help her husband, 
which I did, getting him, through my friend Lord Crabbs, a place in the excise in Ireland, and paying the passage of his family and himself to that country. I found him a dirty, cast-down, sniveling drunkard, and, looking at poor Nora, could not but wonder at the days when I had thought her a divinity. But if ever I have had a regard for a woman, I remain through life her constant friend, and could mention a thousand such instances of my generous and faithful disposition. Young Bullingdon, however, was almost the only person with whom she was concerned that my mother could not keep in order. The accounts she sent me of him at first were such as gave my paternal heart considerable pain. He rejected all regularity and authority. He would absent himself for weeks from the house on sporting or other expeditions. He was, when at home, silent and queer, refusing to make my mother's game at piquet of evenings, but plunging into all sorts of musty old books with which he muddled his brains. More at ease laughing and chatting with the pipers and maids in the servants' hall than with the gentry in the drawing-room, always cutting jibes and jokes at Mrs. Berry, at which she, who was rather a slow woman at repartee, would chafe violently. In fact, leading a life of insubordination and scandal. And, to crown all, the young scapegrace took to frequenting the society of the Romish priest of the parish, a threadbare rogue from some popish seminary in France or Spain, rather than the company of the vicar of Castle Linden, a gentleman of Trinity, who kept his hounds and drank his two bottles a day. Regard for the lad's religion made me not hesitate, then, how I should act towards him. If I have any principle which has guided me through life, it has been respect for the establishment, and a hearty scorn and abhorrence of all other forms of belief. I therefore sent my French body-servant, in the year 17 blank, to Dublin with a commission to bring the young reprobate over, and the report brought to me was that he had passed the whole of the last night of his stay in Ireland with his popish friend at the mass-house, that he and my mother had a violent quarrel on the very last day, that, on the contrary, he kissed Biddy and Dozy, her two nieces, who seemed very sorry that he should go, and that, being pressed to go and visit the rector, he absolutely refused, saying he was a wicked old Pharisee, inside whose doors he would never set his foot. The doctor wrote me a letter, warning me against the deplorable errors of this young imp of perdition, as he called him, and I could see that there was no love lost between them. But it appeared that, if not agreeable to the gentry of the country, young Bullingdon had a huge popularity among the common people. There was a regular crowd weeping round the gate when his coach took its departure. Scores of the ignorant, savage wretches ran for miles along by the side of the chariot, and some even went so far as to steal away before his departure, and appear at the pigeon-house at Dublin to bid him a last farewell. It was with considerable difficulty that some of these people could be kept from secreting themselves in the vessel, and accompanying their young lord to England. To do the young scoundrel justice, when he came among us, he was a manly, noble-looking lad, and everything in his bearing and appearance betokened the high blood from which he came. He was the very portrait of some of the dark cavaliers of the Linden race, whose pictures hung in the gallery at Hackton, where the lad was fond of spending the chief part of his time, occupied with the musty old books which he took out of the library, and which I hate to see a young man of spirit poring over. Always in my company he preserved the most rigid silence, and a haughty, scornful demeanour, which was so much the more disagreeable because there was nothing in his behaviour I could actually take hold of to find fault with, although his whole conduct was insolent and supercilious to the highest degree. His mother was very much agitated at receiving him on his arrival. If he felt any such agitation he certainly did not show it. 
he made her a very low and formal bow when he kissed her hand, and, when I held out mine, put both his hands behind his back, stared me full in the face, and bent his head, saying, Mr. Barry Linden, I believe, turned on his heel and began talking about the state of the weather to his mother, whom he always styled Your Ladyship. She was angry at this pert bearing, and when they were alone rebuked him sharply for not shaking hands with his father. "'My father, madam,' said he, "'surely you mistake. My father was the right honourable Sir Charles Linden. I, at least, have not forgotten him, if others have. It was a declaration of war to me, as I saw at once. Though I declare I was willing enough to have received the boy well on his coming amongst us, and to have lived with him on terms of friendliness. But as men serve me, I serve them. Who can blame me for my after-quarrels with this young reprobate, or lay upon my shoulders the evils which afterwards befell? Perhaps I lost my temper, and my subsequent treatment of him was hard. But it was he who began the quarrel, and not I and the evil consequences which ensued were entirely of his creating. As it is best to nip vice in the bud, and for a master of a family to exercise his authority in such a manner as that there may be no question about it, I took the earliest opportunity of coming to close quarters with Master Bullingdon, and the day after his arrival among us, upon his refusal to perform some duty which I requested of him, I had him conveyed to my study, and thrashed him soundly. This process, I confess, at first agitated me a good deal, for I had never laid a whip on a lord before. But I speedily got used to the practice, and his back and my whip became so well acquainted that I warrant there was very little ceremony between us after a while. If I were to repeat all the instances of the insubordination and brutal conduct of young Bullingdon, I should weary the reader. His perseverance in resistance was, I think, even greater than mine in correcting him, for a man, be he ever so much resolved to do his duty as a parent, can't be flogging his children all day, or for every fault they commit. And though I got the character of being so cruel a stepfather to him, I pledge my word, I spared him correction when he merited it many more times than I administered it. Besides, there were eight clear months in the year when he was quit of me, during the time of my presence in London, at my place in Parliament, and at the court of my sovereign. At this period I made no difficulty to allow him to profit by the Latin and Greek of the old rector, who had christened him and had a considerable influence over the wayward lad. After a scene or a quarrel between us, it was generally to the rectory house that the young rebel would fly for refuge and counsel. And I must own that the parson was a pretty just umpire between us in our disputes. Once he led the boy back to Hackton by the hand, and actually brought him into my presence, although he had vowed never to enter the doors in my lifetime again and said, he had brought his lordship to acknowledge his error, and to submit to any punishment I might think proper to inflict. Upon which I caned him in the presence of two or three friends of mine, with whom I was sitting drinking at the time, and to do him justice he bore a pretty severe punishment without wincing or crying in the least. This will show that I was not too severe in my treatment of the lad, as I had the authority of the clergyman himself for inflicting the correction which I thought proper. Twice or thrice, Lavender, Brian's governor, attempted to punish my Lord Bullingdon, but I promise you the rogue was too strong for him, and leveled the Oxford man to the ground with a chair, greatly to the delight of little Brian, who cried out, Bravo, bully! Thump him! Thump him! And bully! certainly did, to the governor's heart's content, who never attempted personal chastisement afterwards, 
but contented himself by bringing the tales of his lordship's misdoings to me, his natural protector and guardian. With the child, Bullingdon was, strange to say, pretty tractable. He took a liking for the little fellow, as indeed everybody who saw that darling boy did. Liked him more and more, he said, because he was half a linden. And well he might like him, for many a time, at the dear angel's intercession of, Papa, don't flog Bully today, I have held my hand and saved him a horsing which he richly deserved. With his mother at first he would scarcely deign to have any communication. He said she was no longer one of the family. Why should he love her, as she had never been a mother to him? But it will give the reader an idea of the dogged obstinacy and surliness of the lad's character when I mention one trait regarding him. It has been made a matter of complaint against me that I denied him the education befitting a gentleman, and never sent him to college or to school. But the fact is, it was of his own choice that he went to neither. He had the offer repeatedly from me, who wished to see as little of his impudence as possible, but he, as repeatedly, declined. And for a long time I could not make out what was the charm which kept him in a house where he must have been far from comfortable. It came out, however, at last. There used to be very frequent disputes between my Lady Linden and myself, in which sometimes she was wrong, sometimes I was, and which, as neither of us had very angelical tempers, used to run very high. I was often in liquor, and when in that condition, what gentleman is master of himself? Perhaps I did, in this state, use my lady rather roughly, fling a glass or two at her and call her by a few names that were not complimentary. I may have threatened her life, which it was obviously my interest not to take, and have frightened her, in a word, considerably. After one of these disputes, in which she ran screaming through the galleries, and I, as tipsy as a lord, came staggering after, it appears Bullingdon was attracted out of his room by the noise. As I came up with her, the audacious rascal tripped up my heels, which were not very steady, and, catching his fainting mother in his arms, took her into his own room, where he, upon her entreaty, swore he would never leave the house as long as she continued united with me. I knew nothing of the vow, or indeed of the tipsy frolic which was the occasion of it. I was taken up, glorious, as the phrase is, by my servants, and put to bed, and in the morning had no more recollection of what had occurred any more than of what happened when I was a baby at the breast. Lady Linden told me of the circumstance years after, and I mention it here, as it enables me to plead honorably not guilty to one of the absurd charges of cruelty trumped up against me with respect to my stepson. Let my detractors apologize, if they dare, for the conduct of a graceless ruffian who trips up the heels of his own natural guardian and stepfather after dinner. The circumstance served to unite mother and son for a little but their characters were too different. I believe she was too fond of me ever to allow him to be sincerely reconciled to her. As he grew up to be a man, his hatred towards me assumed an intensity quite wicked to think of, and which I promise you I returned with interest. And it was at the age of sixteen, I think, that the impudent young hangdog, on my return from Parliament one summer, and on my proposing to cane him, as usual, gave me to understand that he would submit to no farther chastisement from me, and said, grinding his teeth, that he would shoot me if I laid hands on him. I looked at him. He was grown, in fact, to be a tall young man, and I gave up that necessary part of his education. It was about this time that I raised the company which was to serve in America. 
and my enemies in the country, and since my victory over the Tiptoffs I scarce need say I had many of them, began to propagate the most shameful reports regarding my conduct to that precious young scapegrace my stepson, and to insinuate that I actually wished to get rid of him. Thus my loyalty to my sovereign was actually construed into a horrid, unnatural attempt on my part on Bullingdon's life, and it was said that I had raised the American Corps for the sole purpose of getting the young Viscount to command it, and so of getting rid of him. I am not sure that they had not fixed upon the name of the very man in the company who was ordered to dispatch him at the first general action, and the bribe I was to give him for this delicate piece of service. But the truth is, I was of the opinion then, and though the fulfillment of my prophecy has been delayed, yet I make no doubt it will be brought to pass ere long, that my Lord Bullingdon needed none of my aid in sending him into the other world, but had a happy knack of finding the way thither himself, which he would be sure to pursue. In truth, he began upon this way early. Of all the violent, daring, disobedient scapegraces that ever caused an affectionate parent pain, he was certainly the most incorrigible. There was no beating him, or coaxing him, or taming him. For instance, with my little son, when his governor brought him into the room as we were over the bottle after dinner, my lord would begin his violent and undutiful sarcasms at me. Dear child, he would say, beginning to caress and fondle him, what a pity it is I am not dead for thy sake. The Lindens would then have a worthier representative, and enjoy all the benefits of the illustrious blood of the berries of Berryogue. Would they not, Mr. Barry Linden? He always chose the days when company, or the clergy or gentry of the neighborhood, were present, to make these insolent speeches to me. Another day, it was Brian's birthday, we were giving a grand ball and gala at Hackton, and it was time for my little Brian to make his appearance among us, as he usually did in the smartest little court suit you ever saw. Ah, oh, me! But it brings tears into my old eyes now to think of the bright looks of that darling little face. There was a great crowding and tittering when the child came in, led by his half-brother who walked into the dancing-room, would you believe it? In his stocking feet, leading little Brian by the hand, paddling about in the great shoes of the elder. Don't you think he fits my shoes very well? Sir Richard Wargrave, says the young reprobate, upon which the company began to look at each other and to titter, and his mother, coming up to Lord Bullingdon with great dignity, seized the child to her breast and said, From the manner in which I love this child, my lord, you ought to know how I would have loved his elder brother had he proved worthy of any mother's affection. And, bursting into tears, Lady Linden left the apartment and the young lord rather discomfited for once. At last, on one occasion, his behavior to me was so outrageous, it was in the hunting field and in a large public company, that I lost all patience, rode at the urchin straight, wrenched him out of the saddle with all my force, and flinging him roughly to the ground, sprang down to it myself, and administered such a correction across the young caitiff's head and shoulders with my horsewhip as might have ended in his death had I not been restrained in time. For my passion was up, and I was in a state to do murder or any other crime. The lad was taken home and put to bed, where he lay for a day or two in a fever, as much from rage and vexation as from the chastisement I had given him. And three days afterwards, on sending to inquire at his chamber whether he would join the family at table, a note was found on his table, and his bed was empty and cold. The young villain had fled, and had the audacity to write in the following terms regarding me to my wife, his mother. Madam, he said, I have borne as long as mortal could endure the ill-treatment of the insolent Irish upstart whom you have taken to your bed. 
it is not only the lowness of his birth and the general brutality of his manners which disgust me and must make me hate him so long as i have the honor to bear the name of linden which he is unworthy of but the shameful nature of his conduct towards your ladyship his brutal and ungentlemanlike behavior his open infidelity his habits of extravagance intoxication his shameless robberies and swindling of my property and yours it is these insults to you which shock and annoy me more than the ruffian's infamous conduct to myself i would have stood by your ladyship as i promised but you seem to have taken latterly your husband's part and as i cannot personally chastise this low-bred ruffian who to our shame be it spoken is the husband of my mother and as i cannot bear to witness his treatment of you and loathe his horrible society as if it were the plague i am determined to quit my native country at least during his detested life or during my own i possess a small income from my father of which i have no doubt mr berry will cheat me if he can but which if your ladyship has some feelings of a mother left you will perhaps award to me messrs childs the bankers can have orders to pay it me when due if they receive no such orders i shall not be in the least surprised knowing you to be in the hands of a villain who would not scruple to rob on the highway and shall try to find out some way in life for myself more honorable than that by which the penniless irish adventurer has arrived to turn me out of my rights and home this mad epistle was signed bullingdon and all the neighbors vowed that i had been privy to his flight and would profit by it though i declare on my honor my true and sincere desire after reading the above infamous letter was to have the author within a good arm's length of me that i might let him know my opinion regarding him but there was no eradicating this idea from people's minds who insisted that i wanted to kill bullingdon whereas murder as i have said was never one of my evil qualities and even had i wished to injure my young enemy ever so much common prudence would have made my mind easy as i knew he was going to ruin his own way it was long before we heard of the fate of the audacious young truant but after some fifteen months had elapsed i had the pleasure of being able to refute some of the murderous calumnies which had been uttered against me by producing a bill with bullingdon's own signature drawn from general tarleton's army in america where my company was conducting itself with the greatest glory and with which my lord was serving as a volunteer there were some of my kind friends who persisted still in attributing all sorts of wicked intentions to me lord tiptoff would never believe that i would pay any bill much more any bill of lord bullingdon's old lady betty grimsby his sister persisted in declaring the bill was a forgery and the poor dear lord dead until there came a letter to her ladyship from lord bullingdon himself who had been at new york at headquarters and who described at length the splendid garden festival given by the officers of the garrison to our distinguished chieftains the two howes in the meanwhile if i had murdered my lord i could scarcely have been received with more shameful obloquy and slander than now followed me in town and country you will hear of the lad's death to be sure exclaimed one of my friends and then his wife's will follow added another he will marry jenny jones added a third and so on lavender brought me the news of these scandals about me the country was up against me the farmers on market days used to touch their hats sulkily and get out of my way the gentleman who followed my hunt now suddenly seceded from it and left off my uniform at the county ball where i led out lady susan capermore and took my place third in the dance after the duke and the marquis as was my wont all the couples turned away as we came to them and we were left to dance alone suki capermore has a love of dancing which would make her dance at a funeral if anybody asked her 
and I had too much spirit to give in at this signal instance of insult towards me. So we danced with some of the very commonest low people at the bottom of the set. Your apothecaries, wine merchants, attorneys, and such scum as are allowed to attend our public assemblies. The bishop, my Lady Linden's relative, neglected to invite us to the palace at the Assizes, and, in a word, every indignity was put upon me which could by possibility be heaped upon an innocent and honourable gentleman. My reception in London, whither I now carried my wife and family, was scarcely more cordial. On paying my respects to my sovereign at St. James's, his majesty pointedly asked me when I had news of Lord Bullingdon, on which I replied with no ordinary presence of mind, Sir, my lord Bullingdon is fighting the rebels against your majesty's crown in America. Does your majesty desire that I should send another regiment to aid him? On which the king turned on his heel, and I made my bow out of the presence chamber. When Lady Linden kissed the queen's hand at the drawing-room, I found that precisely the same question had been put to her ladyship, and she came home much agitated at the rebuke which had been administered to her. Thus it was that my loyalty was rewarded, and my sacrifice in favour of my country viewed. I took away my establishment abruptly to Paris, where I met with a very different reception. But my stay amidst the enchanting pleasures of that capital was extremely short, for the French government, which had been tampering with the American rebels, now openly acknowledged the independence of the United States. A declaration of war ensued. All we happy English were ordered away from Paris, and I think I left one or two fair ladies there inconsolable. It is the only place where a gentleman can live as he likes without being incommoded by his wife. The Countess and I, during our stay, scarcely saw each other except upon public occasions, at Versailles, or at the Queen's play-table, and our dear little Brian advanced in a thousand elegant accomplishments which rendered him the delight of all who knew him. I must not forget to mention here my last interview with my good uncle, the Chevalier de Balibéry, whom I left at Brussels with strong intentions of making his salut, as the phrase is, and who had gone into retirement at a convent there. Since then he had come into the world again, much to his annoyance and repentance, having fallen desperately in love in his old age with a French actress, who had done as most ladies of her character do, ruined him, left him, and laughed at him. His repentance was very edifying. Under the guidance of the monsieur of the Irish college, he once more turned his thoughts towards religion. And his only prayer to me when I saw him, and asked in what way I could relieve him, was to pay a handsome fee to the convent in which he had proposed to enter. This I could not, of course, do, my religious principles forbidding me to encourage superstition in any way, and the old gentleman and I parted rather coolly in consequence of my refusal, as he said, to make his old days comfortable. I was very poor at the time. That is the fact, and entre nous the Rosemont of the French opera, an indifferent dancer, but a charming figure and ankle, was ruining me in diamonds, equipages, and furniture bills, added to which I had a run of ill luck at play, and was forced to meet my losses by the most shameful sacrifices to the money-lenders, by pawning part of Lady Linden's diamonds, that graceless little Rosemont wheedled me out of some of them, and by a thousand other schemes for raising money. But when honour is in the case, was I ever found backward at her call? And what man can say that Barry Linden lost a bet which he did not pay? As for my ambitious hopes regarding the Irish peerage, I began on my return to find out that I had been led wildly astray by that rascal Lord Crabs, who liked to take my money but had no more influence to get me a coronet than to procure for me the Pope's tiara. The sovereign was not a whit more gracious to me on returning from the continent 
than he had been before my departure. And I had it from one of the aides-de-camp of the royal dukes his brothers, that my conduct and amusements at Paris had been odiously misrepresented by some spies there, and had formed the subject of royal comment, and that the king had, influenced by these calumnies, actually said I was the most disreputable man in the three kingdoms. I disreputable? I a dishonor to my name and country. When I heard these falsehoods I was in such a rage that I went off to Lord North at once to remonstrate with the minister, to insist upon being allowed to appear before his majesty and clear myself of the imputations against me, to point out my services to the government in voting with them, and to ask when the reward that had been promised to me, viz. the title held by my ancestors, was again to be revived in my person. There was a sleepy coolness in that fat Lord North, which was the most provoking thing that the opposition had ever to encounter from him. He heard me with half-shut eyes. When I had finished a long, violent speech, which I had made striding about his room in Downing Street and gesticulating with all the energy of an Irishman, he opened one eye, smiled, and asked me gently if I had done. On my replying in the affirmative, he said, well, Mr. Barry, I'll answer you point by point. The king is exceedingly averse to make peers, as you know. Your claims, as you call them, have been laid before him, and his majesty's gracious reply was that you were the most impudent man in his dominions, and merited a halter rather than a coronet. As for withdrawing your support from us, you are perfectly welcome to carry yourself and your vote whithersoever you please. And now, as I have a great deal of occupation, perhaps you will do me the favor to retire." So saying, he raised his hand lazily to the bell, and bowed me out, asking blandly if there was any other thing in the world in which he could oblige me. I went home in a fury which can't be described, and having Lord Crabs to dinner that day, assailed his lordship by pulling his wig off his head and smothering it in his face, and by attacking him in that part of the person where, according to report, he had been formerly assaulted by majesty. The whole story was over the town the next day, and pictures of me were hanging in the clubs and print shops performing the operation alluded to. All the town laughed at the picture of the lord and the Irishman, and, I need not say, recognized both. As for me, I was one of the most celebrated characters in London in those days, my dress, style, and equipage being as well known as those of any leader of the fashion, and my popularity, if not great in the highest quarters, was at least considerable elsewhere. The people cheered me in the Gordon Rouse. At the time they nearly killed my friend Jemmy Twitcher, and burned Lord Mansfield's house down. Indeed, I was known as a staunch Protestant, and after my quarrel with Lord North, veered right round to the opposition, and vexed him with all the means in my power. These were not, unluckily, very great, for I was a bad speaker, and the house would not listen to me. And presently, in 1780, after the Gordon disturbance, was dissolved when a general election took place. It came on me, as all my mishaps were in the habit of coming, at a most unlucky time. I was obliged to raise more money, at most ruinous rates, to face the confounded election, and had the tip-toffs against me in the field more active and virulent than ever. My blood boils even now when I think of the rascally conduct of my enemies in that scoundrelly election. I was held up as the Irish Bluebeard and libels of me were printed, and gross characters drawn, representing me flogging Lady Linden, whipping Lord Bullingdon, turning him out of doors in a storm, and I know not what. There were pictures of a pauper cabin in Ireland from which it was pretended I came, others in which I was represented as a lackey and shoe-black. A flood of calumny was let loose upon me, 
in which any man of less spirit would have gone down. But though I met my accusers boldly, though I lavished sums of money in the election, though I flung open Hackton Hall and kept Champagne and Burgundy running there and at all my inns in the town as commonly as water, the election went against me. The rascally gentry had all turned upon me and joined the tip-toff faction. It was even represented that I held my wife by force, and though I sent her into the town alone, wearing my colors with Brian in her lap and made her visit the mayor's lady and the chief women there, nothing would persuade the people but that she lived in fear and trembling of me. And the brutal mob had the insolence to ask her why she dared to go back, and how she liked horsewhip for supper. I was thrown out of my election, and all the bills came down upon me together, all the bills I had been contracting during the years of my marriage, which the creditors, with a rascally unanimity, sent in until they lay upon my table in heaps. I won't cite their amount. It was frightful. My stewards and lawyers made matters worse. I was bound up in an inextricable toil of bills and debts, of mortgages and insurances, and all the horrible evils attendant upon them. Lawyers upon lawyers posted down from London. Composition after composition was made, and Lady Linden's income hampered almost irretrievably to satisfy those cormorants. To do her justice, she behaved with tolerable kindness at this season of trouble, for whenever I wanted money I had to coax her, and whenever I coaxed her I was sure of bringing this weak and light-minded woman to good humor, who was of such a weak, terrified nature that to secure an easy week with me she would sign away a thousand a year. And when my troubles began at Hackton, and I determined on only one chance left, viz. to return to Ireland and retrench, assigning over the best part of my income to the creditors until their demands were met, my lady was quite cheerful at the idea of going, and said, if we would be quiet, she had no doubt all would be well. Indeed, was glad to undergo the comparative poverty in which we must now live for the sake of the retirement and the chance of domestic quiet which she hoped to enjoy. We went off to Bristol pretty suddenly, leaving the odious and ungrateful wretches at Hackton to vilify us, no doubt, in our absence. My stud and hounds were sold off immediately. The harpies would have been glad to pounce upon my person, but that was out of their power. I had raised, by cleverness and management, to the full as much on my mines and private estates as they were worth. So the scoundrels were disappointed in this instance. And as for the plate and property in the London house, they could not touch that, as it was the property of the heirs of the house of Linden. I passed over to Ireland then, and took up my abode at Castle Linden for a while, all the world imagining that I was an utterly ruined man, and that the famous and dashing Barry Linden would never again appear in the circles of which he had been an ornament. But it was not so. In the midst of my perplexities, fortune reserved a great consolation for me still. Dispatches came home from America, announcing Lord Cornwallis's defeat of General Gates in Carolina, and the death of Lord Bullingdon, who was present as a volunteer. For my own desires to possess a paltry Irish title, I cared little. My son was now heir to an English earldom, and I made him assume forthwith the title of Lord Viscount Castle Linden, the third of the family titles. My mother went almost mad with joy at saluting her grandson as my lord, and I felt that all my sufferings and privations were repaid by seeing this darling child advanced to such a post of honor. End of chapter 18「Chapter Nineteen, Part One of The Memoirs of Barry Linton, Esquire, by William Makepeace Thackeray. 
This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 19 Conclusion Part 1 if the world were not composed of a race of ungrateful scoundrels who share your prosperity while it lasts and even when gorged with your venison and burgundy abuse the generous giver of the feast i am sure i merit a good name and a high reputation in ireland at least where my generosity was unbounded and the splendor of my mansion and entertainments unequaled by any other nobleman of my time as long as my magnificence lasted, all the country was free to partake of it. I had hunters sufficient in my stables to mount a regiment of dragoons, and butts of wine in my cellar which would have made whole counties drunk for years. Castle Linden became the headquarters of scores of needy gentlemen, and I never rode a hunting but I had a dozen young fellows of the best blood of the country riding as my squires and gentlemen of the horse. My son, little Castle Linden, was a prince. His breeding and manners, even at his early age, showed him to be worthy of the two noble families from whom he was descended. I don't know what high hopes I had for the boy, and indulged in a thousand fond anticipations as to his future success and figure in the world. But stern fate had determined that I should leave none of my race behind me, and ordained that I should finish my career, as I see it closing now, poor, lonely, and childless. I may have had my faults, but there is no man shall dare to say of me that I was not a good and tender father. I loved that boy passionately. Perhaps, with a blind partiality, I, I denied him nothing. Gladly, gladly, I swear, would I have died that his premature doom might have been averted. I think there is not a day since I lost him but his bright face and beautiful smiles look down on me out of heaven, where he is, and my heart does not yearn towards him. That sweet child was taken from me at the age of nine years, when he was full of beauty and promise. And so powerful is the hold his memory has of me that I have never been able to forget him. His little spirit haunts me of nights on my restless, solitary pillow. Many a time, in the wildest and maddest company, as the bottle is going round and the song and laugh roaring about, I am thinking of him. I've got a lock of his soft brown hair hanging round my breast now. It will accompany me to the dishonored pauper's grave, where soon, no doubt, Barry Linden's worn-out old bones will be laid. Mr. Bryan was a boy of amazing high spirit. Indeed, how, coming from such a stock, could he be otherwise? Impatient even of my control, against which the dear little rogue would often rebel gallantly, how much more, then, of his mother's and the women's, whose attempts to direct him he would laugh to scorn. Even my own mother, Mrs. Berry of Linden, the good soul now called herself, in compliment to my new family, was quite unable to check him. And hence you may fancy what a will he had of his own. If it had not been for that, he might have lived to this day. He might. But why repine? Is he not in a better place? Would the heritage of a beggar do any service to him? It is best as it is. Heaven be good to us. Alas, that I, his father, should be left to deplore him. It was in the month of October I had been to Dublin in order to see a lawyer and a moneyed man who had come over to Ireland to consult with me about some sales of mine and the cut of Hackton timber, of which, as I hated the place and was greatly in want of money, I determined to cut down every stick. There had been some difficulty in the matter. It was said I had no right to touch the timber. 
the brute peasantry about the estate had been roused to such a pitch of hatred against me that the rascals actually refused to lay an axe to the trees and my agent that scoundrel larkins declared that his life was in danger among them if he attempted any further despoilment as they called it of the property every article of the splendid furniture was sold by this time as i need not say and as for the plate i had taken good care to bring it off to ireland where it was now in the best of keeping my bankers who had advanced six thousand pounds on it which sum i soon had occasion for i went to dublin then to meet the english man of business and so far succeeded in persuading mr splint a great shipbuilder and timber dealer of plymouth of my claim to the hackton timber that he agreed to purchase it off-hand at about one-third of its value and handed me over five thousand pounds which being pressed with debts at the time i was fain to accept he had no difficulty in getting down the wood i warrant he took a regiment of shipwrights and sawyers from his own and the king's yards at plymouth and in two months hackton park was as bare of trees as the bog of allen i had but ill luck with that accursed expedition and money i lost the greater part of it in two nights play at dailies so that my debts stood just as they were before and before the vessel sailed for holyhead which carried away my old sharper of a timber merchant all that i had left of the money he brought me was a couple of hundred pounds with which i returned home very disconsolately and suddenly too for my dublin tradesmen were hot upon me hearing i had spent the loan and two of my wine merchants had writs out against me for some thousands of pounds i bought in dublin according to my promise however for when i give a promise i will keep it at any sacrifices a little horse for my dear little brian which was to be a present for his tenth birthday that was now coming on it was a beautiful little animal and stood me in a good sum i never regarded money for that dear child but the horse was very wild he kicked off one of my horse boys who rode him at first and broke the lad's leg and though I took the animal in hand on the journey home, it was only my weight and skill that made the brute quiet. When we got home, I sent the horse away with one of my grooms to a farmer's house to break him thoroughly in, and told Brian, who was all anxiety to see his little horse, that he would arrive by his birthday, when he should hunt him along with my hounds, and I promised myself no small pleasure in presenting the dear fellow to the field that day which I hoped to see him lead some time or other in the place of his fond father. Ah, me! Never was that gallant boy to ride a fox chase, or to take the place amongst the gentry of his country, which his birth and genius had pointed out for him. Though I don't believe in dreams and omens, yet I can't but own that when a great calamity is hanging over a man, he has frequently many strange and awful forebodings of it. I fancy now I had many. Lady Linden, especially, dreamed of her son's death. But as she was now grown uncommonly nervous and vaporish, I treated her fears with scorn, and my own, of course, too. And in an unguarded moment, over the bottle after dinner, I told poor Brian, who was always questioning me about the little horse and when it was to come, that it was arrived, that it was in Doolan's farm, where Mick the groom was breaking him in. "'Promise me, Brian,' screamed his mother, "'that you will not ride the horse except in company of your father.' But I only said, "Pooh, madam, you're an ass!' Being angry at her silly timidity, which was always showing itself in a thousand disagreeable ways now, and turning round to brian said i promise your lordship a good flogging if you mount him without my leave i suppose the poor child did not care about paying this penalty for the pleasure he was to have or possibly thought a fond father would remit the punishment altogether for the next morning when i rose rather late having 
sat up drinking the night before. I found the child had been off at daybreak, having slipped through his tutor's room. This was Redmond Quinn, our cousin, who I had taken to live with me, and I had no doubt but that he was gone to Doolin's farm. I took a great horsewhip and galloped off after him in a rage, swearing I would keep my promise. But, heaven forgive me, I thought little of it when at three miles from home I met a sad procession coming towards me, peasants moaning and howling as our Irish do, the black horse led by the hand, and on a door that some of the folk carried, my poor, dear, dear little boy. There he lay in his little boots and spurs, and his little coat of scarlet and gold. His dear face was quite white, and he smiled as he held a hand out to me, and said painfully, You won't whip me, will you, papa? I only burst out into tears in reply. I have seen many and many a man dying, and there's a look about the eyes which you cannot mistake. There was a little drummer boy I was fond of who was hit down before my company at Kunersdorf. When I ran up to give him some water, he looked exactly like my dear Brian then did. There's no mistaking that awful look of the eyes. We carried him home and scoured the country round for doctors to come and look at his hurt. But what does a doctor avail in a contest with the grim, invincible enemy? Such as came could only confirm our despair by their account of the poor child's case. He had mounted his horse gallantly, sat him bravely all the time the animal plunged and kicked, and, having overcome his first spite, ran him at a hedge by the roadside. But there were loose stones at the top, and the horse's foot caught among them, and he and his brave little rider rolled over together at the other side. The people said they saw the noble little boy spring up after his fall and run to catch the horse, which had broken away from him, kicking him on the back, as it would seem, as they lay on the ground. Poor Brian ran a few yards, and then dropped down as if shot, a pallor came over his face, and they thought he was dead. But they poured whiskey down his mouth, and the poor child revived. Still, he could not move. His spine was injured. The lower half of him was dead when they laid him in bed at home. The rest did not last long. God help me. He remained yet for two days with us and a sad comfort it was to think he was in no pain. During this time, the dear angel's temper seemed quite to change. He asked his mother and me pardon for any act of disobedience he had been guilty of towards us. He said often he should like to see his brother Bullingdon. Bully was better than you, papa, he said. He used not to swear so and he told and taught me many good things while you were away. And, taking a hand of his mother and mine in each of his little clammy ones, he begged us not to quarrel so, but love each other, so that we might meet again in heaven, where Bully told him quarrelsome people never went. His mother was very much affected by these admonitions from the poor suffering angel's mouth, and I was so too. I wish she had enabled me to keep the counsel which the dying boy gave us. At last, after two days, he died. There he lay, the hope of my family, the pride of my manhood, the link which had kept me and my Lady Linden together. Oh, Redmond, said she, kneeling by the sweet child's body. Do, do let us listen to the truth out of his blessed mouth. And do you amend your life and treat your poor, loving, fond wife as her dying child bade you? 
and I said I would. But there are promises which it is out of a man's power to keep, especially with such a woman as her. But we drew together after that sad event, and were for several months better friends. I won't tell you with what splendor we buried him. Of what avail are undertaker's feather and herald's trumpery? I went out and shot the fatal black horse that had killed him at the door of the vault where I laid my boy. I was so wild that I could have shot myself, too. But for the crime, it would have been better that I should, perhaps. For what has my life been since that sweet flower was taken out of my bosom? A succession of miseries, wrongs, disasters, and mental and bodily sufferings which never fell to the lot of any other man in Christendom. Lady Linden, always vaporish and nervous, after our blessed boy's catastrophe became more agitated than ever, and plunged into devotion with so much fervor that you would have fancied her almost distracted at times. She imagined she saw visions. She said an angel from heaven had told her that Brian's death was a punishment to her for her neglect of her firstborn. Then she would declare Bullingdon was alive. She had seen him in a dream. Then she would fall into fits of sorrow about his death, and grieve for him as violently as if he had been the last of her sons who had died, and not our darling Brian, who, compared to Bullingdon, was what a diamond is to a vulgar stone. Her freaks were painful to witness and difficult to control. It began to be said in the country that the Countess was going mad. My scoundrelly enemies did not fail to confirm and magnify the rumor, and would add that I was the cause of her insanity. I had driven her to distraction. I had killed Bullingdon. I had murdered my own son. I don't know what else they laid to my charge. Even in Ireland their hateful calumnies reached me. My friends fell away from me. They began to desert my hunt, as they did in England, and when I went to race or market found sudden reasons for getting out of my neighborhood. I got the name of Wicked Barry, Devil Linden, which you please. The country folk used to make marvelous legends about me. The priests said I had massacred I don't know how many German nuns in the Seven Years' War, that the ghost of the murdered Bullingdon haunted my house. Once at a fair in a town hard by, when I had a mind to buy a waistcoat for one of my people, a fellow standing by said, "'Tis a straight waistcoat he's buying for my Lady Linden." And from this circumstance arose a legend of my cruelty to my wife, and many circumstantial details were narrated regarding my manner and ingenuity of torturing her. The loss of my dear boy pressed not only on my heart as a father, but injured my individual interests in a very considerable degree, for as there was now no direct heir to the estate, and Lady Linden was of a weak health and supposed to be quite unlikely to leave a family, the next in succession, that detestable family of Tiptoff, began to exert themselves in a hundred ways to annoy me and were at the head of a party of enemies who were raising reports to my discredit. They interposed between me and my management of the property in a hundred different ways, making an outcry if I cut a stick, sunk a shaft, sold a picture, or sent a few ounces of plate to be remodeled. They harassed me with ceaseless lawsuits, got injunctions from chancery, hampered my agents in the execution of their work, so much so you would have fancied that my own was not my own, but theirs, to do as they liked with. What is worse, as I have reason to believe, they had tamperings and dealings with my own domestics under my own roof, for I could not now have a word with Lady Linden, but it somehow got abroad, and I could not be drunk with my chaplain and friends, but some sanctified rascals would get hold of the news, and reckon up all the bottles I drank and all the oaths I swore. 
These were not few, I acknowledge. I am of the old school, was always a free liver and speaker, and least, if I did and said what I liked, was not so bad as many a canting scoundrel I know, who covers his foibles and sins, unsuspected with the mask of holiness. As I am making a clean breast of it, and am no hypocrite, I may as well confess now that I endeavored to ward off the devices of my enemies by an artifice which was not, perhaps, strictly justifiable. Everything depended on my having an heir to the estate, for if Lady Linden, who was of weakly health, had died, the next day I was a beggar. All my sacrifices of money, etc., on the estate would not have been held in a farthing's account. All the debts would have been left on my shoulders, and my enemies would have triumphed over me, which to a man of my honorable spirit was the unkindest cut of all, as some poet says. I confess, then, it was my wish to supplant these scoundrels, and as I could not do so without an heir to my property, I determined to find one. If I had him near at hand, and of my own blood, too, though with the bar sinister, is not here the question. It was then I found out the rascally machinations of my enemies, for having broached this plan to Lady Linden, whom I made to be, outwardly at least, the most obedient of wives, although I never let a letter from her or to her go or arrive without my inspection, although I allowed her to see none but those persons who I thought, in her delicate health, would be fitting society for her, Yet the infernal Tiptoffs got wind of my scheme, protested instantly against it, not only by letter, but in the shameful, libelous, public prints, and held me up to public odium as a child-forger, as they called me. Of course I denied the charge. I could do no otherwise, and offered to meet any one of the Tiptoffs on the field of honor and prove him a scoundrel and a liar. As he was though perhaps not in this instance. But they contented themselves by answering me by a lawyer, and declined an invitation which any man of spirit would have accepted. My hopes of having an heir were thus blighted completely. Indeed, Lady Linden, though, as I have said, I take her opposition for nothing, had resisted the proposal with as much energy as a woman of her weakness could manifest and said she had committed one great crime in consequence of me, but would rather die than perform another. I could easily have brought her ladyship to her senses, however. But my scheme had taken wind, and it was now in vain to attempt it. We might have had a dozen children in honest wedlock, and people would have said they were false. As for raising money on annuities, I must say I had used her life interest up. There were but few of those assurance societies in my time, which have since sprung up in the city of London. Underwriters did the business, and my wife's life was as well known among them as I do believe that of any woman in Christendom. Latterly, when I wanted to get a sum against her life, the rascals had the impudence to say my treatment of her did not render it worth a year's purchase, as if my interest lay in killing her. Had my boy lived, it would have been a different thing. He and his mother might have cut off the entail of a good part of the property between them, and my affairs have been put in better order. Now they were in a bad condition indeed. All my schemes had turned out failures. My lands, which I had purchased with borrowed money, made me no return and I was obliged to pay ruinous interest for the sums with which I had purchased them. My income, though very large, was saddled with hundreds of annuities and thousands of lawyers' charges, and I felt the net drawing closer and closer round me, and no means to extricate myself from its toils. To add to all my perplexities, Two years after my poor child's death, my wife, 
whose vagaries of temper and wayward follies I had borne with for twelve years, wanted to leave me, and absolutely made attempts at what she called escaping from my tyranny. My mother, who was the only person that, in my misfortunes, remained faithful to me, indeed she has always spoken of me in my true light, as a martyr to the rascality of others and a victim of my own generous and confiding temper, found out the first scheme that was going on, and of which those artful and malicious tip-toffs were, as usual, the main promoters. Mrs. Barry, indeed, though her temper was violent and her ways singular, was an invaluable person to me in my house which would have been at rack and ruin long before, but for her spirit of order and management, and for her excellent economy in the government of my numerous family. As for my Lady Linden, she, poor soul, was much too fine a lady to attend to household matters, passed her days with her doctor or her books of piety, and never appeared among us except at my compulsion when she and my mother would be sure to have a quarrel. Mrs. Barry, on the contrary, had a talent for management in all matters. She kept the maids stirring and the footmen to their duty, had an eye over the claret in the cellar and the oats and hay in the stable, saw to the salting and pickling, the potatoes and the turf stacking, the pig killing and the poultry, the linen room and the bakehouse, and the ten thousand minutiae of a great establishment. If all Irish housewives were like her, I warrant many a hall fire would be blazing where the cobwebs only grow now, and many a park covered with sheep and fat cattle where the thistles are at present the chief occupiers. If anything could have saved me from the consequences of villainy in others, and... I confess it, for I am not above owning to my faults my own easy, generous, and careless nature. It would have been the amiable prudence of that worthy creature. She never went to bed until all the house was quiet and all the candles out, and you may fancy that this was a matter of some difficulty with a man of my habits, who had commonly a dozen of jovial fellows, artful scoundrels and false friends, most of them were, to drink with me every night, and who seldom for my part went to bed sober. Many and many a night when I was unconscious of her attention has that good soul pulled my boots off, and seen me laid by my servants snug in bed, and carried off the candle herself, and been the first in the morning, too, to bring me my drink of small beer. Mine were no milksop times, I can tell you, a gentleman thought no shame of taking his half-dozen bottles, and as for your coffee and slops, they were left to Lady Linden, her doctor, and the other old women. It was my mother's pride that I could drink more than any man in the country, as much within a pint as my father before me, she said. That Lady Linden should detest her was quite natural. She is not the first of woman, or mankind either, that has hated a mother-in-law. I set my mother to keep a sharp watch over the freaks of her ladyship, and this, you may be sure, was one of the reasons why the latter disliked her. I never minded that, however. Mrs. Barry's assistance and surveillance was invaluable to me, and if I had paid twenty spies to watch my lady, I should not have been half so well served as by the disinterested care and watchfulness of my excellent mother. She slept with the house keys under her pillow, and had an eye everywhere. She followed all the countess's movements like a shadow. She managed to know, from morning to night, everything that my lady did. If she walked in the garden, a watchful eye was kept on the wicket, and if she chose to drive out, Mrs. Barry accompanied her, and a couple of fellows in my liveries rode alongside of the carriage to see that she came to no harm. Though she objected, 
and would have kept her room in sullen silence, I made a point that we should appear together at church in the coach and six every Sunday, and that she should attend the race balls in my company, whenever the coast was clear of the rascally bailiffs who beset me. This gave the lie to any of those maligners who said I wished to make a prisoner of my wife. The fact is that, knowing her levity and seeing the insane dislike to me and mine, which had now begun to supersede what, perhaps, had been an equally insane fondness for me, I was bound to be on my guard that she should not give me the slip. Had she left me, I was ruined the next day. This, which my mother knew, compelled us to keep a tight watch over her. But as for imprisoning her, I repel the imputation with scorn. Every man imprisons his wife to a certain degree. The world would be in a pretty condition if women were allowed to quit home and return to it whenever they had a mind. In watching over my wife, Lady Linden, I did no more than exercise the legitimate authority which awards honor and obedience to every husband. Such, however, is female artifice, that in spite of all my watchfulness in guarding her, it is probable my lady would have given me the slip, had I not quite as acute a person as herself as my ally. For, as the proverb says that, the best way to catch one thief is to set another after him. So, the best way to get the better of a woman is to engage one of her own artful sex, to guard her. One would have thought that, followed as she was, all her letters read and all her acquaintances strictly watched by me, living in a remote part of Ireland away from her family, Lady Linden could have had no chance of communicating with her allies, or of making her wrongs, as she was pleased to call them, public. And yet, for a while, she carried on a correspondence under my very nose, and acutely organized a conspiracy for flying from me, as shall be told. End of chapter 19, part 1chapter 19 part 2 of the memoirs of barry linden esq by william makepeace thackeray this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter 19 conclusion part 2 she always had an inordinate passion for dress and as she was never thwarted in any whimsy she had of this kind for i would spare no money to gratify her and among my debts are milliner's bills to the amount of many thousands. Boxes used to pass continually to and fro from Dublin, with all sorts of dresses, caps, flounces, and furbelows, as her fancy dictated. With these would come letters from her milliner, in answer to numerous similar injunctions from my lady, all of which passed through my hands, without the least suspicion, for some time. And yet, in these very papers, by the easy means of sympathetic ink, were contained all her ladyship's correspondence. And heaven knows, for it was some time, as I have said, before I discovered the trick, what charges against me. But clever Mrs. Berry found out that always before my lady wife chose to write letters to her milliner, she had need of lemons to make her drink, as she said. This fact, being mentioned to me, set me a-thinking, and so I tried one of the letters before the fire, and the whole scheme of villainy was brought to light. I will give a specimen of one of the horrid, artful letters of this unhappy woman. In a great hand, with wide lines, were written a set of directions to her mantua-maker, setting forth the articles of dress for which my lady had need, the peculiarity of their make, the stuff she selected, etc. She would make out long lists in this way, writing each article in a separate line, so as to have more space for detailing all my cruelties and her tremendous wrongs. 
Between these lines she kept the journal of her captivity. It would have made a fortune of a romance writer in those days but to have got a copy of it, and to have published it under the title of The Lovely Prisoner, or The Savage Husband, or by some name equally taking and absurd. The journal would be as follows. Monday. Yesterday I was made to go to church. My odious, monstrous, vulgar she-dragon of a mother-in-law, in a yellow satin and red ribbons, taking the first place in the coach, Mr. L. riding by its side, on the horse he never paid for to Captain Hurdleston. The wicked hypocrite led me to the pew, with hat in hand and a smiling countenance, and kissed my hand as I entered the coach after service, and patted my Italian greyhound. All that the few people collected might see. He made me come downstairs in the evening to make tea for his company, of whom three-fourths, he himself included, were, as usual, drunk. They painted the parson's face black when his reverence had arrived at his seventh bottle, and at his usual insensible stage they tied him on the grey mare with his face to the tail. The she-dragon read the whole duty of man all the evening till bedtime, when she saw me to my apartments, locked me in, and proceeded to wait upon her abominable son, whom she adores for his wickedness, I should think, as Sycorax did Caliban. You should have seen my mother's fury as I read her out this passage. Indeed, I have always had a taste for a joke. That practiced on the parson as described above is, I confess, a true pill, and used carefully to select for Mrs. Berry's hearing all the compliments that Lady Linden passed upon her. The dragon was the name by which she was known in this precious correspondence or sometimes she was designated by the title of the Irish Witch. As for me, I was denominated my jailer, my tyrant, the dark spirit which has obtained the mastery over my being, and so on, in terms always complimentary to my power, however little they might be so to my amiability. Here is another extract from her prison diary from which it will be seen that my lady, although she pretended to be so indifferent to my goings-on, had a sharp woman's eye, and could be as jealous as another. Wednesday. This day two years my last hope and pleasure in life was taken from me, and my dear child was called to heaven. Has he joined his neglected brother there, whom I suffered to grow up, unheeded, by my side? and whom the tyranny of the monster to whom I am united drove to exile, and perhaps to death? Or is the child alive, as my fond heart sometimes deems? Charles Bullingdon, come to the aid of a wretched mother who acknowledges her crimes, her coldness towards thee, and now bitterly pays for her error. But no, he cannot live, I am distracted. My only hope is in you, my cousin, you whom I had once thought to salute by a still fonder title, my dear George Poynings. Oh, be my knight and preserver, the true chivalric being thou ever wert, and rescue me from the thrall of the felon caitiff who holds me captive, rescue me from him and from Sycorax, the vile Irish witch, his mother. Here follow some verses, such as her ladyship was in the habit of composing by reams, in which she compares herself to Sabra in The Seven Champions, and beseeches her George to rescue her from the dragon, meaning Mrs. Berry. I omit the lines, and proceed. Even my poor child, who perished untimely on this sad anniversary, the tyrant who governs me had taught to despise and dislike me. T'was in disobedience to my orders, my prayers, that he went on the fatal journey. What sufferings, 
what humiliations have I had to endure since then? I am a prisoner in my own halls. I should fear poison but that I know the wretch has a sordid interest in keeping me alive, and that my death would be the signal for his ruin. But I dare not stir without my odious, hideous, vulgar jailer, the horrid Irish woman who pursues my every step. I am locked into my chamber at night like a felon, and only suffered to leave it when ordered into the presence of my lord. I ordered to be present at his orgies with his boon companions, and to hear his odious converse as he lapses into the disgusting madness of intoxication. He has given up even the semblance of constancy. He who swore that I alone could attach or charm him. And now he brings his vulgar mistresses before my very eyes, and would have had me acknowledge, as heir to my own property, his child by another. No, I never will submit. Thou, and thou only, my George, my early friend, shalt be heir to the estates of Lyndon. Why did not fate join me to thee, instead of to the odious man who holds me under his sway, and make the poor Callista happy? So the letters would run on for sheets upon sheets, in the closest cramped handwriting, and I leave any unprejudiced reader to say whether the writer of such documents must not have been as silly and vain a creature as ever lived and whether she did not want being taken care of. I could copy out yards of rhapsody to Lord George Poynings, her old flame, in which she addressed him by the most affectionate names, and implored him to find a refuge for her against her oppressors. But they would fatigue the reader to peruse, as they would me to copy. The fact is, that this unlucky woman had the knack of writing a great deal more than she meant. She was always reading novels and trash, putting herself into imaginary characters and flying off into heroics and sentimentalities with as little heart as any woman I ever knew, yet showing the most violent disposition to be in love. She wrote, always, as if she was in a flame of passion. I have an elegy on her lapdog the most tender and pathetic piece she ever wrote, and most tender notes of remonstrance to Betty, her favorite maid, to her housekeeper, on quarreling with her, to half a dozen acquaintances, each of whom she addressed as the dearest friend in the world, and forgot the very moment she took up another fancy. As for her love of her children, the above passage will show how much she was capable of true maternal feeling. The very sentence in which she records the death of one child serves to betray her egotisms and to wreak her spleen against myself, and she only wishes to recall another from the grave in order that he may be of some personal advantage to her. If I did deal severely with this woman, keeping her from her flatterers who would have bred discord between us, and locking her up out of mischief, who shall say that I was wrong? If any woman deserved a straight waistcoat, it was my Lady Linden. And I have known people in my time, manacled, with their heads shaved in the straw, who had not committed half the follies of that foolish, vain, infatuated creature. My mother was so enraged by the charges against me and herself which these letters contained, that it was with the utmost difficulty I could keep her from discovering our knowledge of them to Lady Linden, whom it was, of course, my object to keep in ignorance of our knowledge of her designs, for I was anxious to know how far they went and to what pitch of artifice she would go. The letters increased in interest, as they say of the novels, as they proceeded. Pictures were drawn of my treatment of her which would make your heart throb, I don't know of what monstrosities she did not accuse me, and what miseries and starvation she did not profess herself to undergo. All the while she was living exceedingly fat and contented, to outward appearances, at our house at Castle Linden. Novel reading, 
and vanity had turned her brain. I could not say a rough word to her, and she merited many thousands a day, I can tell you, but she declared I was putting her to the torture, and my mother could not remonstrate with her, but she went off into a fit of hysterics, of which she would declare the worthy old lady was the cause. At last she began to threaten to kill herself, and though I by no means kept the cutlery out of the way, did not stint her in garters and left her doctor's shop at her entire service, knowing her character full well and that there was no woman in Christendom less likely to lay hands on her precious life than herself, yet these threats had an effect, evidently, in the quarter to which they were addressed, for the milliner's packets now began to arrive with great frequency, and the bills sent to her contained assurances of coming aid. The chivalrous Lord George Poynings was coming to his cousin's rescue, and did me the compliment to say that he hoped to free his dear cousin from the clutches of the most atrocious villain that had ever disgraced humanity, and that, when she was free, measures should be taken for a divorce, on the ground of cruelty and every species of ill-usage on my part. I had copies of all these precious documents on one side, and the other carefully made, by my before-mentioned relative, godson, and secretary, Mr. Redmond Quinn, at present the worthy agent of the Castle Linden property. This was a son of my old flame, Nora, whom I had taken from her in a fit of generosity, promising to care for his education at Trinity College and provide for him through life. But after the lad had been for a year at the university, the tutors would not admit him to commons or lectures until his college bills were paid, and, offended by this insolent manner of demanding the paltry sum due, I withdrew my patronage from the place and ordered my gentleman to Castle Linden, where I made him useful to me in a hundred ways. In my dear little boy's lifetime he tutored the poor child as far as his high spirit would let him but I promise you it was small trouble poor dear Brian ever gave the books. Then he kept Mrs. Berry's accounts, copied my own interminable correspondence with my lawyers and the agents of all my various property, took a hand at piquet or backgammon of evenings with me and my mother, or, being an ingenious lad enough, though of a mean, boorish spirit as became the son of such a father, accompanied my Lady Linden's spinet with his flagellet, or read French and Italian with her, in both of which languages her ladyship was a fine scholar, and with which he also became conversant. It would make my watchful old mother very angry to hear them conversing in these languages, for, not understanding a word of either of them, Mrs. Berry was furious when they were spoken, and always said it was some scheming they were after. It was Lady Linden's constant way of annoying the old lady when the three were alone together to address Quinn in one or other of these tongues. I was perfectly at ease with regard to his fidelity, for I had bred the lad and loaded him with benefits, and besides had had various proofs of his trustworthiness. He it was who brought me three of Lord George's letters in reply to some of my lady's complaints which were concealed between the leather and the boards of a book which was sent from the circulating library for her ladyship's perusal. He and my lady, too, had frequent quarrels. She mimicked his gait in her pleasanter moments. In her haughty moods she would not sit down to table with the tailor's grandson. "'Send me anything for company but that odious Quinn,' she would say when I proposed that he should go and amuse her with his books and his flute. For, quarrelsome as we were, it must not be supposed we were always at it. I was occasionally attentive to her. We would be friends for a month together sometimes. Then we would quarrel for a fortnight. Then she would keep her apartments for a month. All of which domestic circumstances were noted down in her ladyship's peculiar way in her journal of captivity, as she called it, and a pretty document it is. 
Sometimes, she writes, my monster has been almost kind today, or my ruffian has deigned to smile. Then she will break out into expressions of savage hate. But for my poor mother it was always hatred. It was, the she-dragon is sick today, I wish to heaven she would die, or the hideous old Irish basket woman has been treating me to some of her Billingsgate today, and so forth. All which expressions, read to Mrs. Berry, or translated from the French and Italian, in which many of them were written, did not fail to keep the old lady in a perpetual fury against her charge. And so I had my watchdog, as I called her, always on the alert. In translating these languages, Quinn was of great service to me, for I had a smattering of French, and High Dutch when in the army, of course, I knew well, but Italian I knew nothing of, and was glad of the services of so faithful and cheap an interpreter. This cheap and faithful interpreter, this godson and kinsman, on whom and on whose family I had piled up benefits, was actually trying to betray me, and for several months at least was in league with the enemy against me. I believe that the reason why they did not move earlier was the want of the great mover of all treasons, money, of which, in all parts of my establishment, there was a woeful scarcity. But of this they also managed to get a supply, through my rascal of a godson, who could come and go quite unsuspected. The whole scheme was arranged under our very noses, and the post-chaise ordered, and the means of escape actually got ready, while I never suspected their design. A mere accident made me acquainted with their plan. One of my colliers had a pretty daughter, and this pretty lass had for her bachelor, as they call them in Ireland, a certain lad who brought the letter-bag for Castle Linden, and many a dunning letter for me was there in it, God wot. The letter-boy told his sweetheart how he brought a bag of money from the town for Master Quinn, and how that Tim the post-boy had told him that he was to bring a chaise down to the water at a certain hour. Miss Rooney, who had no secrets from me, blurted out the whole story, asked me what scheming I was after and what poor unlucky girl I was going to carry away with the chaise I had ordered, and bribe with the money I had got from town. Then the whole secret flashed upon me, that the man I had cherished in my bosom was going to betray me. I thought at one time of catching the couple in the act of escape, half drowning them in the ferry which they had to cross to get to their chaise, and of pistoling the young traitor before Lady Linden's eyes, but, on second thoughts, it was quite clear that the news of the escape would make a noise through the country, and rouse the confounded justice's people about my ears, and bring me no good in the end. So I was obliged to smother my just indignation, and to content myself by crushing the foul conspiracy, just at the moment it was about to be hatched. I went home, and in half an hour and with a few of my terrible looks, I had Lady Linden on her knees, begging me to forgive her, confessing all and everything, ready to vow and swear she would never make such an attempt again, and declaring that she was fifty times on the point of owning everything to me, but that she feared my wrath against the poor young lad her accomplice, who was indeed the author and inventor of all the mischief. This though I knew how entirely false the statement was, I was fain to pretend to believe. So I begged her to write to her cousin, Lord George, who had supplied her with money as she admitted, and with whom the plan had been arranged, stating briefly that she had altered her mind as to the trip to the country proposed, and that, as her dear husband was rather in delicate health, she preferred to stay at home and nurse him. I added a dry postscript, in which I stated that it would give me great pleasure if his lordship would come and visit us at Castle Linden, and that I longed to renew an acquaintance which, in former times, 
gave me so much satisfaction. I should seek him out, I added, so soon as ever I was in his neighborhood, and eagerly anticipated the pleasure of a meeting with him. I think he must have understood my meaning perfectly well, which was that I would run him through the body on the very first occasion I could come at him. Then I had a scene with my perfidious rascal of a nephew, in which the young reprobate showed an audacity and a spirit for which I was quite unprepared. When I taxed him with ingratitude, "'What do I owe you?' said he. "'I have toiled for you as no man ever did for another, and worked without a penny of wages. It was you yourself who set me against you, by giving me a task against which my soul revolted, by making me a spy over your unfortunate wife, whose weakness is as pitiable as are her misfortunes and your rascally treatment of her. Flesh and blood could not bear to see the manner in which you used her. I tried to help her to escape from you, and I would do it again if the opportunity offered, and so I tell you to your teeth. When I offered to blow his brains out for insolence, Pooh, said he, Kill the man who saved your poor boy's life once, and who was endeavoring to keep him out of the ruin and perdition into which a wicked father was leading him when a merciful power interposed and withdrew him from this house of crime? I would have left you months ago, but I hoped for some chance of rescuing this unhappy lady. I swore I would try, the day I saw you strike her. Kill me, you woman's bully! You would if you dared but you have not the heart. Your very servants like me better than you. Touch me, and they will rise and send you to the gallows you merit. I interrupted this neat speech by sending a water bottle at the young gentleman's head, which felled him to the ground. And then I went to meditate upon what he had said to me. It was true the fellow had saved poor little Brian's life, and the boy to his dying day was tenderly attached to him. Be good to Redmond, papa, were almost the last words he spoke, and I promised the poor child on his deathbed that I would do as he asked. It was also true that rough usage of him would be little liked by my people, with whom he had managed to become a great favorite, for somehow, Though I got drunk with the rascals often and was much more familiar with them than a man of my rank commonly is, yet I knew I was by no means liked by them, and the scoundrels were murmuring against me perpetually. But I might have spared myself the trouble of debating what his fate should be, for the young gentleman took the disposal of it out of my hands in the simplest way in the world, viz. by washing and binding up his head so soon as he came to himself, by taking his horse from the stables, and, as he was quite free to go in and out of the house and park as he liked, he disappeared without the least let or hindrance, and, leaving the horse behind him at the ferry, went off in the very post-chaise which was waiting for Lady Linden. I saw and heard no more of him for a considerable time, and now that he was out of the house did not consider him a very troublesome enemy. But the cunning artifice of woman is such that, I think, in the long run, no man, were he Machiavel himself, could escape it. And though I had ample proofs in the above transaction, in which my wife's perfidious designs were frustrated by my foresight, and under her handwriting of the deceitfulness of her character and her hatred for me, yet she actually managed to deceive me, in spite of all my precautions and the vigilance of my mother in my behalf. Had I followed that good lady's advice, who scented the danger from afar off, as it were, I should never have fallen into the snare prepared for me, and which was laid in a way that was as successful as it was simple. My Lady Linden's relation with me was a singular one. Her life was passed in a cracked brain sort of alternation between love and hatred for me. If I was in a good humor with her, as occurred sometimes, there was nothing she would not do to propitiate me further, 
and she would be as absurd and violent in her expressions of fondness as, at other moments, she would be in her demonstrations of hatred. It is not your feeble, easy husbands who are loved best in the world, according to my experience of it. I do think the women like a little violence of temper, and think no worse of a husband who exercises his authority pretty smartly. I had got my lady into such a terror about me that when I smiled it was quite an era of happiness to her, and if I beckoned to her she would come fawning up to me like a dog. I recollect how, for the few days I was at school, the cowardly mean-spirited fellows would laugh if ever our schoolmaster made a joke. It was the same in the regiment whenever the bully of a sergeant was disposed to be jocular. Not a recruit but was on the broad grin. Well, a wise and determined husband will get his wife into this condition of discipline, and I brought my high-born wife to kiss my hand, to pull off my boots, to fetch and carry for me like a servant, and always to make it a holiday, too, when I was in good humor. I confided perhaps too much in the duration of this disciplined obedience, and forgot that the very hypocrisy which forms a part of it all timid people are liars in their hearts, may be exerted in a way that may be far from agreeable, in order to deceive you. After the ill success of her last adventure, which gave me endless opportunities to banter her, one would have thought I might have been on my guard as to what her real intentions were, but she managed to mislead me with an art of dissimulation quite admirable and lulled me into a fatal security with regard to her intentions. For one day, as I was joking her and asking her whether she would take the water again, whether she had found another lover and so forth, she suddenly burst into tears and, seizing hold of my hand, cried passionately out, Ah, Barry, you know well enough that I have never loved but you. Was I ever so wretched that a kind word from you did not make me happy? ever so angry that the least offer of good will on your part did not bring me to your side? Did I not give you a sufficient proof of my affection for you in bestowing one of the first fortunes in England upon you? Have I repined or rebuked you for the way you have wasted it? No, I loved you too much and too fondly. I have always loved you. From the first moment I saw you, I felt irresistibly attracted towards you. I saw your bad qualities and trembled at your violence, but I could not help loving you. I married you, though I knew I was sealing my fate in doing so, and in spite of reason and duty. What sacrifice do you want from me? I am ready to make any, so you will but love me, or, if not, that at least you will gently use me. I was in a particularly good humor that day, and we had a sort of reconciliation. Though my mother, when she heard the speech, and saw me softening towards her ladyship, warned me solemnly, and said, Depend upon it, the artful hussy has some other scheme in her head now. The old lady was right, and I swallowed the bait which her ladyship had prepared to entrap me as simply as any gudgeon takes a hook. I had been trying to negotiate with a man for some money, for which I had pressing occasion, but since our dispute regarding the affair of the succession, my lady had resolutely refused to sign any papers for my advantage, and without her name, I am sorry to say, my own was of little value in the market, and I could not get a guinea from any money dealer in London or Dublin, nor could I get the rascals from the latter place to visit me at Castle Linden owing to that unlucky affair I had with Lawyer Sharp, when I made him lend me the money he brought down, and old Salmon the Jew, robbed of the bond I gave him after leaving my house. The people would not trust themselves within my walls any more. Footnote. These exploits of Mr. Linden are not related in the narrative. He probably, in the cases above alluded to, took the law, into his own hands. End footnote. Our rents, too, were in the hands of receivers by this time, 
and it was as much as I could do to get enough money from the rascals to pay my wine merchants for their bills. Our English property, as I have said, was equally hampered, and, as often as I applied to my lawyers and agents for money, would come a reply demanding money of me, for debts and pretended claims which the rapacious rascals said they had on me. It was, then, with some feelings of pleasure that I got a letter from my confidential man in Gray's in London, saying, in reply to some ninety-ninth demand of mine, that he thought he could get me some money, and enclosing a letter from a respectable firm in the city of London, connected with the mining interest, which offered to redeem the encumbrance in taking a long lease of certain property of ours, which was still pretty free, upon the countess's signature, and provided they could be assured of her free will in giving it. They said they heard she lived in terror of her life from me, and meditated a separation, in which case she might repudiate any deeds signed by her well endurance, and subject them at any rate to a doubtful and expensive litigation, and demanded to be made assured of her ladyship's perfect free will in the transaction before they advanced a shilling of their capital. Their terms were so exorbitant that I saw at once their offer must be sincere, and, as my lady was in her gracious mood, had no difficulty in persuading her to write a letter, in her own hand, declaring that the accounts of our misunderstandings were utter calumnies, that we lived in perfect union, and that she was quite ready to execute any deed which her husband might desire her to sign. The proposal was a very timely one, and filled me with great hopes. I have not pestered my readers with many accounts of my debts and law affairs, which were by this time so vast and complicated that I never thoroughly knew them myself, and was rendered half wild by their urgency. Suffice it to say, my money was gone. My credit was done. I was living at Castle Linden off my own beef and mutton, and the bread, turf, and potatoes off my own estate. I had to watch Lady Linden within, and the bailiffs without. For the last two years, since I went to Dublin to receive money, which I unluckily lost at play there to the disappointment of my creditors, I did not venture to show in that city, and could only appear at our own county town at rare intervals, and because I knew the sheriffs, whom I swore I would murder if any ill chance happened to me. A chance of a good loan, then, was the most welcome prospect possible to me, and I hailed it with all the eagerness imaginable. In reply to Lady Linden's letter came, in course of time, an answer from the confounded London merchants, stating that if her ladyship would confirm by word of mouth at their counting-house in Birchin Lane, London, the statement of her letter, they, having surveyed her property, would no doubt come to terms. But they declined incurring the risk of a visit to Castle Linden to negotiate, as they were aware how other respectable parties, such as Messrs. Sharp and Salmon of Dublin, had been treated there. This was a good hit at me, but there are certain situations in which people can't dictate their own terms, and faith, I was so pressed now for money that I could have signed a bond with old Nick himself if he had come provided with a good round sum. I resolved to go and take the Countess to London, it was in vain that my mother prayed and warned me. Depend on it, she said, there is some artifice. When once you get into that wicked town, you are not safe. Here you may live for years and years in luxury and splendor, barring claret and all the windows broken. But as soon as they have you in London, they'll get the better of my poor innocent lad, and the first thing I shall hear of you will be that you are in trouble. Why go, Redmond? said my wife. I am happy here, as long as you are kind to me as you are now. We can't appear in London as we ought. The little money you will get will be spent, like all the rest has been. Let us turn shepherd and shepherdess, and look to our flocks and be content. And she took my hand and kissed it, while my mother only said, Humph! I believe she's at the bottom of it, the wicked schamer. I told my wife she was a fool, bade Mrs. Berry not be uneasy, 
and was hot upon going. I would take no denial from either party. How I was to get the money to go was the question, but that was solved by my good mother, who was always ready to help me on a pinch, and who produced sixty guineas from a stocking. This was all the ready money that Barry Linden of Castle Linden, and married to a fortune of forty thousand a year, could command. Such had been the havoc made in this fine fortune by my own extravagance, as I must confess, but chiefly by my misplaced confidence and the rascality of others. We did not start in state, you may be sure. We did not let the country know we were going or leave notice of adieu with our neighbors. The famous Mr. Barry Linden and his noble wife traveled in a hack chaise and pair to Waterford under the name of Mr. and Mrs. Jones, and thence took shipping for Bristol, where we arrived quite without accident. When a man is going to the deuce, how easy and pleasant the journey is. The thought of the money quite put me in a good humor, and my wife, as she lay on my shoulder in the post-chaise going to London, said it was the happiest ride she had taken since our marriage. One night we stayed at Reading, whence I dispatched a note to my agent at Gray's Inn, saying I would be with him during the day, and begging him to procure me a lodging, and to hasten the preparations for the loan. My lady and I agreed that we would go to France, and wait there for better times, and that night, over our supper, formed a score of plans both for pleasure and retrenchment. You would have thought it was Darby and Joan together over their supper. Oh, woman! Woman! When I recollect Lady Linden's smiles and blandishments, how happy she seemed to be on that night! What an air of innocent confidence appeared in her behavior, and what affectionate names she called me! I am lost in wonder at the depth of her hypocrisy. Who can be surprised that an unsuspecting person like myself should have been victim to such a consummate deceiver? We were in London at three o'clock, and half an hour before the time appointed, our chaise drove to Gray's Inn. I easily found out Mr. Tapewell's apartments. A gloomy den it was, and in an unlucky hour I entered it. As we went up the dirty back stair, lighted by a feeble lamp and the dim sky of a dismal London afternoon, my wife seemed agitated and faint. Redmond, said she, as we got up to the door. Don't go in. I'm sure there is danger. There is time yet. Let us go back, to Ireland, anywhere. And she put herself before the door, in one of her theatrical attitudes, and took my hand. I just pushed her away to one side. Lady Linden, said I, you're an old fool. Old fool, said she, and she jumped at the bell which was quickly answered by a moldy-looking gentleman in an unpowdered wig, to whom she cried, "'Say Lady Linden is here!' and stalked down the passage muttering, "'Old fool!' It was the old which was the epithet that touched her. I might call her anything but that. Mr. Tapewell was in his musty room, surrounded by his parchments and tin boxes. He advanced and bowed, begged her ladyship to be seated, pointed towards a chair for me which I took, rather wondering at his insolence, and then retreated to a side door, saying he would be back in a moment. And back he did come in one moment, bringing with him, whom do you think, another lawyer, six constables in red waistcoats with bludgeons and pistols, my lord George Poynings, and his aunt, Lady Jane Peckover, when my Lady Linden saw her old flame, she flung herself into his arms in an hysterical passion. She called him her saviour, her preserver, her gallant knight, and then, turning round to me, poured out a flood of invective, which quite astonished me. Old fool as I am, said she, I have outwitted the most crafty and treacherous monster under the sun. Yes, I was a fool when I married you, and gave up other and nobler hearts for your sake. Yes, 
I was a fool when I forgot my name and lineage to unite myself with a base-born adventurer, a fool to bear without repining the most monstrous tyranny that ever woman suffered, to allow my property to be squandered, to see women as base and low-born as yourself. For heaven's sake, be calm, cries the lawyer, and then bounded back behind the constables, seeing a threatening look in my eye which the rascal did not like. Indeed, I could have torn him to pieces had he come near me. Meanwhile, my lady continued in a strain of incoherent fury, screaming against me and against my old mother especially, upon whom she heaped abuse worthy of Billingsgate, and always beginning and ending the sentence with the word fool. "'You don't tell all, my lady,' says I bitterly. I said, old fool. I have no doubt you said and did, sir, everything that a blackguard could say or do, interposed little Poinings. This lady is now safe under the protection of her relations and the law, and need fear your infamous persecutions no longer. But you are not safe, roared I, and, as sure as I am a man of honor and have tasted your blood once, I will have your heart's blood now. Take down his words, constables. Swear the peace against him, screamed the little lawyer from behind his tipstaffs. I would not sully my sword with the blood of such a ruffian, cried my lord, relying on the same doughty protection. If the scoundrel remains in London another day, he will be seized as a common swindler. And this threat indeed made me wince, for I knew that there were scores of writs out against me in town, and that once in prison my case was hopeless. "'Where's the man will seize me?' shouted I, drawing my sword and placing my back to the door. "'Let the scoundrel come. You, you cowardly braggart, come first if you have the soul of a man.' "'We're not going to seize you,' said the lawyer. My ladyship, her aunt, and a division of the bailiffs moving off as he spoke. My dear sir, we don't wish to seize you. We will give you a handsome sum to leave the country. Only leave her ladyship in peace. And the country will be well rid of such a villain, says my lord, retreating too, and not sorry to get out of my reach. And the scoundrel of a lawyer followed him, leaving me in possession of the apartment and in company of the bullies from the police office, who were all armed to the teeth. I was no longer the man I was at twenty when I should have charged the ruffians sword in hand and have sent at least one of them to his account. I was broken in spirit, regularly caught in the toils, utterly baffled and beaten by that woman. Was she relenting at the door? when she paused and begged me turn back? Had she not a lingering love for me still? Her conduct showed it, as I came to reflect on it. It was my only chance now left in the world, so I put down my sword upon the lawyer's desk. Gentlemen, said I, I shall use no violence. You may tell Mr. Tapewell I am quite ready to speak with him when he is at leisure and I sat down and folded my arms quite peaceably. What a change from the Barry Linden of old days! But, as I have read in an old book about Hannibal, the Carthaginian general, when he invaded the Romans, his troops, which were the most gallant in the world and carried all before them, went into cantonments in some city where they were so sated with the luxuries and pleasures of life that they were easily beaten in the next campaign. It was so with me now. My strength of mind and body were no longer those of the brave youth who shot his man at fifteen and fought a score of battles within six years afterwards. Now, in the fleet prison where I write this, there is a small man who is always jeering me and making game of me, who asks me to fight, and I haven't the courage to touch him but I am anticipating the gloomy and wretched events of my history of humiliation, and had better proceed in order. I took a lodging in a coffee-house near Gray's Inn, taking care to inform Mr. Tapewell of my whereabouts, 
and anxiously expecting a visit from him. He came and brought me the terms which Lady Linden's friends proposed, a paltry annuity of three hundred pounds a year, to be paid on the condition of my remaining abroad out of the three kingdoms, and to be stopped on the instant of my return. He told me what I very well knew, that my stay in London would infallibly plunge me in jail, that there were writs innumerable taken out against me here, and in the west of England, that my credit was so blown upon that I could not hope to raise a shilling, and he left me a night to consider of his proposal, saying that if I refused it, the family would proceed. If I acceded, a quarter's salary should be paid to me at any foreign port I should prefer. What was the poor, lonely, and broken-hearted man to do? I took the annuity, and was declared outlaw in the course of next week. The rascal Quinn had, I found, been, after all, the cause of my undoing. It was he devised the scheme for bringing me up to London, sealing the attorney's letter with a seal which had been agreed upon between him and the countess formerly. Indeed, he had always been for trying the plan and had proposed it at first, but her ladyship, with her inordinate love of romance, preferred the project of elopement. Of these points my mother wrote me word in my lonely exile, offering at the same time to come over and share it with me, which proposal I declined. She left Castle Linden a very short time after I had quitted it, and there was silence in that hall where, under my authority, had been exhibited so much hospitality and splendor. She thought she would never see me again and bitterly reproached me for neglecting her. But she was mistaken in that, and in her estimate of me. She is very old, and is sitting by my side at this moment in the prison, working. She has a bedroom in Fleet Market over the way, and, with the fifty-pound annuity which she has kept with a wise prudence, we manage to eke out a miserable existence, quite unworthy of the famous and fashionable, Barry Linden. Mr. Barry Linden's personal narrative finishes here, for the hand of death interrupted the ingenious author soon after the period at which the memoir was compiled, after he had lived nineteen years an inmate of the Fleet Prison, where the prison records state he died of delirium tremens. His mother attained a prodigious old age, and the inhabitants of the place in her time can record with accuracy the daily disputes which used to take place between mother and son, until the latter, from habits of intoxication, falling into a state of almost imbecility, was tended by his tough old parent as a baby almost, and would cry if deprived of his necessary glass of brandy. His life on the continent we have not the means of following accurately, but he appears to have resumed his former profession of a gambler, without his former success. He returned secretly to England after some time, and made an abortive attempt to extort money from Lord George Poynings, under a threat of publishing his correspondence with Lady Lyndon, and so preventing his lordship's match with Miss Driver, a great heiress of strict principles and immense property in slaves, in the West Indies. Barry narrowly escaped being taken prisoner by the bailiffs who were dispatched after him by his lordship who would have stopped his pension, but Lady Linden would never consent to that act of justice, and, indeed, broke with my lord George the very moment he married the West India lady. The fact is, the old countess thought her charms were perennial, and was never out of love with her husband. She was living at Bath, her property being carefully nursed by her noble relatives, the Tiptofts, who were to succeed to it in default of direct heirs. And such was the address of Barry, and the sway he still held over the woman, that he actually had almost persuaded her to go and live with him again, when his plan and hers was interrupted by the appearance of a person who had been deemed dead for several years. 
This was no other than Viscount Bullingdon, who started up to the surprise of all, and especially to that of his kinsman of the house of Tiptoff. This young nobleman made his appearance at Bath, with the letter from Barry to Lord George in his hand, in which the former threatened to expose his connection with Lady Lyndon, a connection, we need not state, which did not reflect the slightest dishonour upon either party, and only showed that her ladyship was in the habit of writing exceedingly foolish letters, as many ladies, nay gentlemen, have done ere this. For calling the honour of his mother in question, Lord Bullingdon assaulted his stepfather, living at Bath under the name of Mr. Jones, and administered to him a tremendous castigation in the pump-room. His lordship's history, since his departure, was a romantic one, which we do not feel bound to narrate. He had been wounded in the American War, reported dead, left prisoner, and escaped. The remittances which were promised him were never sent. The thought of the neglect almost broke the heart of the wild and romantic young man, and he determined to remain dead to the world at least, and to the mother who had denied him. It was in the woods of Canada, and three years after the event had occurred, that he saw the death of his half-brother chronicled in the gentleman's magazine, under the title of Fatal Accident to Lord Viscount Castle Linden, on which he determined to return to England, where, though he made himself known, it was with very great difficulty indeed that he satisfied Lord Tiptoff of the authenticity of his claim. He was about to pay a visit to his lady mother at Bath, when he recognized the well-known face of Mr. Barry Linden, in spite of the modest disguise which that gentleman wore, and revenged upon his person the insults of former days. Lady Linden was furious when she heard of the rencounter, declined to see her son, and was for rushing at once to the arms of her adored Barry. But that gentleman had been carried off, meanwhile, from jail to jail, until he was lodged in the hands of Mr. Bendigo, of Chancery Lane, an assistant to the Sheriff of Middlesex, from whose house he went to the Fleet Prison. The Sheriff and his assistant, the prisoner, nay, the prison itself, are now no more. As long as Lady Linden lived, Barry enjoyed his income, and was perhaps as happy in prison as at any period of his existence. When her ladyship died, her successor sternly cut off the annuity, devoting the sum to charities, which, he said, would make a nobler use of it than the scoundrel who had enjoyed it hitherto. At his lordship's death, in the Spanish campaign in the year 1811, his estate fell into the family of the Tiptoffs, and his title merged in their superior rank. But it does not appear that the Marquis of Tiptoff, Lord George succeeded to the title on the demise of his brother, renewed either the pension of Mr. Barry or the charities which the late lord had endowed. The estate has vastly improved under his lordship's careful management. The trees in Hackton Park are all about forty years old, and the Irish property is rented in exceedingly small farms to the peasantry, who still entertain the stranger with stories of the daring and the devilry and the wickedness, and the fall of Barry Lyndon. End of chapter 19 End of the Memoirs of Barry Lyndon, Esquire, by William Makepeace Thackeray Read by M.B.